there's this thing that exists, this, this multi-headed snake, and it's got this infinity problem, it's everywhere, that's that little circle down there. And the problem is, well, what do you do with it? You cut off one head, seven more grow. That's the eternal problem of life. And the problem is, there, there, there is the category of problems in life, and it ain't going anywhere. And so the question is, can you deal with the whole category at the same time? That's the thing, that's how to be in the world, is to deal with that category all at the same time. And so how did, how did human beings, what did they come up with as a solution? And that's so cool too, because the solution they come up with, not only was the heroism that allows you to approach what you're terrified by and what you find offensive, and to learn from it, but also the idea of sacrifice, and, and that was played out by cultures everywhere, including human sacrifice. And you think, what the hell was up with those crazy bastards so long ago? They were sacrificing to gods all the time. What kind of clueless behavior was that? Burn something and please God. Burn something valuable and please God. It's like, what was with them? What were they thinking? Well, they weren't stupid, those people. If they were stupid, we wouldn't be here. They were not stupid. And believe me, they lived under a lot harsher conditions than we do. So those were some tough people, man. You know. Back then, you'd last about 15 minutes, and so you don't want to be thinking of your ancestors as stupid. Like, there's no real evidence that we're much different cognitively than we were 150,000 years ago. So, anyways, sacrifice. What does that mean, sacrifice? Well, it's a discovery, man. It's the discovery of the future. It's like the future is actually the place where there is threat, and it's always going to be there. So what do you do? You make sacrifices in the present so that the future is better. Right. Everyone does that. That's what you're doing right now. That's what you're doing here. That's what your parents are doing when they pay money to send you to university. They think, you can bargain with reality. It's amazing. You can bargain with reality. You can forestall gratification now. And it'll pay off at a, at a place and time that doesn't even exist yet. It's like... Who would have believed that? It's like, that's a miracle that that occurs. And it's not like people just figured that out overnight. You know, we were chimps for Christ's sake. Like, how are we going to come up with an idea like that? Well, it's like, well, we thought about it for seven million years. And, uh, you know, we got to the point where we could kind of act it out. But we didn't know what we were doing. But it was a, it emerged, it's like a dream. It was, so the terror of the future is a dream. And the solution to the terror the dream of the terror of the future is another dream. And, and it, it comes out in mythology and in fantasy and in drama, where you act out the sacrifice. And then it's a step on the way to full understanding. So we can say sacrifice now instead of doing it, you know, although we still do it. It's just not concretized like it used to be. We do it abstractly. And we all have faith that it will work. You know, and we also set up our society so that it'll work. And, one thing about, you know, I'm not a fan of moral relativism for, for a variety of reasons, partly because I think it's an, it's an extreme form of cowardice. But anyways, apart from that, no, 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 no. There's minimal ways that you can set up a society that will work. And so one of them is, is that the society has to be set up so that your sacrifices will pay off or you won't work and then the society will die. And so it has to make promises. People have to make promises to one another. And that's what money is. Money is a promise that your sacrifice will pay off in the future. That's what money is. And so if the society is stable, you can store up your work right now. You can sacrifice your impulses and you can work and you can store up credit for the future. And then you can make the future a better place. But society has to be stable enough to allow for that. Hyperinflation will do you in. So the promise that's implicit in the currency is the promise that what you're doing now will pay off in the future. And if people don't have that promise, then, well, we know what they do. Because in, in gangs, for example, in, say, gangs in North America, the time horizon of the gang members shrinks rapidly because they don't really expect to be alive much past 21. And so they get really impulsive and violent. And, like, why the hell not? That's, that's what you do when, when the future doesn't matter, when it's not real. You, you default back to living in the moment, and you take what you can get right now. And no wonder, because you don't know if you're going to be around in a, in a year. 
and you get whatever you can, well, you can bloody well get it. And that's like anarchy, that state. And so you don't want to live in, some people like to live in that state because they're really wired for that, you know. And so they're, they're much more comfortable in those conditions. They're, they're kind of like warrior types, I would say, in some sense. But, you know, for most people, that's just, well, that stress will just do you in, you know, the stress of a life like that. So... I've said that some people will tell you that the purpose of life is to be happy and those people are idiots and it was a bit of a rough statement but I, what I meant by that it, it was actually in, in inspired by a, a statement by Alexander Solzhenitsyn who was the great critic of the Soviet prison system and he commented that happiness is something that's done in by the first harsh blow that reality deals you and, and, and I believe this to be the case there, there are many circumstances in life where happiness is not only the wrong response, but also where the expectation of happiness as a response will put you, the person attempting to be happy, in absolutely the wrong psychological state to be prepared for what must be done. People are built, so to speak, to experience a very wide range of motivational and emotional states that only bear a tenuous relationship to one another. And the reason for that is that the environment that human beings inhabit is so complex that our adaptation depends on a variety of very finely differentiated responses. And so there is a time to be compassionate, and there's a time to be aggressive, and there's a time to be in pain, and there's a time to be anxious, and there's a time to be joyous, and a time to be satisfied. And the healthy and well-adapted person has a very wide range of finely differentiated responses, which cannot be boiled down to a single dimension, say happiness versus unhappiness, uh, life is not that simple. I mean, if it was, we'd only have one emotional system. Making happiness the focal point of your life trivializes your experiences because in order to regard anything as truly important, you also have to regard its loss as truly meaningful. And that means that to open yourself up to experiences of deep meaning also simultaneously means that you have to open yourself up to the possibility of deep hurt and sorrow. It's something strange that I've observed with my students is that when I state the proposition to them clearly that life is suffering and that the purpose of life is not happiness, they actually experience that as a great relief. And the reason I believe that they experience it as a great relief is they already know it. You know, even if they wouldn't necessarily articulate that, their experience has taught them that life is complex and tragic and difficult. And the problem with the public portrayal of the ideal state of humanness as happiness is that it makes all of these people, these young people, feel ashamed of their own suffering. They feel that if they're suffering and if they find their life tragic in its essence, that that means that there's something wrong with them. And instantly that makes it impossible for them to communicate anything real about their own tragedy. And so it appears to me that the price we pay for being is suffering. And then the issue there, and I believe that this is what the greater religious traditions of the world have been attempting to elucidate, is that the purpose of life, given that, is to identify and, and follow a mode of being that makes life justifiable, even given the radical necessity of suffering. If you're constantly in a state of placidity, satisfaction, and happiness, then nothing is going to affect you deeply enough not your own suffering, not the suffering of other people, not injustice, not, not the horrors of the world. Nothing is going to affect you deeply enough so that you'll become deep. And life without depth is, by definition, shallow and meaningless. And there's a, a problem that's associated with that. Because life is tragic and because life involves suffering, if your philosophy is shallow and meaningless when you suffer, you'll become resentful, and hostile and self-critical and then you'll become cruel and destructive and so not only is the, there a necessity for your own mental health to forthrightly confront the deepest questions of life but if you don't then you remain a danger to yourself and maybe more importantly to others you know as an adolescent you also shed childhood potential to become the limited but specialized and potentially useful thing that you will become. 
And so you might say, well, is it worth it? Is it worth shedding that potential? And Peter Pan's answer to that is, well, no. He wants to remain in Neverland as a magical boy forever. And he's king of the lost boys, which I would say is not a very... That's not much of a dominance hierarchy, right? It's like, you're, you're the king, king of the... King of the losers, so to speak, people who can't get their act together and mature. Now, and you notice in Peter Pan that Peter Pan doesn't grow up. He doesn't establish a relationship with Wendy, who's actually real. He has to settle for Tinkerbell, who, you know, is a fairy, and they don't exist. And so she's really, in some sense, a figure of his imagination, because he won't mature. He can't have an actual relationship with, with a genuine person. So he has to satisfy himself with... Well, it's something like a pornographic fantasy, actually. So, seriously, it is. It is like that. I mean, it, it's, it's, it's uh, toned down a lot in the movie version, obviously, but still, that's what's underlying it. Now, you might say, well, why doesn't Peter Pan want to grow up? And the answer is, the only figure of authority that's around for him is, is Captain Hook. And he doesn't like Captain Hook, and that's because Captain Hook is a tyrant. He's brutal. You know, and he's also a coward because he's, he's lost a hand already to a crocodile with a clock in its stomach. That's chaos and time. You know, that's the dragon that lives underneath everything. It's like the basilisk in Harry Potter. And that damn crocodile's already got a piece of him, which is exactly the case. Like, that crocodile's got a piece of me. You know, I'm older than 50, and so time has already got its grip on me. And, you know, part of the problem of being adult is that you also have to take the fact that you're finite and limited into account and if you're terrified by that, which people tend to be, then it can easily turn you into a tyrant because you're afraid of everything or disgusted by everything and you have to ramp up the amount you control it and so Peter Pan looks at Captain Hook and he thinks there's no damn way that's what I want to end up as so he's got a bad role model I've, I've been telling people online in various ways and in lectures that they should start fixing up the world by cleaning up their room and I wanted to just elaborate on that a little bit before I get back to the lecture itself. So, as it's become this internet, weird internet meme, you know, uh, and, 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 and it's a joke, and good, it's a joke. I, I, I'm really happy about the fact that so much of this has got, like, the leaven of humor, and it's really important, because that's what stops things from degenerating into, into conflict, humor, and... I was thinking about this idea of cleaning up your room in relationship to the mustard seed idea. And you see, the thing about cleaning up your room, this is also something I learned from Carl Jung and his studies on alchemy, because for Jung, when the alchemist was attempting to make the philosopher's stone, he was not only engaged in the transformation of the material world, but he was engaged in a process of self-transformation that occurred at the same time as the, as the chemical trend as the chemical transformation. So it was a psychological work in some sense. Let's say you want to s sort out your room and beautify it, because the beauty is also important. And let's say that all you have is just a little room, like you're not rich, you're, you're poor, and, and you don't have any power, that's another thing. But you've got your damn room, and you've got this space right in front of you, you know, that, that, that's a part of the cosmos that you can come to grips with. And you might think, well, what's there in front of you, right in front of you? And the answer to that is, it depends on how open your eyes are. That's the proper answer, because you could say, and William Blake said this, for example, and Aldous Huxley made comments that were very similar, that in a transcendent state, you can see infinity in the finite. And you might say, well, you can, say in, you can see infinity in what you have within your grasp, if you look, and you could say, maybe that's the case with your room. And so, you want to clean up your room. Well, okay, how do you do that exactly? Well, a room is... A room is a place to sleep. And so if you set your room up properly, then you figure out how to sleep and when you should sleep and how you should sleep. And then you figure out when you should wake up. And then you figure out, well, what clothes you should wear because they have to be arranged properly in your dresser. And then you have to have some place to put your clothes. And if you're going to have some clothes, you have to figure out what you're going to wear those clothes to do, right? And then that means you have to figure out what you're going to do. And then your room has to serve that purpose because otherwise it isn't set up properly. And if it doesn't set up if it doesn't serve your pur purposes, you will be unhappy and not happy in the room because the way that we perceive the world is as a place to move from point A to point B in. And then if the place that we're in facilitates that movement, then we're happy to be there. And if the place that we're in serves as an obstacle to that movement, then we're unhappy to be there. And so what it means to set up your room is that you have to have somewhere to go that's worthwhile or you can't set up your room and then your room has to be set up to facilitate that and then the next thing is well maybe you have to make it beautiful
But that's not easy, right? That means you have to have some taste. And that doesn't mean you have to have money. It doesn't. Because you can be garish with money. And you can be tasteful with nothing. All you need is taste. And taste beats money when it comes to beautifying things. You know, I mean, not that money is trivial because it's not, but taste is crucial. And people who are very artistically oriented can make beautiful things out of virtually nothing. And not only that, the literature suggests that if you're going to make beautiful things, putting real constraints on, on what you allow yourself to do facilitates creativity instead of interfering with it. Because let's say you have to make something out of nothing, right? Which I suppose would be a godly act, right? You have to make something out of nothing. It, you have to be creative in order to do that. And so then to, to beautify your room means that you also have to develop your capacity to be creative. And so then you can make your room shine. But then what will happen is that if your family isn't together, they will interfere with that. You'll interfere with that because you won't have the discipline to do it properly. But then when you start building this, this, this little microcosm of perfection with what you have at hand, then it'll evoke all the pathologies of everyone in your household. They'll wonder what the hell you're up to in there. And they won't necessarily be happy because if you're if they're in a lowly place, let's say, and so are you, and you're trying to move out of that, then the, the higher you move out of that, the more the place they're in looks bad. And you might say, well, what they should do is celebrate your victory over chaos and evil, but that isn't what will happen. What will happen instead is that they will attempt to pull you back down. They'll attempt to, and I mean, obviously all families don't do that, but, but all families do that to some degree, and some families do almost nothing but that. And so what that means is that if you're going to organize your room, then you're going to have to confront the devils in your house. And that's often, that's often a terrifying thing because some of those devils have, have lineages that go back many, many, many generations. And God only knows what you have to struggle with in order to overcome that. And so, and then it, and so to sort yourself out and to fix up your room is a non-trivial matter, you know. And you, you can do that. You'll learn by doing that, and then maybe you'll learn enough by doing that so that you can fix up your family a little bit, and then having done that, you'll have enough character so that when you try to operate in the world at your job or maybe in the broader social spheres, that you'll be a force for good instead of harm because you'll have learned some humility by noting just how difficult it was to put your damn room together, well, and yourself for that matter, and so you'll proceed cautiously with your eyes open towards the good. I talk to people very frequently whose families have provided them with too much protection. And they know it themselves, and that means they're deprived of necessity. You know, one of the things that you see in, in, in the United States, for example, is that um, the children of first-generation immigrants often do better than, the chil than, the, than their children. And the reason for that is that the children of first-generation Im immigrants have necessity driving them. And you don't know how much you need necessity to drive you because maybe you're not very disciplined. And if a catastrophe doesn't immediately befall you if you don't act forthrightly today, then maybe you never act forthrightly, right? Because the, the, the gap between your foolishness and the punishment is, is lengthened by your unearned wealth. And so you never grow up and learn. And you have to get yourself away from your dependency in order to allow necessity to drive you forward. And that's to become independent and to become mature. And I think part of what's happening in our culture is that the, the, the force that's attacking the, the forthright movement forward of young men in particular is afraid of the power of men because it's confused about the distinction between power and authority and competence. Like an, a man who's, who has authority and competence has power as a byproduct. But the authority and competence is everything. And, and, and people who can't understand that fail to make the distinction between power and authority of competence. And they're afraid of power. And so they destroy authority and competence. And that's a terrible thing because we need authority and competence. What else is going to, what else is going to allow us to prevail in the long run? And so you get away from your country and you get away from your kin and from your father's house, right? And you go out there and you establish yourself in the world. It's a call to adventure. That's what this, the, the first lines in Ab the Abrahamic story is a call to adventure. So, great, unto a land that I will show you. Well, you know, what does that mean? You know, what, one of the things that I've been struck very hard by a number of writers, Carl Jung, obviously, among them, 
I mean, he, he wrote things like Nietzsche that if you understand them, they just break you into pieces, you know? And, and one of the things that Jung understood and the psychoanalysts understand is one of the most terrifying elements of psychoanalytic thinking is very tightly allied with religious thinking, which is that you are not the master of your own house. There are spirits that dwell in you, within you, meaning you have a will and you can exercise a certain amount of conscious control over your being, but there are all sorts of things that occur within you that seem to be beyond your capacity to control. Your dreams, for example, that's a really good example, or your impulses, for example, you might, you might think of those as so foreign from you that they're not even, you don't even want them to be part of you. But, but more subtly even, how about what you're interested in, what compels you? Like, where does that come from? Exactly. Because you can't, you can't conjure it up of your own accord, you know? So, if you're a student and you're taking a difficult course, you might say to yourself, well, I need to sit down and study for three hours. But then you sit down and that isn't what happens. Your attention goes everywhere. And you might say, well, whose attention is it then if it goes everywhere? Because you say it's your attention. It's like, well, if it's your attention, maybe you would be able to control it. But you can't. And so then you might think, well, Jen, just exactly what the hell is controlling it? And you might say, well, it's random. It's the, well, it better not be random. I can tell you that. That's, that happens to some degree in schizophrenia. There's an element of randomness in that. It's not random. It's driven by the action of, of phenomena that I think are best considered as something like sub-personalities, although even that's only a partial description. You can't make yourself interested in something. Interest manifests itself and grips you. That's a whole different thing. And so what is it that's gripping you? And, and how do you conceptualize that? Is that a divine power? Well, it's divine as far as you're concerned because it grips you and you can't do anything about it. And so there's a calling in you towards what you're compelled by and what you're interested in. And sometimes that might be very dark and sometimes not. But you're compelled forward by your interest. And so, and so the idea that what moves you away from your country and your father's house and the comforts of your childhood home is, is something that's beyond you and that you listen to and hearken to. That's exactly right. And you can say, well, I don't want to call that God. It's like, it doesn't matter what you call it, exactly. It, it doesn't matter to what it is, what it's called. It still is. And if you don't listen to it, that's the other thing. If you don't listen to it, and I've been a clinician and talked to enough people now, as old as I am, to know this absolutely. If you do not listen to that thing that beckons you forward, you will pay for it like you cannot possibly imagine. You'll have everything that's terrible about life in your life and nothing about it that's good. And worse, you'll know that it was your fault and that you squandered what you could have had. So, this is not only a calling forth, but a warning unto a land that I will show thee. And, and that's it, that I will show thee. That, and you don't want to be too concrete about this, you know. There's all sorts of new territories that you can inhabit. If you, there's, there's abstract and conceptual territories. If you go to university and you study biology or you study physics or, or any discipline, you're in a territory, right? You're in the territory that all the scholars have established. And then, as you master the discipline, you move out beyond the established territory into the unknown. And, and that's a new land, right? Maybe it's even a land of your enemies, for that matter. But it's a new land. The frontier is always in front of you. And so, you know, when the earth was less inhabited than it is now, the frontier was... The psychological frontier and the geographical frontier was the same thing, and now they've separated to some degree because there's not so much geographical frontier. But there's, the frontier is a place that never disappears, and the land that's beyond the land that you know is always there, and it's always where you should go. And all of that's packed into these, what, four phrases. So, well, so, when I've been thinking about narrative, you look at the world through a story. You can't, you can't help it. And, and the story is what gives value to the world, or, or the story is what you extract from the value of the world. You can look at it either way. You're somewhere, and it's not good enough. Right? That's the eternal human predicament. Wherever you are isn't good enough. And to some degree, that's actually a good thing, because if it was good enough, well, <laughs> there's nothing for you to do. So it's actually maybe a good thing that it's insufficient. And that might be why sometimes having less is, is better than having more. And I don't want to be a Pollyanna about that. I mean, I know that there's deprivation that can reach to the point where it's, no, where it's completely counterproductive. But it isn't always the case that starting with 
Little is, you, if you start with little, you start with more possibility. It's something like that. So you move from, always from what's unbearable about the present to some better future, right? And if you don't have that, then you have no, you have nothing but threat and, and negative emotion. You have no positive emotion, because the positive emotion is generated in the conception of the better future and then the evidence that you generate yourself that you're moving towards it. That's where the positive and fulfilling meaning of life comes. So you want to set up this structure properly. It's very, very important. And so what it means is that you want to be going somewhere that's good enough so that the going is worth the while. And you can ask yourself that. And that's partly what we tried to build into the future authoring program, which is, well, we know what's wrong with life. It's rife with suffering and insufficiency and deception and evil. It's all of that, obviously. Okay, what would make the journey worthwhile? Well, you can ask yourself that. It's like, all right, in order to bear up under this load, what is it that I would need to be striving to attain? And if you ask yourself that, that's to knock and, and the door will open. That's what that means. If you ask yourself that, then you will find an answer and you'll think, you'll shrink away from it. You'll think, well, there's no way I could do that. It's like, well, you don't know what you could do. You don't know what's possible. And you're not as much as you could be. And so... God only knows what you, could, what you could do and have and give if you sacrificed everything to it. And that's the reason Abraham is constantly making sacrifices. And it's archaic, right? He's burning up like baby lambs. But like, well, they're alive. You know, that's something. And, and they're valuable and that's something. It's, you have to admit, even if you think about it as a modern person, that the act of sacrificing something might have some dramatic compulsion to it. You know, to go out into a flock and to take something that's newborn and to cut its throat and to bleed it and to burn it might be a way of indicating to yourself that you're actually serious about something. And it isn't so obvious that we have rituals of seriousness like that now. And so it's not so obvious that we're actually serious about anything. And so maybe that's not such a good thing. And so maybe we shouldn't be thinking that these people were so archaic and primitive and superstitious. It's possible that they knew something that we don't. And certainly in the Abrahamic stories, one of the things that maintains Abraham's covenant with God is his continual willingness to sacrifice. And it's so that sacrificial issue is so important because you are not committed to something unless you're willing to sacrifice for it. Commitment and sacrifice are the same thing. And I think it's, it borders on miraculous that those concepts are embedded into this narrative at the level of dramatic action. You know, instead of abstract explanation, people are acting this out. And, and, the, and the fundamental conception is so profound that it's really quite, it's quite awe-inspiring. It's, it's breathtaking, really, when you understand what message is trying to be conveyed. You have to make sacrifices. And what do you have to sacrifice? You have to sacrifice that which is most valuable to you currently that's stopping you. And God only knows what that is. It's certainly the worst of you. It's certainly that. And God only knows to what degree you're in love with the worst of you. So, well, so you move from the unbearable present to the ideal future, and, and you can't help that. You have to live in a structure like that. That's your house. That's another way of thinking about it. And if you want to get your house in order, and if you want it to be a place that you can live properly, then you have to plan the future that is perfect. And then I think, well, what does that mean? And it means it's good for you. Right? And one of the things that I, I'm, I do all the time with my clinical and consulting clients is try to figure out what would be good for them. But we, we do more than that. We try to think, okay, well, what, how can we set this up so it's really good for you and that all the side consequences of that are things that are good for other people? And so, because people are often also timid about trying to get something that's good for themselves because they feel that it's selfish or that they don't deserve it. So we set it up so that, well, look, we're going to set it up so that it's plainly obvious that this will not harm the structure of the universe. For you to have what you need and to do it in a way that's of benefit to other people, there's no downside. All right, so let's say you have oriented yourself. But not perfectly because you're full of mistakes and errors. So then what do you do? Because you have to fix those errors, but you still have to be oriented. And this is why I started get interest, to get interested in the phenomena of meaning as a, as a phenomenological experience, to experience something as meaningful. It's not exactly obvious what that means, to experience something as meaningful. I think that you can, 
you can approach it obliquely, you know, like if I said, watch yourself for two weeks and notice when you're doing something that you regard as meaningful. I could say, well, here, here's, some, here's some markers. You lose a sense of time, you lose a sense of vulnerability, you're deeply engaged in it. It seems, it seems worth the effort, right? You forget yourself while you're doing it. Um, maybe you forget your existential concerns while you're doing it. You're not <coughs> ruminating or obsessing about the meaning of your life. Right, so, so there's markers for it. It's like the flow states that Csikszentmihalyi described. Um, and then you can experience it, you experience it under certain sort of ritualistic conditions. You might experience it when you go see a great movie. You might experience it when you listen to music. I think music is a very, very standard pathway for people to have that kind of experience. Because virtually everyone gets intimations of, mu of meaning from music. And I think music, music is hierarchically structured patterns that are representative of being laying itself out properly. It's something like that. So it's an abstract representation of proper being. And so we can, we can grapple with the phenomena of music and we can, we can box, or phenomena of meaning, we can box it in a little bit and start to conceptualize it. We can start to conceptualize it perhaps as the manifestation of a deep instinct. And so I would say, well, Meaning is what manifests itself when you are, when you've oriented yourself properly and when you've optimized the flow of information between you and you, between you and chaos, that might be the right way of thinking about it. Because you think about a piece of music, is you want it to be predictable, but you don't want it to be perfectly predictable. You want it to be predictable with some interesting variations. And, predictable with some variations that make sense, and maybe you can conceptualize that as something like this. It's like, it's predictable at this order of, of stability, but it's, it's varying down here from time to time. And so you've got stable stability there, but variability there, and you can handle that. So you want an overarching structure of stability with some internal variability. And maybe that's the way that you update yourself without falling apart. And then I would say, you can find the pathway to the up, optimal rate of update by relying on your sense of meaning. That's what it's for. What it tells you is that you're, you're wandering your way through the world between the catastrophes of chaos and the catastrophes of order, and now and then you swing into the proper locale. You're, you're where you should be. And what happens is you get engaged by that. You get meaningfully engaged by that. And it's fragile, it'll move on you, right? Because it's very difficult to exist at that point constantly. Your bad habits, all sorts of things, your situation, there's all sorts of things that are going to interfere with that. But that doesn't mean that that isn't where you should be. And so then you might say, well, that's where you should strive to be all the time. And then the question might be, well, what would it be like if you were there all the time? And I think that's where intimations of paradise come from. I mean, when words, I think it was Wordsworth, talked about intimations of immortality in childhood, people tend to romanticize their childhood because of the sense of in, intense engagement that goes along with being a child. And it's one of the wonderful things about being around children, actually. It's, it's, it's one of, they pay you for their care. And the way that children pay you for their care is that they turn normal things into magic again when you're around them. Because you've seen it a hundred times before. And so when you see it, you don't see it. You see what you already know. But when a child sees it, they don't, because they don't know. They see it, and then when you watch them see it, you see it too. And so it's just it's tremendous fun leading a small child around to do things that you've done before, because they're so, you know, they're like this. They're like all the time, and you know, maybe that's too much, and they cry, and they get upset, and all of that. But a good part of the time, it's just wild-eyed wonder, and then you can see the world through their eyes, and it's payment. And so that's, that sense of being engaged like that is something that people love about children, and, and rightly so. But it's also a marker to a, the proper way of being. You know, there, there's a dictum in the, this is a Jungian idea, that there's no difference between the archetype of the wise old man and the archetype of the child. They're the same thing. Because the wise old man is the person who found what he had in childhood but lost. Right, it's a, that's a very powerful motif, is that the purpose of maturation is to return to the state of childhood as a mature being, not to stay in the state of childhood. That's Peter Pan, 
but to make the sacrifices necessary for maturation and then return. You say, well, how do you do that? Well, you do that in part by noting what it is that's meaningful for you to engage in. I would say it's your nervous system reporting to you, right hemisphere and left hemisphere balanced. The, the balance between chaos and order produces an output that says you are in the right place. It's a perception. The meaning is a perception of being in the right place. It's the genuine thing. However, because it, it can be pathologized, that's the thing, and that's why I think there's a call to virtue in most great religious traditions. If you're going to rely on your sense of meaning to orient you, you have to play a straight game, because otherwise you warp and twist the inputs, and then the mechanism won't function properly. You know, it's like if you, if you were only... If, you're, if you've blinded yourself to half the world, you can't use your perceptions to orient yourself properly because the half of the world that you're ignoring is going to pop up at you unexpectedly and take you down. And so if your relationship with the world isn't pristine, honest, primarily, then you can't rely on your own internal orienting mechanisms. And then you either fall into chaos, which is an absolute catastrophe, or you have to rely on some kind of external authority. And that makes you prone to possession by tyrannical ideologies, for example, which give you that sense of meaning that you should, in fact, have as a consequence of your own action. What should you be aiming for in your life? And I can, I can tell you that, roughly speaking, if you're looking for something that will give your life meaning, that's, that's, that's actually quite straightforward, as far as I've been able to tell. And this is where the nihilists have it so wrong that it's almost be unbelievable. And as far as I'm concerned, fundamentally, they're just escaping from responsibility anyways. Even though they have perfectly rational arguments for their nihilism, it's like, everything's meaningless. It's like, no, first of all, no. Pain is not meaningless. You're never going to meet anyone who will ever tell you that their own pain is meaningless. So we can just forego the whole meaningless argument right off the bat. It's like, there may be no positive meaning in life, we could have a discussion about that, but self-evident negative meaning exists, and everyone knows it. And even someone who's anarchic and nihilistic to the core, you know, if you drive a spike through their hand, they're going to act like that has meaning. And since I'm an existentialist... <laughs> yes. And look at how people act instead of what they say, and then they'll act out the idea that that has meaning very, very rapidly. So we'll just go with that. Now, you might say, well, there's all sorts of suffering, and that's self-evident, but that's not the kind of meaning that I believe doesn't exist. I believe that only positive meaning doesn't exist, which is, you know, a little on the negative side, I would say, to begin with. But, but I can understand it. People, have, people can have pretty dreadful lives, you know, and you can easily get yourself in a situation where it seems like there's nothing at all to your life except suffering. And that's what happens to people who become suicidal, for example, and it's no joke, and they have their reasons, man. You know, sometimes those people have been hurt in ways that are absolutely unimaginable, and so when they, they see a horizon that's full of nothing but suffering, you can't just wave that away. But I would say, the first thing we might hypothesize is that since pain is an unalterable fact of meaning, and certainly seems to be negative, that one of the things you might want to try to orient yourself in relationship to is the reduction of human suffering. You know, because I think that's the main goal. And, you know, the answer to um, what do you do about a child who's suffering in a concentration camp isn't who the hell's going to care in a million years, right? That's not the right answer. And if it's not the right answer in that situation, then perhaps it's not the right answer at all. And the right answer to who the hell's going to care anyways in a million years is why in the world would you frame the statement that idiotically? I mean, anybody, anybody, this is kind of a trick of the imagination in some sense, anybody who's quick-witted can come up with a frame of reference that makes anything, uh, that makes almost anything lack meaning within that frame of reference. Well, all that means to me is that you picked a stupid frame of reference, right? Why should you, why should you um, accept without doubt the consequence of your stupid algorithm? Who's going to care in a million years? Yeah, yeah, God. Really, you got to be able to do better than that, if that's how you're going to wipe out meaning. Well, so what do you want for meaning? All right, reduce suffering. That'd be a good one. You could devote your life to that. And I would say, start locally. And, and, and I think this is the alternative to right-wing nationalism, and, which is too much order, and left-wing chaos, which is too much chaos. We don't want to go down that rabbit hole again, either of them. So what's the alternative? I thought about this for a very long time. It took me decades to come to this conclusion. The conclusion is, is that you straighten yourself out, and you do that humbly. 
There's this idea in the New Testament, which I get quite a kick up out of, that you're not supposed to pray in public. It's a little more complicated than that, actually. You're not supposed to pray in public until you like sorted out the dispute that you had with your brother, for example. I really like that idea. Um, because what it means is that you shouldn't make a public display of your virtue until you've straightened up your damn life. And this is one of the things I really don't like about protests. And I really don't like the fact that university students are taught by their half-witted professors that the way they can change the world... going and waving signs at people that you've defined as more evil than you. First of all, the probability that they're more evil than you is actually quite low. Because, because evil though they may be, you're in the same damn boat. And if you've divided the world up conveniently so that you can identify the innocent and the, and the damned, or the oppressor and the oppressed, and you think that you're in the positive category, then the probability that you're part of the solution and not part of the problem is zero. So it's just not that easy, you know, and the most profound people that I've ever read have said the same thing over and over. It's like the line between good and evil runs down the middle of every human heart, and the first thing that you're supposed to do is win that battle on your own territory. And that's no bloody joke. That's a difficult thing to do, because it means that you have to recognize, that, recognize yourself as a perpetrator of great evil, and that is what you are. And that's a terrible thing for people to learn. You know, you look at the 20th century, and you think, well, who brought on the horrors of the communist systems and the horrors of the Nazi systems? The answer is people just like you. And that's the answer. And if you don't understand that and you think that answer is wrong, then you're not very wise. And, the, and it's not surprising because the, the price that you pay for wisdom is, is radical disillusionment and the confrontation with evil. And no one wants that, really. It's a terrible thing to confront. And that's because human beings are terrible creatures. Now, I think we're also absolutely remarkable creatures and wonderful creatures, but we have an unlimited capacity for brutality and evil, and every one of us carries it. And so what you do is you try to sort that out in your own life, and you start, ha, I had a guy talk to me just a while back about, about his life hadn't been going very well, and he decided to put himself together. And he started doing this little ritual thing, which I thought was quite cool. He, he, was, he was kind of an isolated guy, very overweight guy. Uh, when I talked to him, he lost about 130 pounds, which was quite impressive. It was part of him putting himself together. But he started doing it by building. He had a bunch of Legos left over from his childhood. And the first thing he did, because he was feeling very nihilistic and hopeless, he, he, he found that he got a little bit of satisfaction out of building little things out of Legos, you know. And I thought, well, that was pretty interesting. And so he built a bunch of these things. And then he said, well, I got a bunch of these things built, and then I had to figure out how to organize them in the room they were in. And I thought, that's cool, because he started high resolution at the level of detail, you know, and was building something that was trivial. He knew that he was just playing a game. But then, as soon as he had a collection of those, then he had to sort out the space that he was going to organize them in. And then he figured out, well, he had to sort out the room that they were going to be in. So he started organizing and beautifying the room, and at the same time, he modified his diet, and he was putting himself together. And that's the right thing to do. That's the right thing to do, is that there's, there are responsibilities that are awaiting you, right, that are in your own grasp. And you know what they are. And this is also something that no one can preach to you about. It's something you have to decide for yourself. And you can do it quite straightforwardly. And, and it's something that I do on a regular basis. You sit down in the evening or in the morning and ask yourself, like you're asking someone that you want the answer from, like you really, really genuinely need to want to have the answer. You're not telling yourself. None of that. You're asking yourself. All right, there's a bunch of things about my life that aren't in order that aren't together, and I know it, and they're making me suffer, and they're making me less than I am. And there's some of those things that are staring me right at the face, and I know what they are, and there's some of those that I can put in order today with a little bit of work, so that when I wake up tomorrow, the domain of my experience, which is basically being itself, the domain of my experience will be more pristine and better put together than it is today. You ask yourself that, and you'll find right away. You know what they are. Five things that come up. Bang, 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 bang. And they'll all be things that aren't very heroic, they're kind of trivial, and that you've been avoiding. You've been avoiding them. Those are little dragons of chaos, those things. And you know, they're just little, but that's good, because you're not much of a hero warrior, and so maybe little tiny dragons are all the ones that you can put up with for now. You know, you sort those things out, and it'll, first of all, it'll order your 
It will order the being around you in a more pristine and productive way, and it will make you just a little bit more focused and together. And what that will mean is that the next thing you can do is ask yourself the same question, and the, the problems that will emerge will be slightly larger and more complex. And then you can try to put those in order, and that will make everything around you more pristine and better put together, and it will make you a little bit stronger and more clear-headed. And then another set of problems will emerge that's a little bit larger, and if you continue to do that, you know, you'll sort yourself out, you'll clean up your room, you'll put your house in order, and then you can start to work in the community. And by that time, you'll actually have some power and some, and some self-confidence and some competence and some credence. And you'll be much more, much less likely to stupidly hit something complicated with a stick and say that you fixed it. But you have to start low. You have to, Carl Jung said a very interesting, one of his very interesting phrases, he says that the reason that modern people can't see God is because they won't look low enough. I really like that. It's, I mean, he's an extraordinarily wise person, and what he meant by that was something like what I'm telling you, is that the secret to your existence is right in front of you, and it manifests itself as all those things you know you should do, but you're avoiding. Because one of the things you might ask yourself is, of course you're useless and weak and miserable and, and, and cruel and all of those horrible things, but partly that's because you're also not what you could be, and part of the reason for that is that you're not doing what you know you should be doing. So you might ask yourself, because this is a very interesting game, if you started doing the things that you know you should do, this is a, a discussion with your own conscience, if you started doing those things that you know you should do, and you did that diligently, what the hell would you be like in 10 years? Now that's an exciting game. That's an interesting game. And if you play that, you'll find that you're a hell of a lot more than you were. And that's something at least. You might not hit the pinnacles, but you're going to be a lot more than you are. And then, if you're not weak and miserable and wretched and suffering and dismal and self-pitying and all those things, you're going to be a lot less resentful. You're going to be a lot less brutal. You're going to be a lot less cruel to yourself and to other people. Well, that's a pretty good start. You know, even if you're not a positive force for good in the world, if you just weren't wretched and horrible, that would be a good, a good initial contribution. No. I would say, too, there's a corollary that goes along with that. And, I, and, and this is... So, so, so you, you could look at it this way. This is something that I tried to explain. I did a video on Pinocchio, a couple of videos about Pinocchio, which I've been quite fascinated by. Because it's a very good <clears throat> illustration in popular culture of how archetypes manifest themselves and, and how people understand the archetypes, even if they don't know they understand them. Because Pinocchio is a very interesting movie, if you think about it. You know, you, you might ask, uh, well, when modern people think about people going to church, they think, well, how can people believe those foolish superstitions? It's like, yeah, fair enough, good question. Well, what the hell do you think you're doing when you go to a movie? Like, what are you doing? You're, here, here you are. You're, I know you probably haven't seen Pinocchio lately, but whatever. You know, it's the same thing. You're an adult. You bring your five-year-old to see Pinocchio, and you're just as entranced as he is. And think about what you're doing. First of all, you know those are drawings. They're not real creatures. They're drawings. Second, they're about a puppet. A wooden puppet who actually happens to wander around, who is being guided through life by a cricket. Whose, high, whose highest goal is to kill for reasons no one can understand. And somehow that makes a fairy turn him into something that's real. It's like, that's strange, people, right? The fact that you're doing that is very peculiar. And it says something about what people are like. It means that we understand things that we don't know we understand. And so Pinocchio is a, it's, it's a very interesting movie. I can tell you what its fundamental presupposition is. I'll just guide you through it very, very rapidly. So, at the beginning of the movie, Geppetto, who's, who's a, the archetype of the good father, by the way, which is an archetype that we've forgotten about, but it does exist because our culture isn't just a tyrannical patriarchy, as you can tell by the fact that we're warm and comfortable and we're not tearing each other to shreds at the moment, which is what you do in a state of absolute chaos, right? It's mayhem while you're freezing and starving, right? And that isn't what we have. We have peace, and it's rare, and it's amazing that we have it. And we shouldn't take it for granted, because it's not the normal order of things. The normal order of things is destructive chaos. And if you're fortunate enough to live somewhere that's peaceful and productive, you should thank your lucky stars every second of your life. And if you don't do that, all it means is that you don't know anything about history, and you know nothing about human beings. Because things can get absolutely monstrous, and it happens all the time. 
And there's always a fraction of the population who thinks that's how they'd like things to be. And perhaps there's a fraction of you that's like that too. And I wouldn't nurture that fragment if I was you, unless you wanted to go where it will take you. And anyways, back to Pinocchio. <laughs> He's got a warm house and it's full of toys and it's full of music boxes and you now he's got a little kitten and he's got a goldfish and he takes care of them and so he's a good guy and he makes this puppet and then he puts a, a, a mouth on the puppet and that's the final act so the puppet can have its capacity to speak and that's what you want if you're a good father is you want to take your son and you want to turn him into someone who can speak right who can speak his soul and so Geppetto puts a smile on his son's face and says, wouldn't it be wonderful if he could be a good boy? It's like, yeah, wouldn't it be wonderful, right? Because that's what you do if you're a good father, you think. Wouldn't it be possible if this puppet could actually become something genuine and independent with its own voice? Well, he says that's unlikely and goes off to bed. And then, then a star appears up in the window and he wishes on a star. And you think, well, what does that mean? What does it mean to wish on a star? It's like, well, a star is the light that beckons in the darkness, right? And it's something transcendent. You look up into the night sky and it's, it's awe-inspiring. Whether you're religious or not, you're looking into the infinite. Well, you make a relationship with the infinite by wishing on a star. You raise your eyes above the horizon and point at the light that beckons in the darkness. And you say, I wish more than anything else that my son could become a real person. It's like, that's what you do if you're a good father. You don't want to make him into a slave. You don't want to be a tyrant. You don't want him to be a puppet. You want him to be something strong and independent. Well, so off Pinocchio goes out into the world, right? And he, he faces all these different moral problems. He's armed with his conscience. It turns out to be a bug, right? Well, why? It's, well, it's because things bug you, you know? Your conscience bugs you. And the reason that... You, the conscience is Jiminy Cricket is because that's the same initials as Jesus Christ. And Jiminy Cricket is Southern U.S. slang for Jesus Christ. And no doubt the animators thought that was very comical. And I'll tell you that the bug is a very strange representation of Christ, that's for sure. Who would make it into a cricket? And he's also rather error-prone in the movie, so because the movie doesn't have precisely a formal Christian structure. But part of the reason, this took me a long time to figure out too, is that you have to have a dialogue with your conscience. But it has to be a dialogue, because it's actually not 100% right. It, it has to be something that you build by having a discussion with it across time, and that's actually what Pinocchio does with Jimmy Cricket as the movie progresses. Both the puppet and the conscience get wiser by banging themselves against the world. And the puppet has to resist the temptation of easy fame and celebrity. That's the first temptation, right? Because he's asked to be an actor, which is an easy way to be celebrity. It's like the Kardashians, right? It's, it's, it's status without responsibility or, or competence. And so that beckons as an attraction. And then he's, he's, he learns that lying is a very bad idea, right? That's why his nose grows, so he has to get that sort of out. And then he's, he's asked to present himself as a victim of circumstances. That's what the fox and the coyote do. And when he decides that he's too ill to go back to school, they take him to Pleasure Island, where he's trained to be a jackass that works for slavers in the salt mines. Right. Well, not bad for animation, I would say. And then at the end of the movie, he tries to go back home because he's terribly lost and he's half jackass because the people at Pleasure Island have told him, taught him to do nothing but bray which I can't help but think uh, uh, offers, or what would you, what would you say, is, is an appalling parallel to what's happening to educate people who are being educated in modern universities, right? Which are increasingly playhouses where you're taught to bray. I mean, you listen, I can't listen to protesters. It's just, it just, it's just painful. It's this constant repetition of, of, of soulless nonsense. And, are trying to convince themselves even more desperately than they're trying to convince the people that they're talking to. So anyways, Pinocchio goes back home, half jackass and half dead, and he tries to find his father, but there's no going home, right? Not once you're an adult, once you're a young adult, you don't get to go back home because there isn't anyone there that can tell you what to do anymore. 
And so they go, Pinocchio goes home and his father isn't there and he finds out that he has to go to the bottom of chaos itself to rescue his father. And that's what we have to do, right? Because our civilization is in a state of crisis and that was predicted long ago by people like Nietzsche and Dostoevsky. And partly what you're trying to do when you go to university is to go to the heart of darkness, right? To the place that terrifies you the most and to find what values your culture really has. And that's what it means to go down to the bottom of the depths, to the thing that terrifies you the most, and to revivify your father. It's a very old story. The Egyptians were telling that story 4,000 years ago. It's one of the oldest stories of mankind. And so that's what you have to do. You, and you unite yourself with your culture so that you're more than just a weak and simple-minded individual. Right? You dedicate yourself to the study of what's great about the past, and you incorporate it so that there can be something to you. And then you bring your father back up to the surface so that the culture can see and live again. And then that makes you into a real individual. Well, that's the movie. Well, we watch it. We're captivated by it. Now it's time to understand it. It's time to understand it in an articulated and conscious manner. Because it's too late for us to be unconscious anymore. And so we have Scylla and Shrimpus. We have the chaos of the left. And the left says, well, we need to tear down structures because they oppress. It's like, well, obviously structures oppress because something's good at the top of a structure and not so good at the bottom. So if you have any value structure, it's going to privilege some things and, and exclude others. But if you scrap the value structures, then there's nothing to live for. So we can't do that. That's just chaos. And then the radical right says, back to the nation. It's like, really? You know, we went back to the nation a couple of times, and it doesn't really look that great. And part of the reason for that is that the purpose of the nation isn't the nation. The purpose of the nation is to produce citizens who transcend and rejuvenate the nation. And so the nation should be prob properly subordinated to the individual, right? To the divine individual, for that matter. And that's what we figured out in the West. Now, it isn't that we only figured that out in the West, but so far we've been fortunate enough to put it into reasonable practice in our political institutions. And thank God for that. At least it's worked somewhere. And we'd be completely foolish to give that up because look at what it's provided us with. It's remarkable. We're free. As free as we can be, that doesn't mean that we're happy because freedom and happiness are not the same thing at all. But we did figure out that the state should be subordinate to the wisdom of the individual, to the sight and the wisdom of the individual. But that puts a heavy responsibility on everyone. That means you have to be the wise individual who can see and speak. That's your job. And if you do that, the thing that's so cool about that is, you know, you need a meaning in your life that enables you to bear the suffering of your life without becoming corrupted. That's the basic rule. And you have to build yourself into something that you can actually respect so that you can see yourself bearing that terrible existential burden properly. And then you don't lose hope and you don't lose meaning because you can see that you're strong enough to stand up underneath that burden. And then there's something about you that you can respect, and that maybe other people can respect, and that will help bring suffering in the world to an end, and that will help people develop fully as individuals, and that will enable us to avoid the dehumanizing, rigid, uh, sterile uniformity of the nationalistic left and the appalling, chaotic, devouring chaos of the radical left. How about no? The individual. That's the secret to the world. And you're all individuals, and so you're all the secret to the world. And all you have to do to discover that is pick up your damn responsibility. Stop listening to people who keep burdening you with rights. How many goddamn rights do you want, man? It's like you need some responsibility. So pick it up. Open your eyes and learn how to make yourself articulate. And that way the world won't descend into the series of hells that it already descended into in the 20th century. You've, I think, detailed what you think students shouldn't do in these examples of like protests and these examples of certain types of activist tactics. What advice would you have for students? How can students make the changes that they want to make? Particularly, do you have any advice for students here? Yeah, read great books. Mm -hmm. Really, man, you've got this four-year period that, that has been carved out of your lives by society. They, they, it's, it's given you an identity, like a high-quality identity, and freedom at the same time. And you're not going to get that again in your life. You've got to 
you've got a respectable identity, university student, and complete freedom associated with that, or as near as you're ever going to get. And you've got these unbelievable libraries that are full of the writings of people mm -hmm. who, are, who are intelligent and articulate beyond comprehension. And you, know, and, and you can go there and you can learn all this. And you, you might think, well, why should you learn it? Um, well, you, you learn it to get a job, or you learn it to pe get good grades, or you learn it to get a degree. And that's all nonsense. It's nonsense. The reason that you come to university to be educated is because there is nothing more powerful than someone who is articulate and who can think and speak. It's power. And I mean power of the best sort. It's authority and influence and respectability and competence. And so you come to university to craft your highest skill. And your highest skill is to be found in articulated speech. And if you're, if you're, if you're a master at formulating your arguments, you win everything. And better than that, when you win everything, everyone around you wins too. Because to transform yourself into, let's consider, consider your transformation into something approximating the logos. It means you shine a light on the whole world. Well, there's nothing more exciting to do than that. There's nothing better you can possibly do. And to think that you're coming to university to be you know, trained to have a job, it's like, great, that's a hell of a lot better than being unemployed and covered with Cheeto dust while you're <laughs> snacking away in front of your video game in the basement. But it's not, it's not a, and I don't have anything against video games, by the way. But, it, it, <laughs> but it's hardly a triumphant call to, to being in the world. And that's what universities should be calling forth. It's like, God, you people, you, you know, I, I know what Harvard students are like. I taught here for five years. You people are spectacular. You're spectacular. You, you're, you're, you're all capable of being world beaters. You transform yourself into something that's articulated and sensible and grounded in history and knowledgeable and wise, man. You can do anything you want and hopefully anything you want for good. Because if you have any sense, everything you want to do would be for the good. Because there's nothing more compelling or meaningful or, or useful in combating the tragedy of life than to, than to struggle with all your soul on behalf of the good. And mm -hmm. the universities have forgotten that. It's why everyone's bailing out of the humanities, and they should. The humanities are corrupt. And they're corrupt because they're not telling students this. It's so bloody obvious. It's like, learn to think, learn to speak, learn to read. It makes you a superpower, an individual superpower. You have, it, it, and I don't understand why that isn't just told to students. It's not that hard to understand, and everyone wants to hear it. It's like, really? I could do that? I could do that? It's like, yeah, really, you could do that. And the whole society around you has labored for, really, thousands of years to provide every single one of you with this spectacular opportunity that you have while you're undergraduates and graduate students here. Mm -hmm. Man, they're just, everyone's just praying that you would come here and manifest everything that you could manifest. And that's what you should be doing, instead of waving placards and complaining about how you're oppressed, for God's sake. You see these Yale students complaining about their oppression. It's just, it just leaves me aghast. Mm -hmm. It's like, well, we're against the ruling class. It's like, no, 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 you're baby ruling class <laughs> members. You're young. <laughs> The only reason you're not rich is because you're young. You know, that's the best, really, that's the, if you look at the 1% even, the, the dreaded 1%, you know, most of those people are old. Why? Well, when you progress through life, if you're reasonably successful, you trade in your promising youth for your wealthy old age, but you're still bloody old. Would you, <laughs> would you trade it? Would you trade your youth for that? Like, if you factor age out of the economic equation, things look a lot different. Well, of course older people have more money. If they have any sense, they've been collecting it for their whole life. Is that somehow unfair? It's not unfair unless you want to want to be poverty-stricken when you're 70. And you, and you don't want to be poverty-stricken when you're 70. So, I just don't understand what's happened to the universities. I can't mm -hmm. believe that you're not told when you come the first day, look, man, you are on, you're here on a heroic mission. You're going to take your capacity to articulate yourself to levels that are undreamed of. You're going to come out of here unstoppable. You're going to be able to do anything you want. It's like, that's what you're here for. Mm -hmm. Instead, you're taught that, well, you know, the world's a pretty oppressive place, and you're probably the bottom of the victim pile, and, 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 there's, and there's, oh, there's virtually nothing you can do about it except, you know, deconstruct the patriarchy. And it's so weak deed and so pathetic that, that, that universities should be embarrassed that that's what they're peddling to students. I'm embarrassed by it. 
you know, I've, I've gone on public record telling parents, bloody well send your boys to trade school, because at least they'll learn something useful. Mm. And that's a terrible thing for someone like me to say, because I do believe that, the art, that being articulated and educated in the highest possible manner is, there's nothing that's better for you and for society. Mm -hmm. And why, are the, why have the universities forgotten this? Well, that's postmodern neo-Marxism for you, you know. <laughs> now, then the philosophy of intense resentment and oppression mm -hmm. and group identity and God, it's just mm -hmm. pathetic. Dr. Pearson, I think a lot of students here would agree with you that one of the main purposes of uh, education at college, particularly at Harvard, is to develop their sense of articulation, their ability to read, their ability to crit uh, critically think. But then what comes after? Particularly at Harvard, there's a big discussion on what is a good life? What does it mean to use those skills that we get here and then we graduate? What do we do from there? Stop, and I think, stop mm -hmm. unnecessary suffering. Mm -hmm. That's what you do. You know, that, so, that, that's your mm -hmm. calling. It's like you say, well, what do you do after you graduate? Well, if you graduate articulated and powerful, Mm -hmm. There will be people giving you so many opportunities, you won't even be able to keep up with them. You know, and, and, and I've worked with comp very, very competent people in many different domains in my life. Hyper-competent people. And I can tell you some very interesting things about hyper-competent people. The first thing is, they are not selfish, and they are not greedy. And one of the great pleasures in their lives is to find people who have the capacity to also be hyper-competent and to open doors for them as rapidly as they can possibly be opened. They delight in that, because there is, there's nothing, there's, there's very few things that are more intrinsically meaningful mm -hmm. if you're an accomplished person than to find young people who have the possibility of being accomplished and say, hey, look, here's an opportunity for you. It's like, go out there, man, kill it. And then they go out there and kill it, and you think, right on, man. Here's another opportunity. Why don't you go out there and nail that, too? And you think, no, no, they're all hoarding their wealth, and they're not going to share it with anyone. It's like, that's absolute, complete rubbish. Mm -hmm. And so you don't even have to worry about what you're going to do after you graduate from here if you, if you turn yourself into half of what you could be, because people will be dying to offer you every opportunity that you can possibly make use of. So it's, it's, it's a moot point. The, the, the world is always desperately short of people who can think and speak. Mm -hmm. and, and you think, well, I, that, I won't be made use of. Well, you, first of all, you can't say that if you're, at, if, if you're at Harvard, for God's sake. I mean, people already figured out who you are. They've already figured it out. And they're offering you the world on a, on a gold platter. They take it. It's yours. Mm -hmm. Take it. It's like, great, man. Put mm -hmm. yourself together and deserve it. That would be great. And that's what everyone wants. It's what your parents want. It's also what you want. You know it. It's what you want. It's what men, it's what women want from men. It's what men want from women. It's like for you to be who you could be. And, and the highest faculty of the human being is articulated speech. Mm -hmm. it, it's, it's the divine faculty. And there is nothing more powerful than that. There's nothing that's mm -hmm. even in the same league. And so if you, if you don't have faith in that, then, you're, then your priorities are misplaced. And I, I can't even understand why you wouldn't have faith in that being, say, Harvard students, because look where it's got you already. <laughs> You know, you're already sitting on top of the world. So make, deserve it, make use of it, mm -hmm. right? Go out there and fix things up. That's what you need to do. There's lots of things that need to be fixed up. And what you want to do is burden yourself with so much responsibility that you can barely stand. And then you'll get stronger trying to lift it up. And you won't be asking, what should I be doing with my life? Or what's the meaning of life? Or any of that. It'll be self-evident. Mm -hmm. It's self-evident. At minimum, you can say, there's more suffering in the world than there should be, and I could probably do something about that. And you mm -hmm. can do something about that. So go do something about it, and then there'll be less suffering in the world. And then when you're 80, you can look back on your life and say, well, you know, there's less suffering in the world than there, than there would have been had I not existed. Mm -hmm. and, and you don't have to even have a, a sense of, of ultimate destiny or even any sort of theistic belief mm -hmm. to regard that as a positive good. Like, I think it goes beyond the, the mere pragmatic utility of addressing the world's ills, because I think we do live in a, in, a, in a world that has a transcendent reality as well as the reality that we can detect. But even independently of that, it doesn't matter. Hmm. It's like, I mean, this is part of the reason I like people. Like Bill Gates is a great example, man. That guy, hmm. is, he's after five major diseases at the same time, right? He's trying to wipe out polio. He's trying to wipe out um, malaria. Yeah, exactly. He's trying to wipe out malaria. It's like, well, what should you do with your life? Well, you know, take a look at Bill Gates and see if you could do something like that. Mm. That would be good. <laughs>
soul. So Dr. Peterson, you talk about this idea of ending unnecessary suffering and this idea of committing one's life to that. At a minimum. I mean, that's At just an obvious yeah. thing that you could do. A lot of students, I think, accept that premise and view what they're doing as trying to eliminate or reduce unnecessary suffering. And they see activism or other forms of direct service as fulfilling that goal. Do you simply disagree with like the content of what they think, the, the tactic that they are using to end unnecessary suffering? Or do you think that their motives or their intentions are not even the same as yours? It's too public. You know, there's this, there's this, old, there's this old saying from the, from the New Testament about not praying in public, hmm. right? And the idea is that if you're going to commune for the higher good, you should do it in private, because otherwise you're warping your ethic in some sense by demonstrating how virtuous you, virtuous you are to the world. Mm -hmm. It's like, you know, I'm, you go out there with a stick and a sign on it that says, I'm against poverty. It's like, yeah, no kidding, man. <laughs> really. Like, who's, who's for poverty? No one's for poverty. So it's, 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 it's an abdication of responsibility with the mask of social virtue. Mm -hmm. You want to solve a difficult problem is you figure out how to get along with your brother, the one you've been fighting with for mm -hmm. five years. Or see if you can staple your family back together. See if you can stop fighting with your girlfriend and have a relationship that lasts for more than two weeks. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like there are things that you should be doing in the confines of your own life that are private and humble. That would, that would constitute genuine accomplishments, and those are the things that you should attend to. And no one's going to come along and say, hey, you know, good job, you're, you're changing the world. Because it's, it's private, but mm. it's real, and, and people don't do that. And so, no, I don't, I don't, trust, the activist, I, I don't trust the activist ethos at all. Hmm. I, think it, I think everything about it is, is superficial and, mm -hmm. and trendy and, and too easy and... And it externalizes the blame. The evil is always elsewhere, which mm. is a dreadful mistake to make, because the evil isn't elsewhere. That's, that's the thing that you understand when you're wise, hmm. is the evil is not elsewhere. It's you, because you're not everything you could be. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, you should work on that before going and telling someone else that maybe they're not who they should be. Mm -hmm. So I think it's, you know, I, so I don't buy it. It's too easy. It's far mm. too easy. And it's too public. Mm -hmm. And it's too self-congratulatory. And then there's the murderous, like, Marxist element, which, you know, I'm always often inclined to mention. So certainly, I think you've identified certain causes where the public element of trying to do good or the self-congratulatory virtue of trying to do good could be harmful. But do you think there are cases, for instance, I'm thinking of policy, influencing policy, being a policymaker. It seems like something like that, public policy, could be used to eliminate some unnecessary suffering, but would involve a more public domain, something where you are trying to attract followers, trying to attract praise from other people. Look, look, if, mm -hmm. you've, if you've established yourself in the world as a credible human being, mm -hmm. and people are asking you to enter public service because of your accomplishments, then it's time to do it. Mm -hmm. Right. But before that, it's a little on the premature side. Mm -hmm. And if you're just setting yourself for forward as an avatar of an, of an ideology, then there's nothing to you except I think of it as the chattering of various forms of demons. It's like you're not helpful. And if you, if you look, you want to think, okay, are you fit to lead? Yeah. Let's, let's put it that way. Okay, first of all, do you know where you're going? Because that's actually one of the hallmarks of a leader. A leader knows where he's going, and maybe other people are also interested in going that way. Mm -hmm. But the leaders I've met have carved themselves out a personal vision. Right? Mm -hmm. it's, not some, it's not some cookie cutter ideological solution to the ills of the planet. They've done a detailed analysis, right? They know what they're talking about. Mm -hmm. And they're usually people, well, they've had a successful relationship. They've had a successful family. They have a couple of degrees. They've established a business. Like, mm -hmm. they've made themselves credible in five or six dimensions. Well, then maybe you know enough about the world to dare to mess with its internal mechanisms. And if you, if you don't have that kind of in-depth knowledge, then you should just, you shouldn't, you should no more work on the economic systems of mm -hmm. Western civilization than you should try to adjust the electronic systems of your automobile. Because the latter is far less complex than the former. So of course there's utility in policy formulation and in, in government service and in all of those sorts mm -hmm. of things. But you have to you have to have transformed yourself, at least to some degree, into someone who's actually competent before mm -hmm. you should even dare to do such things. You think, well, 
I've read some Marx and now I know how to change the world. It's like, mm. that, that's a very bad idea. Because yeah. the probability that you're going to take something complex that doesn't work too badly and fix it with your idiotic intervention is zero. Mm -hmm. So, hmm. well put. <laughs> <laughs> The chaos is hiding in what's irrelevant. And so, and that's a very interesting observation because since the chaos is virtually infinite, it's a real question. So where the hell do you put it? Well, you put it in what you ignore. And you can ignore it as long as it isn't actively interfering with your movement forward, you can assume that it's, that it doesn't matter. That it isn't matter. That it doesn't matter. Same thing. All right, so here's the kicker. There's one more class of things that you can run into along the way. And this is where the chaos breaks through. So let's say, you're moving from point A to point B, and something that you don't expect occurs. And it gets in the way. So let's say that you're living with someone, and maybe you kind of like them. You're not married. So you don't like them that much, because otherwise you'd ask them to marry you, but anyways. Um, and so a quarter of you is looking for something better, and three quarters of you is half satisfied, something like that. And uh, then the person, because we're ambivalent about such things, and then the person you discover or the person announces that they've been having an affair. Okay, so then how are you supposed to respond emotionally to that? Well, the part of you that wasn't all that committed to the relationship is kind of exhilarated by that. And then the three quarters of you that's half satisfied is hurt and, and you're going to exploit that part for sure in the ensuing discussions and not mention the, oh, that's kind of exciting that you've, you know, betrayed me that way. So, so, but the point is, is that you, that's a hole. Now what's happened is a hole has, you have this structure that you're walking on, like ice, like the thin ice that you're skating on, and now there's a hole in it. And the hole, we don't even know how deep the hole is, but you know there's a hole there, and so now you're anxious about it, oh, though maybe also a little bit excited because God only knows what's down there. But, but the th you don't know how, what to do with that hole because it could spread very badly on you. It could be that you know, the whole relationship was a facade and that all your relationships have been facade, facades, and that the reason that is is because you're so damn shallow that it's impossible for you to have a relationship that isn't just a facade, and that's partly because you don't pay any attention to other people, and it's also partly because you're malevolent and selfish. So that's a nasty thing to discover. Or maybe that's the sort of person that you're attracting, which would make sense, actually, if that's the sort of person that you are. And so, so there are certain things that you can encounter that basically unglue you and what happens is that those moments of being unglued travel up that entire hierarchy of presuppositions. It's like because the, one of the logical conclusions to being betrayed in a relationship is that, you are, that you're truly a bad person. Now, another equally logical conclusion is that the person that you're with is really a bad person. And another logical conclusion is all people are truly bad people. You know, I mean... In, in, in macro ways and in micro ways, you can't trust anyone. You can't trust women, you can't trust men, you can't trust human beings, you can't trust yourself. The whole place is a catastrophe, it's a nightmare. Well, then you can fall through into chaos. Now, the way your body responds to that, when something, or maybe, you know, you're supposed to be getting a promotion at work, that's good. You're all chipper about the promotion at work, and you, you walk into your boss's office because he or she wants to see you, and they say, well, you know, we've reviewed your performance over the last few years, and um, your performance has been somewhere between mediocre and decent, and we're downsizing, and see you later. That's not a raise or a promotion, that's for sure. That's a hole that you fall into. And the question is, well, what do you make of that, right? How do you frame that? How do you take that emergent chaos and make habitable order out of it. You don't know. Is the whole capitalist system rotten to the core? I mean, that's a convenient explanation under those circumstances, that's for sure. Were you working for a psychopathic son of a bitch? Did you make the wrong choice in university and was that your father's fault because you never did what you want or was it your fault for not standing up to him? Or is it a dying 
industry or is maybe this a wake up call that you should go do something else that you've been waiting to do, you know, that you've actually wanted to do your whole life and that's why you're doing such a miserable job at your current occupation because you're bitter and resentful about the fact that you never did what you want. You don't know, it's all of those things at once. And that's very stressful because all of those things at once is too many things. And that's the re-emergence of chaos. That's the flood. That's the return to the beginning of the cosmos. That's another way that it's been represented mythologically. It's that you voyage all the way back to the beginning of the cosmos when there's nothing but undifferentiated chaos. And that's what you're confronting. And maybe it's too much for you. And often it is. I mean, that, that can really, that can be tra traumatizing. It can hurt your brain, you know, it's just too much for you to bear. But it doesn't matter, you're stuck with it. And so how do you respond to that? Well, some of it is catastrophic negative emotion. You freeze and that's protective. And maybe you don't even want to move. You don't want to bloody well get out of bed for a week. And that's because your body is reacting as if the bedroom floor is covered with snakes and the best thing for you to do is just not move, just freeze. Not a pleasant situation to be in because it's, you're hyper aroused very, very physiologically demanding, and there's zero about it that's productive, except maybe the snakes won't see you. But they've already seen you, so that isn't helping very well. So you've got all this undifferentiated negative emotion, anxiety, fear, hurt, anger, guilt, shame, emotional pain, the whole plethora of catastrophes. And then maybe on the other side, lurking down there is, thank God I'm done with that job. I just bloody well hate it. I drag myself off to work every day. And there's a little part of my soul that's so goddamn happy I finally got fired that I can hardly stand it. You know, and maybe you don't even admit that to yourself because, well, that would mean that all that time you spent at the job was just sunk cost. You're deluding yourself the whole time. Um, it is in an interesting thing to consider, though, sometimes if you're in the unpleasant circumstance of having to fire someone. You know, sometimes firing someone is the best thing that can happen to them, which doesn't mean that you should go out and, like, enjoy it. <laughs> Although I have met very disagreeable people who actually enjoyed firing people. I'll tell you a story about that at some point because it's quite interesting. But, you know, sometimes if someone's just limping along in their job and doing it as miserably and wretchedly as they possibly can imagine, the best thing you can do to them for them is to say, you know, you're failing at this. <laughs> and, and that doesn't necessarily mean that you would have to be failing at absolutely everything else in the entire world. So maybe you should just accept the damn failure and go off and try something new. And I mean, that's terrifying for people, and I know they hate it and all that, but, but, but sometimes it's better than the alternative, which is just slow, torturous death. You know, the idea of dream analysis, I suppose, is one of Freud's, perhaps Freud's major contribution to modern Western thought. The idea was there was something to dreams. And I, I suppose what, what Freud did is said, hey, look, isn't it strange? We have this whole other form of thought that we engage in at night, it, it, and it speaks in a language that we don't really understand. And so what the hell is that? And you can say, and many modern people do, dreams are of no significance, or even that they're random processes, which is an absurd proposition, obviously, because they're by, they're all, whatever they are, they're obviously not random. So, so Freud's idea was that there was some, something in dreams that was informative. So that's his, now he had a method for, describe, for extracting out from the dream what the dream purported to represent. And he outlined that in great de detail in the interpretation of dreams. And if you want to read one book by Freud, I would highly recommend that one. It's a very long book and it's very detailed, but... Freud does an extraordinarily comprehensive analysis of the way that dreams work. Now he made the, because, because he had brought a theoretical framework to bear, even on his investigation into dream structure, he concluded that dreams were essentially wish fulfillments. And that's where Jung and Freud disagreed. He also believed that the primary motivating factor of human beings was sexual. And now that's a tougher one to toss aside because even if you're a Darwinian, rather than a Freudian, you're going to obviously support the proposition that sexual motivation among any living creature is going to be one of the highest order motivations because otherwise creatures don't reproduce and, and prevail over the long run. So the question is, is that, the, is that the ultimate source of motivation? And in some sense, the answer to that has to be yes. 
Well, Freud wanted to make that, in some ways, the sole source of motivation. And I'm oversimplifying, and I hate to do that in relationship to Freud, because he was not a simple-minded character. Jung had a dream once, if I remember correctly, that Freud and Jung were excavating a basement. And so Freud had outlined, in the, Freud had already discovered the basement, let's say, so that would be the unconscious structure of the psyche. And Jung broke through into another basement that was a multi-chambered place. So many, many, many rooms. And I suppose what drove Jung and Freud apart was Jung's proposition that there was a hell of a lot more going down, going on down there than had already met the eye. And they broke on the idea that the sexual impulse was primary roughly speaking. They broke when Jung wrote a book called Symbols of Transformation, which is actually, there's, there's three books that I know of that are sort of like maps of meaning. One is Symbols of Transformation. One is a book by Eric Neumann called The Origins and History of Consciousness. And the third, and the third one, well, is Maps of Meaning. They're the same book. They're just like they're trying to solve the same problem from three different directions. They're all attempts to address the same problem. And so Symbols of Transformation was a book that Jung wrote about the fantasies of a schizophrenic um, American woman. And he was, he was trying to relate her fantasies to these old mythological ideas. And Jung's idea, essentially, and this is an idea that was shared by people like Piaget, so we, we're not going to say that Jung or Freud just pulled this idea out of the air, was that the, the birthplace of myth mythology and literature, for that matter, was the dream. That, that they share structural, that they, they share, uh, they, sh they share, what, mode of information presentation. And it's a relatively radical hypothesis, but but given that they both, they both represent Dreams, dreams and mythological representations share an essentially narrative structure and they use their literary like, you know, I mean, it's not so unreasonable to notice that a dream at night is like the movie that you play in your head. And it's not unreasonable to note as well that the dreams that you have at night bear a relationship to the daydreams that you have during the day. It's a form of cognition. It seems like an involuntary form of cognition, though, and that's a very strange thing. So Jung thought about the dream as nature speaking of its own accord roughly speaking. And so his idea was, well, when you, when you sleep, you dream, but the dream happens to you. It's not something that you create the way that, and you don't even think about creating it. Because I might say, well, what are you thinking about? And you'll say, I'm thinking about whatever it is. And you'll take credit in some sense for thinking that because it seems like a voluntary activity. But what happens at night is that you think, but you think involuntarily. And so what Jung would say is that means that something is thinking in you. And that's a perfectly reasonable way of, of looking at it. And this is one of the things that's uncanny about the psychoanalysts, is they, they were willing to take their observations to their logical conclusion. There are things that think in you. What are those things? And what are they thinking? And why are they thinking it? Now, if you do dream analysis, and this is a tricky thing, because who's to say if your damn analysis is correct, right? It's very difficult to understand that. If you, if you do dream analysis with someone, you generally g have them lay out their dream. And then you ask them when they're going through their dream a second time. You, they lay out their dream and you can kind of get a picture of it. And then they lay out their dream a second time. And as they go through it, every time they mention a detail or a character, you ask them what that reminds them of. And the hypothesis is that the dream is presenting an image or an idea that's associated with a network of ideas and that if you can expand on the network of ideas as you go through the dream, you can elaborate on the dream, you can expand it upwards and you can start to see what it might be attempting to put forward. Now, Freud's idea was that the dream knew what it was doing but that its content was being suppressed and oppressed by an internal censor. So the dream had to be sneaky about what it was saying because it was going to deliver a message that the person didn't want to hear. And that, that was tied up with his idea of repression. But that's not Jung's idea. See, Jung's idea was different. He said, no, no. The dream is trying to tell you what it's trying to tell you as clear as it can. That's just the best it can do. And so you could think of the dream, and this is, I believe, the right way to think about it. The dream is the birthplace of thought the same way that artists are the birthplace of culture. 
It's exactly the same process. It's that your mind is groping outward to try to comprehend what it has not yet comprehended. And it does that first by trying to map it onto image. And it's doing that in the dream, and it's somewhat incoherent. And, and, and well, let's stick with incoherent, because it's not yet a full-fledged thought. It's the birthplace of thought. It's a fantasy about what might be. And then if you can grip the fantasy and share it with other people, then maybe they can elaborate upon it and bring it into being with more clarity than it would be if it merely existed as the precursor of a thought in your imagination. You know, if you take people, and I've told you this, and you expose them voluntarily to things that they are avoiding and are afraid of, you know, that they know they need to overcome in order to meet their goals, their self-defined goals, if you can teach people to stand up in the face of the things they're afraid of, they get stronger. And you don't know what the upper limits to that are, because you might ask yourself, like, if for 10 years, if you didn't avoid doing what you knew you needed to do, by, the def by your own definitions, right, within the value structure that you've created to the degree that you've done that, what would you be like? Well, you know, there are remarkable people who come into the world from time to time, and there are people who do find out over decades long periods what they could be like if they were who they were, if they said, if they spoke their being forward. And they get stronger and stronger and stronger, and we don't know the limits to that. We do not know the limits to that. And so you could say, well, in part, perhaps the reason that you're suffering unbearably can be left at your feet, because you're not everything you could be, and you know it. And of course, that's a terrible thing to admit, and it's a terrible thing to consider, but there's real promise in it, right? Because it means that perhaps there's another way that you could look at the world, and number, another way that you could act in the world, so what it would reflect back to you would be much better than what it reflects back to you now. And then the second part of that is, well, Imagine that many people did that, because we've done a lot as human beings, we've done a lot of remarkable things, and I've told you already, I think before that today, for example, about 250,000 people will be lifted out of abject poverty, and about 300,000 people attached to the electrical power grid. We're making people, we're lifting people out of poverty collectively at a faster rate that's ever occurred in the history of humankind by a huge margin, and that's been going on unbelievably quickly since the year 2000. The UN had pl planned to have poverty between 2000 and 2015, and it was accomplished by 2013. So there's inequality developing in many places, and you hear lots of political agitation about that. But overall, the, the tide is lifting everyone up, and that's a great thing. And we have no idea how fast we could multiply that if people got their act together and really aimed at it. Because, you know, my, my experience is with people that we're probably running at about 51% of our capacity. Something, I mean, you can think about this yourselves. I often ask undergraduates how many hours a day you waste or how many hours a week you waste. And the classic answer is something like four to six hours a day. You know, inefficient studying, uh, watching things on YouTube that not only do you not want to watch, that you don't even care about, that make you feel horrible about watching after you're done. That's probably four hours right there. You know, you think, well, that's. 20, 25 hours a week, it's 100 hours a month, that's two and a half full work weeks, it's half a year of work weeks per year. And if your time is worth $20 an hour, which is a radical underestimate, it's probably more like 50, if you think about it in terms of deferred wages. If you're wasting 20 hours a week, you're wasting $50,000 a year. And you are doing that right now. And it's because you're young, wasting $50,000 a year is a way bigger catastrophe than it would be for me to waste it, because I'm not going to last nearly as long. And so if your life isn't everything it could be, you could ask yourself, well, what would happen if you just stopped wasting the opportunities that are in front of you? You'd be, who knows how much more efficient? 10 times more efficient. 20 times more efficient. That's the Pareto distribution. You have no idea how efficient, efficient people get. It's completely, it's off the charts. Well, and if we all got our act together collectively and stop making things worse, because that's another thing people do all the time, not only do they not do what they should to make things better, they actively attempt to make things worse because they're spiteful or resentful or arrogant or deceitful or, or homicidal or genocidal or all of those things all bundled together in an absolutely pathological package. If people stopped really, really trying just to make things worse, we have no idea how much better they would get just because of that. 
So there's this weird dynamic that's part of the existential system of ideas between human vulnerability, social judgment, both of which are, 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 are major causes of suffering, and the failure of individuals to adopt the responsibility that they know they should adopt. And that's the thing that's interesting too, is that, and like one of the, another thing I've often asked my undergraduate classes is, you know, there's this idea that, that people have, that people have a conscience. And you know what the conscience is, it's, it's this feeling or voice you have in your head just before you do something that you know is stupid, telling you that probably you shouldn't do that stupid thing. You don't have to listen to it, strangely enough, but you go ahead and do it anyways, and then, of course, exactly what the conscience told you was going to happen inevitably happens, so that you feel even stupider about it than you would if it happened by accident, because you, you know, I knew this was going to happen, I got a warning it was going to happen, and I went and did it anyways. And the funny thing, too, is that that conscience operates within people, and we really don't understand what the hell that is. So you might say, well, what would happen if you abided by your conscience for five years or for ten years? What sort of position might you be in? What sort of family might you have? What sort of relationship might you be able to forge? And you can be bloody sure that a relationship that's forged on the basis of who you actually are is going to be a lot stronger and more welcome than one that's forged on the basis of who you aren't. Now, of course, that means that the person you're with has to deal with the full force of you in all your ability and your catastrophe, and that's a very, very difficult thing to negotiate. But if you do negotiate it, well, at least you, you have something, you have somewhere solid to stand, and you have somewhere to live, you have a real life. And it's a great basis upon which to bring children into the world, for example, because you can have an actual relationship with them instead of torturing them half to death, which is what happens in a, tremendous, a tremendously large minority of cases. Well, it's more than that, too, because, and this is what I'll close with, and this is why I wanted to introduce Solzhenitsyn's writings to you, you see. Because it isn't merely that your fate depends on whether or not you get your act together and to what degree you decide that you're going to live out your own genuine being. It isn't only your fate. It's the fate of everyone that you're networked with. And so, you know, you think, well, there's 9 billion, 7 billion people in the world. We're going to peak at about 9 billion, by the way and then it'll decline rapidly, but 7 billion people in the world, and who are you? You're just one little dust moat among that 7 billion, and so it really doesn't matter what you do or don't do, but that's simply not the case. It's the wrong model, because you're at the center of a network. You're a node in a network. Of course, that's even more true now that we have social media. You'll, you know, you'll know a thousand people, at least over the course of your life, and they'll know a thousand people each, and that puts you one person away from a million and two persons away from a billion. And so that's how you're connected. And the things you do, they're like dropping a stone in a pond. The ripples move outward, and they affect things in ways that you can't fully comprehend. And it means that the things that you do and that you don't do are far more important than you think. And so if you act that way, of course, the terror of realizing that is that it actually starts to matter what you do. And you might say, well, that's better than living a meaningless existence, it's better for it to matter. But I mean, if you really asked yourself, would you be so sure if you had the choice? I can live with no responsibility whatsoever. The price I pay is that nothing matters. Or I can reverse it and everything matters. But I have to take the responsibility that's associated with that. It's not so obvious to me that people would take the meaningful path. Now, when you say, well, nihilists suffer dreadfully because there's no meaning in their life and they still suffer, yeah, but the advantage is they have no responsibility. So that's the payoff, and I actually think that's the motivation. Say, well, I can't help being nihilistic. All my belief systems have collapsed. It's like, yeah, maybe. Maybe you've just allowed them to collapse because it's a hell of a lot easier than acting them out. And the price you pay is some meaningless suffering, but you can always whine about that and people will feel sorry for you, and you have the option of taking the pathway of the martyr, so that's a pretty good deal, all things considered especially when the, when the alternative is to bear your burden properly and to live forthrightly in the world. Well, what Solzhenitsyn figured out, and so many people in the 20th century, it's not just him, even though he's the best example, is that if you live a pathological life, you pathologize your society. And if enough people do that, then it's hell. Really. Really. And you can read the Gulag Archipelago if you have the fortitude to do that, and you'll see exactly what hell is like. 
and then you can decide if that's a place you'd like to visit or even more importantly, if it's a, light, if it's a place you'd like to visit and take all your family and friends because that's what happened in the 20th century okay, so now I'll read you the story of the Buddha the father of Prince Gautama, the Buddha, savior of the Orient, determined to protect his son from desperate knowledge and tragic awareness, built for him an enclosed pavilion, a walled garden of earthly delights. Okay, so the, the story goes that an angel visited Buddha's father and said that he's going to have a son, and the son is either going to become the greatest ruler that the world has ever seen, or a spiritual leader. And the father, being a practical man, thought, well, there's no bloody way. I want my son to be some, like, wandering spiritual leader. I want him to be the greatest king that the world has ever seen. Okay, and so um, the father decides, how am I going to get my son to be the greatest ruler the world has ever seen, I better get him to fall in love with the world because then he's not going to go traipsing after some sort of half-witted spiritual knowledge. He's going to stick to practical tasks, right? That's something that a father should do to some degree is orient you in the world, right? And maybe you shouldn't subvert your, your spiritual development to any great degree, but there's a practical element to this. And and so anyways, that's how it works. And so that's what happens. The The, the father builds this city of perfection and he eliminates from it everything that's re a reminder of the suffering that's associated with life so the only thing that's allowed the only creatures that are allowed to be in there the only people that are allowed to be in there are healthy young and happy people so the buddha grows up surrounded by nothing but the positive elements of life well you think well what does that mean well it's akin to the paradise idea obviously walled enclosure of paradise where there's no death but there's more to it than that too. It's also in some sense what a good father would do. What do you do with your young children? Well, you don't expose them to death and decay at every step of the way, right? You, you build a protected world for them, like a walled enclosure, and you only keep what's healthy and life-giving inside of it. And you don't expose them to things that they can't tolerate. You know, maybe you don't take a three-year-old to a funeral. Now, maybe you do, but maybe you don't. There's things that you don't expect them to be able to cope with. You regulate what they're allowed to watch. You're not going to show them the te Texas Chainsaw Massacre when they're four years old, right? So, so you're staving off knowledge of mortality and death. And so he's just being a good father in many ways here. All signs of decay and degeneration were thus kept hidden from the prince. Immersed in the immediate pleasures of the senses, in physical love, in dance, in music, in beauty, and pleasure, Gautama grew to maturity, protected absolutely from the limitations of mortal being. However, he grew curious, despite his father's most particular attention and will, and resolved to leave his seductive prison. Well, it's that curiosity element. It's the same thing that lurks in the Adam and Eve story. It's like God tells Adam and Eve, see that tree over there? Don't be bothering with it. Well, you know what's going to happen with human beings, especially if there's a snake associated with it. They're going to be over there right away checking that place out. And that's exactly what happens with the Buddha. It's like he's raised to be healthy. And what is, what's the consequence of that? Is that the fact that he's healthy makes him look for what's beyond the protected confines of the thing that made him healthy. It's like, it's like even in the Geppetto story, you know, where Geppetto paints on Pinocchio's mouth and he's ready to go. He puts him outside the next day and Pinocchio's ready to run away with all the kids, right? So the consequence of raising a child in a healthy way is that the child is going to be curious enough to go out there and look for some trouble. And we actually know that because there is follow-up studies of teenagers. You imagine that there's teenagers who never break any rules. And then there's teenagers who break all the rules, okay? These teenagers don't do very well. Introverted, depressed, anxious, depressed. Sorry, I said that twice. These ones are antisocial. The ones in the middle, that's what you want. You want your damn teenager to get out of the paradisal confines of your house and to go cause some trouble and to investigate. Maybe you don't want to know about it any more than you have to. You don't want them to be breaking rules all the time, and you don't want them to be so timid and oppressed that they can't make a move on their own and never make a mistake. So the, the, the paradoxical thing here, and it's sort of echoed, uh, this is why I like these two stories back to back, is like, if you give people what they want, then the first thing they're going to do is try to get beyond it. And Dostoevsky says the same thing in Notes from Underground. He says, if you gave people everything they wanted, pure utopia, so he says, so that they're, they're sitting in a pool of bliss with nothing but bubbles of happiness coming up from the surface, and all they have to do is eat cake and busy themselves with the continuation of the species, Dostoevsky's 
observation is the first thing that people would do is find something to smash that with just so that something interesting and perverse could happen. It's like, well, yes, we're, we're creatures that are designed to encounter the unknown. We want to keep moving beyond what we have. Even if we have what we have is what we want. And maybe that's partly because we're oriented towards the future. We think, well, this is great, but it's not good enough. It's great, but it's not good enough. There's always something more that drives us forward. Well, so that's what happens with the Buddha. He gets curious. He sees the walls. He thinks there's walls. There's probably something outside of those walls. So then he goes to his father and he says, I'm, I want to go outside. What's outside? And his father says, no, nah, you don't want to go outside. And Buddha says, yeah, well, I really do want to go outside. And his father knows that unless he lets him go outside, he's going to climb over the walls. And so the father decides he's going to let him go outside, but he's going to fix everything out there first. So he goes outside. It's like the Chinese preparing for the Olympics. You know, when they sprayed the grass with, with, uh, with green paint, got rid of all the homeless people. It's the same thing. So he goes outside the city and he tells everyone, all right, old people, sick people, dying people, hit the road. <laughs> we don't want to see you for a while. Clean all this out. We want the attractive people around the sides of the roads, like waving palm fronds and all of that. And so when my son comes out, he's going to see nothing but what's good. And so he gets that all arranged and he lets his son go outside. Now, his son goes outside in this little chariot thing and he has a, uh, someone with him. Now, unbeknownst to his father, that person that's with him is an emissary of the gods. And so he, in a perverse way, he plays the same role as the serpent in the story of, of, of Adam and Eve. And the gods have already arranged so that the father's uh, care is going to be insufficient. And it's the snake in the garden idea. It's like no matter how much care you take to make things perfect, some of, the, some of what, what you're excluding is going to come back in. So anyways, Buddha goes outside and, and he's in his chariot and preparations were made to gild his chosen route, to cover the adventurer's path with flowers and to display for his admiration and preoccupation the fairest women of the kingdom. The prince set out with full retinue in the shielded comfort of a chaperone chariot and delighted in the panorama previously prepared for him. The gods, however, decided to disrupt these most carefully laid plans and sent an aged man to hobble in full view alongside the road. The prince's fascinated gaze fell upon the ancient interloper. Compelled by curiosity, he asked his attendant, what is that creature stumbling, shabby, bent and broken beside my retinue? And the attendant answered, that is a man like other men who was born an infant, became a child, a youth, a husband, a father, a father of fathers. He has become old, subject to destruction of his beauty, his will, and the possibilities of life. Like other men, you say, hesitantly inquired the prince. That means this will happen to me? And the attendant answered, inevitably, with the passage of time. Well, that's the end of that party. The world collapses in on Buddha and bang, he hightails it home. Well, what does that mean? Well, that's what children do, roughly speaking, as they're around their mother. They're, they've got security there. They go out into the unknown. They encounter something that's just a little bit too much for them. Bang, they come home. They get all patted back into shape and hugged and taken care of. Hugging children and patting them is actually analgesic. It actually reduces pain. Unsurprisingly, that's what you do with someone who's grieving, right? So you hug them because grief is pain. So... So they, you know, you pat them, they get rid of their pain, they get rid of their anxiety, you calm them down, and what happens? Well, the next day they want to go out again. Well, that's exactly what happens to the Buddha. So he's all shorted out by his encounter with death, which is very little different than what happens to Adam and Eve, runs back, recovers for six months. He has post-traumatic stress disorder. He runs home and he recovers for six months, right? In time, his anxiety lessened, his curiosity grew, and he ventured outside again. This time the God sent a sick man into view. This creature, he asked his attendant, shaking and palsied, horribly afflicted, unbearable to behold, a source of pity and contempt. What is he? And the attendant answered, that's a man like other men who was born whole, but who became ill and sick, unable to cope, a burden to himself and others, suffering and incurable. Like other men, you say, inquired the prince, this could happen to me. And the attendant answers, no man is exempt from the ravages of disease. Once again, the world collapsed and Gautama returned to his home. But the delights of his previous life were ashes in his mouth and he ventured forth a third time. The gods in their mercy sent him a dead man in funeral procession. 
This creature, he asked his attendant, laying so still, appearing so fearsome, surrounded by grief and by sorrow, lost and forlorn. What is he? And the attendant answered, that is a man like other men, born of woman, beloved and hated, who was once you, who once was you and now is the earth. Like other men, you say, inquired the prince, then this could happen to me. This is your end, said the attendant and the end of all men. Well, that's the end of childhood, right? There's no going back after that. It's like Pinocchio goes back. There's no one home anymore. It's there's nothing that your father can do to protect you from knowledge of death. There's no returning to the childhood unconsciousness because you're, you now know, and there's no going backwards. Suicide, that's going backwards. That's how you replace your emergent self-consciousness with the old blissful unconsciousness. And that's exactly what suicidal people wish. They're going to destroy their painful self-consciousness and make it all go away. The world collapsed a final time and Gautama asked to be returned home. But the attendant had orders from the prince's father and took him instead to a festival of women occurring, near, occurring nearby in a grove in the woods. The prince was met by a beautiful assemblage who offered themselves freely to him without restraint in song, dance, and play in the spirit of sensual love. But Gautama could think only of death and the inv- inevitable decomposition of beauty and took no pleasure in the display. Well, so you see the parallels between one story and the other. They're the same, they have the same underlying structure. Initial paradise, partly childhood, partly unconsciousness, the emergence of knowledge of mortality into that and the demolition of the the paradise. It's the same meta story that we've been talking about all along. Ordered state, collapse into chaos. Well, the rest of the story is the return. Like in the Bible, Bible is actually set up that way. It's collapse into history and then a movement upward. The question is, what's the movement upward? That's the question here. When the collapse is caused by knowledge of mortality and self and the emergence of self consciousness and knowledge of death, is there any manner in which redemption can be attained? Or is that the final, like, is that finally, is that, does that finally demolish you? Well, that's the question. And that's, 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 it's the answer to that question that entire civilizations constantly pursue. And the question is, well, what is the answer? And part of the answer is identification with the spirit that generates order out of chaos. Well, I'll tell you a couple of strange things that, that things that I don't really understand. The first is when we've done the analysis of the effects of the future authoring program, it has had a different differential impact on men. And it's had a particularly differential impact on what I would call excluded men. And so that would be non-Western ethnic minority men or, or what majority men who aren't doing very well. So for example, at Mohawk College, the future authoring program had a particularly robust effect on Mohawk College students who were men who hadn't done very well in high school and who hadn't pre- picked a major that had a destination, a career destination at its end. So you can imagine those people are, they have an ambiguous relationship with the idea of education. And they're not oriented specifically towards a goal. They're not very motivated. Now, why did it have a differential effect on men? That's a good question. Well, first of all, the women are doing better. So it might just be a matter of the fact that it does better for people who aren't doing as well, and at the moment, most of them are men. I don't believe, I think that might be part of it. But I don't believe that's all of it. I think that part of the reason that women are doing better is because they're agreeable. And so if a system sets out a structure and says, here's a pathway to attainment, the women won't rebel against that, they'll go along with it. And that's working very well for them at the moment. The men, especially the men on the disagreeable end of the distribution, and there's way more men on the disagreeable end of the distribution than there are women, right? That's what you get from, if you look at overlapping normal distributions. So there's the male, female distribution for agreeableness, male distribution for agreeableness. Tremendous overlap. Okay, women are higher. All the really agreeable people are women. All the really disagreeable people are men. And maybe the real differences occur at the extremes, right? So, so and it's, it's a very interesting side effect of overlapping distributions. So they, people can be mostly the same, but that can still produce radical differences. Disagreeable men won't do anything they don't want to do. They just say, up yours. I'll go home and play video games. Are you with you? I'm not listening to your stupid classes. 
And why should I work for you? I'll just go have fun. I'll do my own thing. I don't think they're motivated. And so then if you take the men who are like that and you say, okay, what do you want? You can have what you want, but you have to figure out what it is. So then they write down what they want and they think, oh, hey, well, that might be worth having, so maybe I'll put some effort into it. That's what it looks like to me. Now, you know, that's weak evidence. And this is a weak argument. But I'm trying to stretch out my understanding to account for this. But I'll tell you something else that's really weird. I don't understand this either. So, more than 90% of the people who watch my videos on YouTube are men. Now that's weird, because not about 80% of psychology students are women. So that is not what you would expect, right? You'd expect that the majority of them would be women. And you might say, well, it's because of the political stance I've taken. And I thought, well, that's possible. So I went and looked at the demographic data, because I have that. Well, before I did any of the political videos, 85% of my viewers were men. So it's actually increased a bit, it's increased by 6%. And that's not trivial, but it was still overwhelmingly men. So that was interesting. I thought, what the hell? Why is that exactly? And then now I've been watching crowds when I've been talking to them. And the crowds that have come to see me in person. This happened at the University of Toronto free speech debate. And I actually noticed it and commented on it before the debate took place, because I was talking about intrinsic differences between men and women. And I looked around the room and I thought, hmm, hey, 80% of the people in this room are men. So I had all the men sta women stand up and then all the men stand up. I said, look, like, Here's a natural experiment. For some reason, 80% of the people who showed up to this are men. Now, everybody thought I was kind of cracked to, to do that. And it was a risk, you know. And, and, and I, but I thought, no, there's something going on here. And then, what's interesting now is that every public appearance that I've made that's related to the sort of topics that we're discussing is overwhelmingly men. It's like, it's like 85 to 90%. And so I thought, wow, that's weird. Like, what the hell's going on here exactly? And then the other thing I've noticed is that I've been talking a lot to the crowds that I've been talking to, not about rights, but about responsibility, right? Because you can't have the bloody converse. What are you doing? You can't have the conversation about rights without the conversation about responsibility, because your rights are my responsibility. That's what they are, technically. So you just can't have only half of that discussion. And we're only having half that discussion. And the question is, well, what the hell are you leaving out if you only have that half of the discussion? And the answer is, well, you're leaving out responsibility. And then the question is, well, what are you leaving out if you're leaving out responsibility? And the answer might be, well, maybe you're leaving out the meaning of life. That's what it looks like to me. It's like, here you are, suffering away. What makes it worthwhile? Rights? You know, you're completely out. You're completely, you have no idea what you're, you, it's almost impossible to describe how bad an idea that is. Responsibility. That's what gives life meaning. It's like lift a load. Then you can tolerate yourself, right? Because look at you're useless, easily hurt, easily killed. Why should you have any self-respect? That's the, the story of the fall. Pick something up and carry it. Pick, make it heavy enough so that you can think, yeah, well, useless as I am, at least I could move that from there to there. Well, what's really cool about that is that when I talk to these crowds about this, the men's eyes light up. And that's very, like I've seen that phenomenon because I've been talking about this mythological material for a long time. And I can see when I'm watching crowds, people, you know, their eyebrows lift, their eyes light up because I put something together for them. And that's what mythological stories do. So I'm not taking responsibility for that. That's what the stories do. So I say the story and people go click, click, click. You know, and their eyes light up. But this responsibility thing, that's a whole new order of this, is that young men are so hungry for that, it is unbelievable. And one of the things I've been talking to some of the people who've been um, running for the conservative leadership in Canada, and I've been talking to them about, well, the difficulties they have communicating with young people, because conservatives, what, what the hell are they going to sell to young people, right? Because being conservative is something that happens when you're older. They can sell responsibility. No one's selling it. And the thing is, for men, there's nothing but responsibility. You know, I was watching The Simpsons the other day. I watched the first Simpsons episode, and, and I deconstructed it. And so it's really interesting. So what happens in the first Simpson episode is that it's Christmas and Homer and Marge are going to buy some Christmas presents, but Homer doesn't get his Christmas bonus. And so he's absolutely crushed by that. And that actually is a recurring theme in The Simpsons where Homer loses his job or something like that or can't make enough money. He's completely crushed. Even though he's kind of useless, bumbling, laughing fool of a guy, you know, 
the, the thing that gives that show his soul is that he's still oriented towards his family. That's what makes him honorable, is that foolish as he is, he's decided to adopt responsibility for his family and to try to bear that. And so he's not, he's a holy fool, he's not a complete fool. And it's so interesting watching the story because he suffers dreadfully as a consequence of not being able to fulfill his responsibility. Well that's for men. Women have their sets of responsibilities. They're not the same, right? Because they're complicated, because women of course have to take primary responsibility for, for having infants at least, but then also for caring for them. They're, they're structured differently than men. For biological necessity, even if it's not a psychological issue, and it's also partly a psychological issue. Women know what they have to do. Men have to figure out what they have to do. And if they have nothing worth living for, then they stay Peter Pan. And why the hell not? Because the alternative to valued responsibility is impulsive, low-class pleasure. And you saw that in the Pinocchio story, right? That's Pleasure Island. It's like, well, why lift a load if there's nothing in it for you? That's another thing that we're doing to men that's a very bad idea. And to boys. It's like, you're pathological and oppressive. It's like, fine then, why the hell am I going to play? If that's, the, if that's the situation, if I get no credit for bearing responsibility, you can bloody well be sure I'm not going to bear any. But then, you know, your life is useless and meaningless, and you have, you're, not, you're full of self-contempt and nihilism, and, and that's not good. And so that's why I think, I, that's what I think is going on at a deeper level with regards to men needing this direction. A man has to decide that he's going to do something. He has to decide that. Yeah, well, you know, partly what you're trying to do in the future authoring process is say, okay, well, what's your highest value? Right? It's the star. It's like, okay, what are you aiming for? You can decide, man. But, you know, there's some criteria. It should be good for you. It should be good for you in a way that facilitates your moving forward. Maybe it should be good for you in a way that's also good for the family and the community. It should cover the, the domain of life. I mean, there's constraints on what you should regard as a value. But, you, but within those constraints, you have the choice. You have choice. Well, the thing is, is that people will carry a heavy load if they get to pick the goddamn load. So, and they think, well, I won't carry any load. It's like, okay, fine, but then you're like the sled dog that doesn't have a sled to pull. You're just gonna, you're gonna tear pieces out of your own legs because you're bored. You know, you need, people are pack animals. They need, they need to pull against a weight. And, and that's not true for everyone. It's not true particularly, say, for low conscientious people. I mean, maybe they're open and creative or extroverted and some other things. But for the, for the typical person, they, they, they'll, eat they'll eat themselves up unless they have a load. This is why there's such an opiate epidemic among uh, dispossessed white middle-aged guys who are unemployed in the U.S. It's like they lose their job, they're done. Right? They despise themselves. They develop chronic pain syndromes and depression. And the chronic pain is treated with opiates. It's like, that's what we're doing. So, yeah, that's what it looks like to me. Is you, you have to, and it's so interesting to watch the young men when you talk to them about responsibility. They're so goddamn thrilled about it. It just blows me away. It's like, really? That's what's, that's the counterculture. Grow the hell up and do something useful. Really? I could do that? Oh, I'm so excited by that idea. No one ever mentioned that before. It's like rights, 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 rights. Jesus. It's, it's, it's appalling. It's, it's, and, and I feel that that's deeply felt by the people who are, who are coming out to, to listen to these sorts of things too. They're, they've had enough of that. So, and they better have because it's, it's a non-productive mode of being. Responsibility, man. That's where the meaning in life is. So, How do psychologists define creativity? Well, I think the, the most fundamental element of creativity is it actually conceptualized as a biological trait. So, people have different personalities, and we all know that, although our terminology for describing those personalities is broad and somewhat difficult to categorize, but psychologists have made a lot of progress on that over the last, particularly in the last 40 years, really from a strictly scientific perspective. And we know that people differ in extroversion, and extroverted people are gregarious and enthusiastic and assertive. And so they seem to win their way through the world by utilizing social capital and social networks. Extroverts don't necessarily like you, but they like to be around you. And are creative people 
Extroverts? Uh, no, they're, well, th 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 create, creative people are slightly tilted towards extroversion, but that's not the fundamental dimension. Okay. In introverted people like to spend time alone, and there's plenty of creative introverted people. Um, that another personality dimension is known as neuroticism, somewhat unflatteringly, and it's, it's an index of sensitivity to negative emotion, so that if people, if you know people who are volatile, you know, they're touchy and they, they tend to fly off the handle, or, they're, uh, or they're, they're sad or morose or anxious or tend to avoid stressful situations, then they tend to be higher in trait neuroticism, and that's specifically a negative emotion dimension. Extroversion is an index of positive emotion. And so people, there are separate biological systems, positive and negative emotions. So I'm trying to get us back to creativity. Yep. Well, uh, the, the, third, the third category is agreeableness. Agreeable people are compassionate, and, and they basically live for, for close, intimate, personal relationships. There's conscientious people who are dutiful, and then there are open people. And the open people, it's, the dimension is called openness to experience, they're people who are fundamentally interested in ideas. So if you're talking to an open person, they will immediately move the... The, the conversation to, to the discussion of ideas. So most of the people in the audience tonight, for those who aren't here for political curiosity, are here because they're open people. They want to they hear an intellectual discussion. And, and so open people are interested in ideas. That's the intellect component of openness. And then they're also interested in aesthetics. And that would be where the artists really... Intellect and aesthetics is where the artists come out. And those, the thing that's important to know about that, and it's why I went through all five traits, is that these are fundamentally... These are attributes and ways of looking at the world, ways of behaving that are fundamentally rooted in biology. They're very, very deep. It's not a surface trait by any stretch of the imagination. And uh, creative people also tend to be uh, higher in, in, in trait intelligence, uh, technically speaking. And that's the ability to mani manipulate abstractions rapidly. So is creativity a sort of second level then? Because the, the, uh, the traits that you've just described don't include them. Where are they in that group? Well, creativity, cre creativity loads very highly with openness. It, it's, okay. it, 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 create, creativity and openness are probably synonymous, more or less. Although it isn't obvious that interest in ideas per se is the same as creativity, but the, there's very few people who are artistic who aren't very interested in ideas, so they, they move along the same path very tightly. So let's unpack this notion, because uh, you know, it's axiomatic that creativity and art are uh, indistinguishable. Is that true from the point of view of a psychologist? I would say it's, 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 a, pretty decent, it's a pretty decent truth. It's open people are the ones that are interested in aesthetics. So, you know, there are lots of people who are, in some sense, blind to beauty. It's actually one of the things that distinguishes, strangely enough, it distinguishes conservatives and liberals, r roughly speaking, because liberal, liberal people tend to be high in openness. They tend to be creative, but they're low in trait conscientiousness, so they're not very dutiful. They're not particularly orderly. They're not particularly industrious, not, not compared to conservatives. Liberals. And, yes. And con well, it's partly because, you see, this is one of the paradoxes. Conservatives are high in, con in conscientiousness, especially orderliness, and they're low in openness. And I think the reason for that, in part, is that it's not that easy to be creative if you're too industrious or orderly. Because imagine, imagine you want to be a musician and you're 18, 19 years old, or worse, 25 years old, you know. It's, <laughs> well, the thing is, is that it, it, it's, it's an insane thing to do if, if you're someone who's dutiful and career-oriented and practical, because the probability that you're going to monetize your creativity is so low that it's, it's futile to even attempt it in many situations. And so if you're too concerned with convention and, and productivity, then that's going to undercut your ability to, to, to manifest adherence to your creative vision, which also takes you in all sorts of directions, mm -hmm. none of which are necessarily practical. So one of the ways of thinking about creativity is that it's, it's a gambling strategy, and, and conservatives make low risk, uh, low return, but certain bets, really, and whereas the more liberal types and the more creative types, they make high risk, high, high return bets, and so almost all of them fail. But those who succeed, succeed dramatically, mm -hmm. and they also change the world. And so, although it's very foolish to be creative, it's creative people who, who lead the vanguard for, forward into the unknown and transform the world. So, foolish as it is, it's absolutely necessary. Foolish because risky? Yes, because risky, yes. I mean, it's, risk, it's foolish in the same way that a high-risk, high-return bet is foolish. 
there's a high probability that you'll lose. Mm -hmm. And so if you're a conservative person, you're very concerned about hedging your bets. You don't want to lose. Being creative is a very bad game to play, but you won't play it anyways because you're conservative, so it isn't going to matter. So, <laughs> so you are uh, an open uh, late teen, and you have conservative parents, and you say, Mom, Dad, um, I think I've decided that I'm going to be an artist. Oh, yeah, and they think, um, what's wrong with that kid? That's a, that's a complicated uh, conversation, isn't it? Yes, yes. It's, 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 it's like discussing color with someone who's colorblind. And, and I mean that. I, and it's, it's actually a perverse, things about, perverse thing about conservatives in some sense, because the, the data on the economic utility of artists is really, really strong. I mean, artists, artists and entrepreneurs are the same people. And, of course, entrepreneurs are the people who provide all of the vision for the entire capitalist system. They're absolutely necessary. But conservatives tend to be so blind to art that they can't even see that the artists are the people who drive the, who drive the economy forward. But you make so, them sound so bad. No, there you look. I mean, so here's, here's another way of thinking about it. Is liberals, are we talking about political conservatives hmm. and political liberals? Yes, um, we're also talking about trait, like personality traits determine voting patterns to a great degree. So people vote their temperaments. And this is something that's really useful to understand when you're engaged in a political discussion, is that the person across the table from you who holds viewpoints other than yours is not doing it because they're stupid or ill-informed. They're doing it because they are not the same sort of person you are. And the, the funny thing about about creative people versus conservative people, say, or liberal people versus conservative people, is that liberals start companies and conservatives run them. <laughs> so, and I, I so you do seriously need, mean I'm that. I'm glad you to know you need other. conservatives. Yeah. I was getting yeah, well, a little they, bit worried. They, they're managers. Like, conscientious people make good managers and mm -hmm. good administrators. It's a, and they tend to do better in school, too, because diligence and dutifulness is an excellent predictor of academic performance. So if you want something, if you want something that's already been invented, implemented, and then turned into a machine, you don't get someone creative to do that. They're off to do the next thing. They're not even interested in that. You'll bore them to death. So Wow. Uh, so let's say you're an employer, and you need uh, some creative people. Yep. Is there a, a psychometric test uh, to find out if someone's actually creative and they're going to be useful? Well, IQ tests work. I mean, not, not everyone with a high IQ is creative. Lots of lawyers have high IQs, and they tend not to be creative at all. Uh, well, you think, think about why that is, eh? Because lawyers are bound by precedent and, and rules, and so that isn't the same as being creative. And you don't, you want a creative accountant? No, not really. <laughs> not, not unless you're looking for a jail sentence. So, they don't like that word at all. No, no, yeah, that's right. My creative accountant, you know, wink, wink. <laughs> right, so, 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 I mean, I tested, I tested psychometrically, tested the 100 most creative lawyers in Canada as, as a project about 15 years ago with a magazine called Lexpert, which was a high prestige magazine among lawyers. And we had lawyers from across the country be nominated for their, by their firms for creativity. And, and so we got some really, like these were outstanding lawyers. So, and we tested them psychometrically, very, very high in intelligence, but um, very, not creative at all. The first, the first trait was conscientious dutiful, hardworking, uh, diligent, industrious, orderly. Because, you know, you're working 70 hours a week, and you better bloody well work if you're in a position like that, too. Mm -hmm. So it's nose to the grindstone stuff. Very low in neuroticism, because it's very stressful. So they didn't experience much negative emotion. Very disagreeable people. Well, they're litig litigators, eh? And so they, they want to win. They're oh. not compassionate, and they're not polite. And only after that were they open. So they weren't creative at all. But they were extraordinarily intelligent. So. Um, do employers look for creative people? No. No. <laughs> Not generally. Well, it's a, real, it's a real conundrum. So one of the things that's happening right now is that in most businesses, the non-creative people are increasingly being replaced by machines, right? Because anything that's creative can't really be turned into an algorithm that you can run as a machine. Mm -hmm. But anything that isn't creative can be. And so there's increasing demand in, uh, in corporations for creative people. But the problem with being creative is that you're useless at the bottom of a dominance hierarchy. Because at the bottom of a dominance hierarchy, so a power hierarchy, you should do what you're told to do. You're not there to think outside the box. You're there to learn what you're supposed to do and implement it. And creative people are like, that's, that isn't what they do. Now, what happens, though, to companies is that because they filter all the creative people out at the bottom, and then people start to rise up to the top, 
you really need creative people at the top because they are the entrepreneurial types and they're the ones, for example, in law firms, even though lawyers aren't very creative, the more entrepreneurial ones are the ones that bring in all the business. There's like great lawyers who can, who can implement, who can, who, can, who can write well and communicate well, are, they're not a dime a dozen, but they're relatively common, but the ones who are entrepreneurial, who can go out there and drum up new business, man, those people are super, hyper valuable and they're very rare, but, they all, but it's also very difficult to nurse them within any system, because systems do not nurture creativity. They're the antithesis of creativity, because the artist is always the person who stands outside the structure, and so, or maybe builds his or her own structure, you know, which is also why it's hard to evaluate creative people. You can't, really, because if they're operating within the confines of a system that has an evaluative structure, they're not creative. Mm. We're having a conversation. I'm deciding I'm going to listen to you, right? That's different than peop how people generally communicate, because usually when they communicate, they're doing something like, okay, we're going to have a conversation, and I'm going to tell you why I'm right, and I'll win if you agree. Or maybe you're having a conversation where, I don't know what you're trying to do, maybe you're trying to impress the person you're talking to, so you're not listening to them at all, you're just thinking about what you're going to say next. Okay, so that's not this. This is, you might have something to tell me, and so I'm going to listen on the off chance that you'll tell me something that would really be useful for me to know. And so, you could think about it as an, as an extension of the Piagetian... You know, Piaget talked about the fundamental... the fundamentally important element of knowledge being to describe how knowledge is sought, the process by which knowledge is generated. Well, if you agree with me and I find that out, I know nothing more than I knew before. I just know what I knew before. And maybe I'm happy about that because, you know, it didn't get challenged. But I'm no smarter than I was before. But maybe you're different than me, and so while I'm listening to you, you'll tell me something I, wouldn't, I don't like. Maybe it's something I find contemptible or difficult, whatever. Maybe you'll, find, you'll tell me something I don't know, and then I won't be quite as stupid. And then maybe I won't run painfully into quite as many things. And that's a really useful thing to know, especially if you live with someone and you're trying to make long-term peace with them, is they're not the same as you. And their way they look at the world and the facts that they pull out of the world aren't the same as your facts. And even though you're going to be overwhelmed with the proclivity to demonstrate that you're right, it is the case that two brains are better than one. And so maybe nine of the ten things they tell you are dispensable, or maybe even 49 out of 50, but one thing all you need to get out of the damn conversation is one thing you don't know. And one of the things that's very cool about a good psychotherapeutic session is that the whole conversation is like that. All you're doing is trying to express the truth of the situation as clearly as possible. That's it. And so, now, Roger's proposition, and I'll tell you why he derived it, was that if you have a conversation like that with someone, it will make both of you better. It'll make both of you psychologically healthier. So there's an implicit presupposition that the exchange of truth is curative. Well, that's a very cool idea. I mean, it's a very deep idea. Uh, I think it's the most profound idea. It's the, it's the idea upon, Western civil, upon which Western civilization, although not only Western civilization, is actually predicated. The idea that truth produces health. But for Rogers, that was the entire purpose of the Psychotherapeutic Alliance. You come to see me because you want to be better. You don't even know what that means necessarily, neither do I. We're going to figure that out together. But you come and you say, look, things are not acceptable to me, and maybe there's something I could do about that. So that's the minimal precondition to engage in therapy. Something's wrong, you're willing to talk about it truthfully, and you want it to be better. Without that, the therapeutic relationship does not get off the ground. And so then you might ask, well, what relationships are therapeutic? And the answer to that would be, if you have a real relationship, it's therapeutic. If it isn't, what you have is not a relationship. God only knows what you have. You're a slave, they're a tyrant, you know, you're both butting heads with one another. It's a primate dominance hierarchy dispute. Oh, I don't know, you're like two cats in a barrel or two people with their hands around each other's throats. But you, what you have is not a relationship. So, all right. 
We may say that the greater the communicated congruence of experience, awareness, and behavior on the part of one individual, that's, that's a reference to the same idea that I was describing with regards to Jung. So let's say you come and talk to me and you want things to go well. Well, I'm going to have to more or less be one thing because if I'm all over the place, you can't trust any continuity in what I say. There's no, and you, there's no reason for you to believe that I'm capable of actually telling you I'm capable of expressing anything that's true. So the truth is something that emerges as a consequence of getting yourself lined up and beating all the, what would you call, all the impurities out of your, out of your, out of your soul, for lack of a better word. You have to be integrated for that to happen. And you do that at least in part by wanting to tell the truth. The more the ensuing relationship will involve a tendency towards reciprocal communication with the same qualities. So one of the things, I've been quite influenced by Rogers. One of the things I try to do in my therapeutic sessions is first of all to listen, to really listen. And then well, while I listen, I watch. And while I'm listening, things will happen in my head. You know, maybe I'll get a little image of something or I'll get a thought or a question will emerge and then I'll just tell the person what that is. But it's sort of directionless, you know, it's not like I have a goal except that we're trying to make things better. I'm on the side of the person, I'm on the side of the part of the person that wants things to be better, not worse. And so then we, those parts of us have a dialogue and the consequence of that dialogue is that certain things take place and then I'll just tell the person what happened. And it isn't that I'm right, that's not the point, the point is, is that they get to have an hour where someone actually tells them what they think. Here's the impact you're having on me. You know, this is making me angry. This is making me happy. This is really interesting. This reminds me of something that you said an hour ago that I don't quite understand. And the whole, the whole point is not for either person to make the proposition or convince the other that their position is correct, but merely to have an exchange of experience about how things are set up. And it's extraordinarily useful for people because it's often difficult for anyone to find anyone to talk to that will actually listen. And so another thing that's really strange about this listening is that if you listen to people, they will tell you the weirdest bloody things so fast you just cannot believe it. So if you're having a conversation with someone and it's dull, it's because you're stupid. That's why. You're not listening to them properly because they're weird. They're like wombats or albatrosses or rhinoceroses or something like they're strange creatures and so if you were actually communicating with them and they were telling you how weird they really are it would be it would be anything but boring so and you can ask questions that's a really good way of listening but you know one of roger's points is well you have to be oriented properly in order to listen and the orientation has to be look what i want out of this conversation is that the place we both end up is better than the place we left that's it that's what I'm after. And if you're not after that, you've got to think, why the hell wouldn't you be after that? What could you possibly be after that would be better than that? You walk away smarter and more well-equipped for the world than you were before you had the conversation, and so does the other person. Well, maybe if you're bitter and resentful and angry and anxious and, you know, generally annoyed at the world, then that isn't what you want. You want the other person to walk away worse than you too, because you're full of revenge. But, you know, you'll get what you want if you do that. So, we know from our research that such empathic understanding, it's already defined that. I want to hear you, I want to hear what you have to say so we can clarify it and move forward. I want to have your best interests in mind, and mine as well, but, you know, both at the same time. And your families too, if we can manage that. Uh, we're after making things better. We know from our research that such empathic understanding, understanding with a person, not about him, is such an effective approach that it can bring about major changes in personality. Some of you may be feeling that you listen well to people and that you have never seen such results. The chances are very great that you have not been listening in the manner that I've described. Fortunately, I can suggest a little experiment that you can do to test the quality of your understanding. The next time you get into an argument, with your wife or your friend or a small group of friends, stop the discussion for a moment and for an experiment institute this rule. Each person can speak up for himself only after he has first restated the ideas and feelings of the previous speaker accurately. And what accurately means is they have to agree with your restatement. Now that's an annoying thing to do because if someone is talking to you 
and you disagree with them, the first thing you want to do is take their argument, make the stupidest possible thing out of it that you can, that's the straw man, and then demolish it. It's like, so then you can walk away feeling good about it, and you know, you primate domins, dominated them really nicely. So, but that isn't what you do. You say, okay, well, I'm going to take what you told me, and maybe I'm even going to make your argument stronger than the one you made. That's useful if you're dealing with someone that you have to live with, because maybe they can't bloody well express themselves very well, but they have something to say. So you make their argument strong. All right, then, you see what this would mean. It would mean that be before presenting your own point of view, it would be necessary for you to really achieve the other speaker's frame of reference to understand his thoughts and feelings so well that you could summarize them for him. Sounds simple, doesn't it? But if you will try it, you'll find that it's the most difficult thing that you've ever done. Okay, good. We'll leave it at that, and then we'll see you on Tuesday. What's my advice to young men seeking a woman for marriage and family? Yeah. Well, okay, fine. That's the same question. Quest, second question. That's that's pretty straightforward, man. I mean, you can't eliminate the necessity of being attracted to one another. That's important, and that's mysterious, you know. Um, so, for example, here's a funny thing. If you, one of the things we know that attracts people to one another is bilateral symmetry. And so, if you take men and you rank them by the symmetry of their faces, and then you give the asymmetrical men t-shirts to wear, clean t-shirts for a day, and the symmetrical men clean t-shirts to wear for a day, and then you give the t-shirts to women and you have them rate the, the odor, the women rate the odor of the symmetrical men as more attractive than the odor of the asymmetrical men. And then, and there are other uh, factors that determine sexual attractiveness that are based on biological factors that are so that deeply embedded in terms of smell, for example. So. Uh, women also tend to uh, not be sexually attracted to the to the scent of men who's who have, if I remember correctly, it's RH factors that would make for potential trouble in childbirth. And the often the reason that the women give for not preferring the scent of those men is that they smell too much like their brother, something like that. So there's weird, mysterious things that determine whether or not people are sexually and physically attracted to each other. And I think it's very important that that's part of a marital relationship. The next most important thing is trust, man. It's like there, there's no marriage that's successful without trust. You guys, you've got to tell each other the truth. And one of the reasons that Jung believed that marriage as a, and an oath and a Carl Jung as a bond was necessary, it's really wise, it's like... You know, telling the truth to someone is no simple thing because there's a bunch of things about all of us that are terrible and weak and reprehensible and shameful and all of those things. And they kind of have to be brought out into the open and dealt with. And you're not going to tell the truth about yourself to someone who can run away screaming when you reveal who you are. And so the, the marriage bond is something like, okay, here's the deal. I'm going to handcuff myself to you and you're going to handcuff yourself to me. And then we're going to tell each other the truth. And neither of us are going to get to run away. And so our, once we know the truth, then we're either going to live together in mutual torment or we're going to try to deal with that truth and straighten ourselves out and straighten ourselves out jointly. And that's going to make our, us more powerful and more resilient and more and deeper and wiser as we progress together through life. And, and I think that's absolutely brilliant because if you leave the back door open, man, you're going to use it. That's for sure. And the oath is there. And this was Jung's commentary on the spiritualization of, of the human pair bond by Christian marriage, for example, which, which emphasized uh, the, the, what would you call it, the subordination of both members of the marital union to a higher order uh, personality that was embodied in the figure of the Logos. So the idea is that in, a, in, a, in the Christian marriage, for example, the man isn't the boss and the woman isn't the boss. The boss is the mutual personality composed by the seeking of truth in both of them. And that's conceptualized as their, their joint subjugation to the logos. And that is absolutely dead on, man. It's like the ruler of your marital life should be your vow to tell each other the truth. Because... Like in hard times during your life when you've done something stupid and idiotic that might take you down 
and you don't have anybody that you can turn to. You know, if you have a partner that you can trust, you can go say, hey, you know, I made a big financial mistake, man, and it's really torturing me, and I feel like a complete idiot, and it's really dangerous. And the person there is going to help you figure out what to do about it, and they're going to know that when they make a stupid mistake, and they're bloody well going to, that they can come and talk to you, and that you guys are going to work your way through it. And that's a big deal. And there's a couple of things our culture gets really wrong, and one is it devalues marriage. That's really a very bad idea because marriage is, marriage is like a third of your life and maybe more. And kids are a third of your life. And your, your, your life outside of marriage and kids is a third of your life, you know, approximately speaking. And to miss any of that is a massive, massive mistake. Now, having said that, I will also say that for some people, missing one or more of those is necessary because they have a reason. You know, maybe they're brilliantly creative artists and they need to devote themselves entirely to their career or they're outstanding in some way. And so they need they can justify the sacrifice of one part of that try out of being to another part. But for but generally speaking, it's a very dangerous thing and, and it, it, it shouldn't be done. And also kids get an absolutely terrible rap, you know, because kids are delightful if they're well behaved. One of the chapters in my new book is called Don't Let Your Children Do Anything That Makes You Dislike Them. And you can do that, especially if you discuss it thoroughly with your spouse, your, the person that's helping you discipline the kids. And children are the best company because they're really enthusiastic about everything. They love doing new things. They really love you, so they're happy that you're around. Um, all you have to do is make sure they're not too hot and they're not too cold and they've had something to eat and they're not too tired and you don't expect them to stay engaged in something for longer than they can manage because we used to take our kids when they were little out to restaurants for example and they could sit there no problem and behave really nicely when they were two and three but they couldn't do it for more than about 45 minutes you can't push your luck but I also noticed with little kids is that they got antsy and unreasonable about five to ten minutes before the adults did too it's just the adults were too stupid to notice the kids would notice right away so um so back to marriage. Well, you look for someone that you're attracted to, that you love, and then you look for someone that you can bloody well trust. And then you tell them the truth. And, and that way maybe you can get through life and you can have someone to weave the rope of your being with and together to make, to make your joint rope stronger. And you can have some continuity in your narrative and you can have children and then you can have grandchildren. And like you can have a life, man, and there's nothing... You're so fortunate if you can manage that. And so, okay, so there's that one. So what's my advice to young men seeking a woman for marriage and family? Yeah, well, and also, you know, marry someone you think would be a good mother and that has enough sense, generally speaking, to know that she wants children. Now, some women don't want children, and fair enough. And some women perhaps shouldn't have children. That's also possible. But the general rule of thumb is especially once a woman's, you know, in her mid-twenties, if she doesn't know that she wants children or won't admit it, unless she has a viciously important reason, then she's not oriented properly psychologically. She, she, she isn't, she doesn't know what's important in life. Now, that might also be the case with you, and it probably is, but as a rule of thumb, that's a really good one. How do men and women differ in the way they evaluate mates? Well, here's a study. More than a thousand respondents, primarily female. What they looked at was how much each person, how much prestige each person had in their occupation, so kind of where they were situated in the dominance hierarchy, what their income was in their education. So they're all markers, they're all pretty decent markers of socioeconomic status, or they're pretty decent markers of status. So, and then they looked at how many partners each person had. Number of lifetime partners and number of preceding year sexual partners. Um, lifetime occurrence of simultaneous partners, so that was someone who was in a, relation, a sexual relationship with more than one person at the same time. And lifetime frequency of simultaneous partners, from one very seldom or never to five very often. Here's their assumption. The number of partners a member of sex A acquires is an index of how often this individual is chosen by the other sex. It's just a definition. It's an indication of reproductive fitness as judged by members of the opposite sex. Results. Male criteria. 
For women, the correlation between their fertility rates and the number of partners in the previous year was 0.94. So that's basically markers of biological youth. And also markers of biological health, like symmetry. Or waist to hip ratio, which actually tends to be correlated with reproductive um, fitness, because women with lower waist to hip ratios are generally healthier. Because especially in youth, the acquisition of abdominal fat is often an indicator of subpar physical health. The correlation between the fertility rate and the number of partners in the previous year is 0.94. That's all of it. Right? You never see a correlation of 0.94 anywhere, ever. Males choose fertility, indicators, beauty, waist to hip ratio, youthful appearance, neonotinous facial features. And neonotinous means like an infant. So one of, the, one of the markers of feminine beauty is a face that has small, childlike features. Female criteria. All respondents. The correlation between socioeconomic status and frequency of simultaneous partners. For men, it's 0.5. So the higher the status of the men, man, the more likely he has simultaneous sexual partners. So it means he's going out with someone sexually at the same time. For men, it's 0.49. For women, it's zero. Age 30 and over. Correlation between socioeconomic status and frequency of simultaneous partners. For men, it's 0.8. For women, it's zero. Age 30 to 39, the correlation between socioeconomic status for women and frequency of simultaneous partners for men, it's 0.92. That's a very small n, though. For women, it's 0.11. Female criteria for men. It might reflect the tendency on the part of females to choose high-status partners during their own peak reproductive years. This might account especially for the strong relationship found in men between the age of 30 and 39. Women, who typically prefer men three to eight years older than they are, would then be in their mid to late 20s, a time when fecundability and thus sensitivity to male resources is at its peak. Supporting evidence. I don't believe that, by the way. I don't think that women pick men for their socioeconomic status. I think that women pick men for their ability to climb the status hierarchy. Because we forced women in an experiment that we never published to choose between those two things. Wealth versus ability. The women overwhelmingly chose ability. They just used wealth as a marker of ability. Yep. Uh, why didn't you publish that? It was an honors thesis. And often honors thesis, even if they're publishable, drift into the thing I'll do next month, and then they stay there forever. So, because it's a hard, it's actually quite hard to turn an honors thesis into a publishable paper. And if there isn't some single person driving that forward, it's, it's not going to happen. So that, that was the only reason. Okay, so Trivers, parental investment model contends that women are more likely than men to seek a mate who possesses non-physical characteristics that maximize the survival or reproductive prospects of their offspring and were examined in a meta-analysis of mate selection research. As pre predicted, women accorded more weight than men to socioeconomic status, amb ambitiousness, character, and intelligence, and the larger differences, largest gender differences were observed for cues to resource acquisition, status and ambitiousness. Also, as predicted, gender preferences were not found in preferences for characteristics unrelated to progeny survival, like sense of humor and general personality. Where valid comparisons could be made, the findings were generally invariant across generations, cultures, and research paradigms. I'll go to this next one. Yeah. Okay. So here's some correlations. One of them is between how much money you make and your personality. So the correlation between neuroticism and how much money you get paid is negative 0.3. The higher you are in neuroticism, the less you, make, less you get paid. Why? Why do you think that is? Well, because you're not confident in your own abilities. You have low self-esteem. And if you're not confident in your own abilities and you're anxious about your performance, the probability that you're going to feel confident and calm about negotiating for more money or even asking for a raise is quite low. Extroversion and money made. Virtually no correlation. Openness, no correlation. Agreeableness, 
negative 0.24. Now, you might not think that those correlations are very large, but if the correlation between neuroticism and money made is negative 0.3, if you translate that into an effect size, this is called a binomial effect size distribution, just the effect of neuroticism will ensure that 65% of men make more money than average and 35% of women make more money than average. Just the effect of neuroticism. And if you add neuroticism and agreeableness together, I have to do the math because I have to square, I have to take the square root. It's 0 0.5, 0 0.5. I can't do that in front of a class, unfortunately. It's going to push it up to about 70, 30 or higher than that. There's a little bit of a negative correlation between conscious, conscientiousness and, and money made. Ascendancy, how well you progress up the ranks. Yes? I don't know, because I, I, I didn't look in detail into the models they use, so I was just going to stick to the zero order correlations. So, ascendancy, negative 0.21 for neuroticism, negative 0.14 for agreeableness. The effects are larger if you total them. Let's see. Here's a good one. This is something to think about. Job satisfaction. The correlation with neuroticism is negative 0.42. That's a big one. One of the things that's very interesting about neuroticism is it's also a very good predictor of marital satisfaction. And it's interesting in that light to note that 70% of divorces are initiated by women. Now, one reason for that is that men are impossible to get along with and the other possibility is that women are too sensitive to that and there's no way of sorting that out but it's nonetheless interesting to note that that's still where the gender difference lies neuroticism correlation with job satisfaction negative 0.42 correlation with life satisfaction negative 0.42 correlation with career satisfaction negative 0.41 so one of the things you want to remember is that Almost all the measures that purport to measure something like well-being or happiness or satisfaction are so contaminated with neuroticism that it's not even clear that they're measuring something different. You see, agreeableness, the correlation with career satisfaction is negative 0.2. If you get men to rate their performance, and you get their bosses to rate their performance, Men rate their performance pretty much the same as the bosses rate their performance, or maybe they rate them a little bit more. But if women rate their own performance, they rate their own performance as worse than their bosses' rating of their performance consistently. And the predictor of that seems to be negative emotionality. Now, you might wonder if negative emotionality is something that's associated with lower levels of life satisfaction across a broad variety of measures what possible use could it be? but then you have to wonder well, exactly how is the physical environment different for women and for men? and one clearer fact is that at an individual level at least in relationship to dominance battles with men women are at a disadvantage not least because of their size Here's another, here's another something worth considering, and I don't know how important it is, but it might be really important. It depends on how important. This is something that Carl Jung said, so it depends on how important Jung is. Now, Freud established the field of psychoanalysis, and, and with it, investigation, I would say, rigorous investigation into the contents of the unconscious. Now, modern psychologists and psychiatrists like to what would you say? Denigrate Freud. But, uh, and I think there's a reason for that. I think that Freud's fundamental insights were so profound and so valuable that they got immediately absorbed into our culture. And now they seem self-evident. And so that all that's left of Freud is his errors. You know, because we, we believe everything else. We believe all the profound things he discovered. We just take them for granted. And so we don't believe the things that he said that weren't quite on the money. And that's all we credit with him with now. But he was certainly the first person who brought up the idea of the unconscious in a, in a rigorous manner. And he was the first person to do a rigorous examination of dreams, 
because the interpretation of dreams is a great book it's well worth reading and he was the first person to note that people were in some sense inhabited by sub personalities that had a certain degree of autonomy and 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 independent life brilliant observation the cognitive psychologists haven't caught up with that at all yet um, Jung was profoundly affected by Freud. Jung was profoundly affected by Nietzsche and by Freud. Those were his two main intellectual influences. I don't think one more than the other. Um, he split with Freud on the religious issue. That was what caused the disruption in their relationship. And I think it's an extremely interesting historical occurrence. It, it might be of profound significance. Freud believed that the fundamental myth of the human being was the Oedipal myth. And the Oedipal myth, from a broader perspective, is a failed hero story. So the Oedipal myth is the myth of a man who develops, who grows up, but then accidentally becomes too close to his mother, sleeps with her. He doesn't know who she is, and as a consequence, blinds himself. And there's a, there's a, there's a warning about human development gone wrong in that story. And I think that Freud put his finger on it extraordinarily well because human beings have a very long period of dependency. And one of the things that you do see in clinical practice is that many people's problems are associated with their inability to break free of their family. Like they're consumed by the family drama, right? They can't get beyond what happened to them in their family. They're stuck in the past. It's, and that's... That's equivalent, symbolically speaking, you might say, to the idea of being too close to your mother, of, of, of the boundaries being improperly specified, and that happens far more often than anyone would like to think. Um, I mean, as I said, Freud thought it was a universal. But Jung, see, he, he had a different idea, and his idea was that it wasn't the failed hero story that was the universal human myth, it was the successful hero story. And that's a big difference. Like, it's seriously a big difference. Because the successful hero story is, remember in Sleeping Beauty, you may remember this in, in the Disney movie, the evil queen traps the prince in a dungeon, and she's not going to let him out till he's old, right? And so there's this comical scene where she's down in the dungeon, he's all in chains, and she's laughing at him, telling him what his future is going to be like. She's quite evil. And... You know, she, she paints this wonderful picture of him being freed in like 80 years and hobbling out of the castle on his, his horse that's so old he can barely stand up and him with gray hair. And, and you know, she, and she recites this story of his eventual triumphant departure from the castle as an old and decrepit man and she has a great laugh about it. And it's nice, you know, it's a real punchy story. It's really something wonderful for children, that story. <laughs> and... Uh, um, he gets free of the, of the shackles. And the things that free him are three little female fairies. So it's the positive aspect of the feminine that frees him from the dungeon. It's ve so it's very interesting and very accurate from a psychological perspective. It's the negative element of the feminine that encapsulates him in the dungeon. And it's the positive element of the feminine that frees him. And, and then he, he has a... The queen, the evil queen, is not very happy when he escapes. You may remember this. She stands on top of her castle tower and starts to spin off cosmic sparks. I mean, she's quite the creature, enveloped in flame, and then she turns into a dragon. And she, then the prince has to fight with her in order to make contact with Sleeping Beauty and, and awaken her from her comatose existence as her unconscious existence. And uh, well, it's a brilliant, it's a brilliant, representation of a successful hero myth, he, he doesn't end up staying in an unholy relationship with his mother, let's say. He escapes and then conquers the worst thing that can be imagined and is ennobled by that and that as a consequence he's able to wake the slumbering feminine from its coma. And that's a Jungian story. And that's the story that he juxtaposed against Freud. See, Freud thought of religious phenomena as part of an occult tide that would, be, that would drown rational, rationality. That's why Freud was so vehemently anti-religious. And Jung thought, no, it's not the case. You're throwing the baby out with the bathwater. 
there's something profound and central to the hero myth. And Jungian clinical work is essentially the awakening of the hero myth in the in the in Elizand, in the in the client or in the patient, to conceptualize yourself as that which can confront chaos and triumph, and that that's associated with an ennobling of the of consciousness and the establishment of po- proper positive relationships between male and female. And you know, I'm a skeptical person. I'm a very very skeptical person, and I've tried with every trick I have to put a lever underneath Jung's story and lift it up and, and disrupt it, and I, I can't do it. I think he was right and that Freud was wrong. I mean, I have great respect for Freud. I think he got the problem, problem diagnosed very, very nicely. And in my clinical work, I see the phenomena that Freud described emerge continually, constantly. The, the best, if you're interested in that, there's a documentary you should watch. I may have mentioned it before. I think it's the best documentary ever made. It's certainly the best one I've ever seen. It's called Crumb. And it's about an underground cartoonist, Robert Crumb, who, who was part of the hippie movement, in, although he hated hippies. He was part of the hippie movement in, in the 60s in San Francisco and started the entire underground comic what culture that, that manifested itself eventually in, in graphic novels. He was quite a significant figure from the perspective of popular art, and a very, very intelligent man, and also, I would say, a hero, although a very bent and depraved and warped one, Uh, someone very acutely aware of his own shadow. And the documentary outlines his attempts to escape from his absolutely dreadful mother, and the failure of his two brothers to do the same thing one of whom ended up as a street beggar in San Francisco, and the other who drank furniture polish and died six months after the documentary was produced. It's an unbelievably shocking documentary. It's the only piece of film that I've ever seen that captures Freudian pathology. I've never seen anything, because you can't see it generally unless you're in a clinical situation, unless you know the details of someone's lives, the personal, intimate details. You cannot communicate it. But... The documentarist who made the film, who was Robert Zwigoff, if I remember correctly, was a friend of the Crumbs. And so he got access in a way that no one else would have. And they were also very forthright and forthcoming about their situation in general. I would highly recommend that. It's, it's a real punch. If you want to know how a rapist thinks, like if you actually want to know, because maybe you don't want to know. In fact, you probably don't want to know. <laughs> right, because do you really want to know that? Because to understand that means to put yourself in that position and to understand it. If you really want to know how a serial sexual predator thinks and why, if you watch Crumb and you pay attention, you'll know. And that's only a tiny bit of what the film has to offer. It's really quite remarkable. Anyways, Jung split with Freud on the issue of the Oedipal story as the fundamental myth of humankind and on the issue of the validity of the religious viewpoint. And Jung came down heavily on the side of the validity of the religious viewpoint. And he established that in a book called Symbols of Transformation, which was written in 1914. And that's the book that broke, that produced the permanent split with Freud. And that book, I would say that book's actually been written three times. It was written as symbols of, four times, written as symbols of transformation, which Jung extensively revised when he was old. And then it was rewritten, in a a sense, by a student of Jung's called Eric Neumann, who's also someone I would really recommend. Eric Neumann, I think, is Jung's greatest student. And he wrote two books. He wrote one called The Origins and History of Consciousness, which is a description of the development of consciousness out of unconsciousness, using the hero myth as a, as an in, as a as a as a what would you say as a as an interpretive skeleton? So Newman viewed the hero myth as the dramatized story of the emergence of human consciousness out of the surrounding unconsciousness in which it was embedded. The struggle for consciousness, the struggle of consciousness upward towards the light, like a lotus flower struggles up through the muck and the and the water to to lay itself on the surface of the water and and bloom and reveal the Buddha, which was of course, what the lotus flower does from a symbolic perspective. For, for, for Neumann, 
The hero's story was the story of the, develop the successful development of consciousness And the origins of consciousness The origins and history of consciousness is a great book Interestingly, Camille Paglia wrote, read The Origins and History of Consciousness She's one of the few mainstream intellectuals that I've ever encountered who read that and commented on it and she believed that it would be sufficient antidote to postmodern denigration of literature she thought it was that powerful a, a work and I, I believe that, I, I think it's a remarkable book Carl Jung wrote the foreword to that book and he said in the foreword that it was the book that he wished he would have written so it's sort of like Jung, he wrote, I don't remember how many volumes dozens of very thick, difficult volumes it was like Neumann was able to what? distill those into a single volume statement and so I would also say if you're interested in Jung the best book to read is The Origins and History of Consciousness it's the best intro into, into the Jungian world so Jung's very difficult to very difficult to understand it requires a real shift of perspective in order to understand what he's talking about and Neumann wrote another book called The Great Mother which is a little bit more specialized in some sense but it's also extremely interesting because it fleshes out the, the archetype of chaos and its representation as feminine it's a brilliant book as well and highly worth, highly worth reading both those books anyways Jung was a very strange person and a visionary and, and so he, that's kept him outside of the academic realm almost entirely I mean I was constantly warned as an undergraduate and then a graduate student and then a professor against ever talking about Jung in any way whatsoever when I went on the job market when I was at McGill when I had graduated from McGill I had done my scientific research in, on alcoholism and I had a fairly lengthy publication record that was pure empirical research and, and really neurophysiological research um, into the pharmacology of alcoholism and I had established a reasonably solid dossier of publications but at the same time I was writing this book that became Maps of Meaning and so I'd split my time in graduate student school between these two endeavors one very specifically neurological and pharmacological and really biologically based and the other very abstract, religious, symbolic, psychoanalytic the complete opposite but I could see that the two things overlapped really nicely and there was a number of scientists at the time that were also drawing the same conclusions, the same relationship between the biology and the psychoanalysis Jak Panksepp, who wrote a book called Affective Neuroscience, which is a great classic is, is one of those people who, who saw the relationship between the neurobiology of emotion and motivation and the psychoanalytic insights um, never became a mainstream view, but I think it's too complex I think that the, bridging the gap between the biology and the, and the symbolic is too much for people, generally speaking you know, it was certainly virtually too much for me because I got quite ill when I was a graduate student I think, for a variety of reasons I also, like, would go out and party three nights a week and so that probably had something to do with it, but <laughs> but working on those two things simultaneously was also rather exhausting now, Jung was a tremendously insightful clinician and he was a strange person, introverted visionary high in introversion, very, 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 very high in openness like off the charts and also, God only knows what his IQ was I mean, every time I read Jung, it's like reading Nietzsche it's terrifying because, you know, he's, he's so damn smart that he can think up answers to questions that you don't even it's not like you don't understand the answers it's that you never conceptualize the damn questions it's really something to read someone like that, right? Who, says, well, here's a mystery, and you think, wow, I never thought of that as a mystery, and here's the solution. It's like, okay, that's, that's, <laughs> that's something. You know, and he could read Greek, and he could read, he read all the ancient, he read a very large variety of ancient languages, and was very familiar with the entire corpus of, of uh, astrological thought, and of alchemical thought, and of classic literature, and biblical stories, and I mean, educated in a way that no one is educated now and so he's a very daunting person to encounter and terrifying, absolutely terrifying his book, Ion, which is the second volume of, 
of, it's the second volume of volume nine, which is the archetypes of the collective unconscious. That damn book is just absolutely terrifying because Jung, he's one of these visionaries who can see way underneath the social structures and look at patterns that are developing across, for, in Jung's case, across thousands of years and lays them out. And so that's, a really, that's really something to, to encounter. Ion is a terrifying book. Um, anyways, one question might be, well, because I read Jung and I think, how the hell did he know these things? How could he figure these things out? I can't understand how he could possibly know these things. Well, here's a partial answer. Jung was a visionary, and so what that means, as far as I can tell, and I, we could do a little quick survey here. How many of you think you think in words? You can put up your hands. Do you think in words? Okay, so it looks like what about pictures? How many of you think in pictures? Okay, so that's interesting. How many of you think, that's about half and half, by the way. Probably a few are on the word side. How many of you think in pictures and words? Okay, and, and so, all right. So it was roughly a third in each category. But that's also something that I really haven't encountered any research on from the neuropsychological perspective. It's like, well, do you think in pictures or do you think in words? And, and is, is that actually a reliable distinction? I think I think in words most of the time. But I can think in pictures. Like if I'm trying to build something, I can think in pictures very almost instantaneously. But it isn't my natural mode of thinking. I'm hyperverbal, and so my natural mode of thinking is to think everything through in words. But I know my wife isn't like that. She thinks in images and then has to translate them into words. And so, anyways, Jung was very literate, and he could really think in words, but he could really think in images. Also, talking to my wife quite extensively, like her, the intensity of her visualization vastly exceeds mine. So, for example, if I close my eyes and I try to imagine the crowd in front of me, it's pretty low resolution and vague and, and not brilliantly colored and, and vivid. You know, it, it's, it's, it's like I'm seeing through a glass darkly, let's say. I can't bring images to mind with, that, with spectacular clarity, but my wife is very good at that, and Jung seemed to be absolutely a genius at that kind of thinking. And he had a lot of visionaries in his family history as well. So I don't know to what degree there's a hereditary component of that. And I don't know to what degree that's actually like a neurological specialization. I, I presume it would be associated with the trait openness dis distinguishes itself, differentiates itself into interest in ideas and interest in aesthetics. And my suspicion are, is that the people who are more interested in aesthetics are the visionary types, the ones that think in images. Anyways, Jung could really think in images. And he could imagine beings. And I had a client once who was a lucid dreamer. And how many of you have had a lucid dream? So you know you're dreaming while, you, while you're, okay, many. That, that phenomena wasn't really even, even identified as a phenomena until the end of the 19th century. There was a book written about it that Freud tried to get his hands on but couldn't because it was a very rare book. And then there was a researcher about 30 years ago who started to study lucid dreams. But anyways, I had a client who was a lucid dreamer, and one of the things she could do was ask her dream characters what information they were trying to convey, and they would tell her. So that was very interesting. And one of the consequences of that was, and I don't have this story completely right in my memory, but it's close enough. She was afraid of a very large number of things, and in her dream, I think it was a gypsy standing by a wagon, told her that if she was going to be successful in university, that she would have to visit a slaughterhouse. And that was something that was way beyond her capacity to tolerate. She was a vegetarian. She couldn't stand the sight of raw meat even. And, so, and she was very oppressed and depressed and anxious because of the slaughterhouse nature of existence. And so her dream focused on that, and one of the consequences of that, because the slaughterhouse was out of the question as a clinical intervention, um, I took her to an embalming, right? Because I asked her, I asked her what, what, what might be equivalent to that, and so she suggested that. And, you know, exposure therapy is a hallmark of clinical psychology, right? One of the things you do with people as a clinician is you find out what they're afraid of, and you gradually and voluntarily expose them to that, and that cures them. And that's associated with the hero myth, right? It's exactly the same thing. It's like, there's a dragon, 
It's stopping you, because there's lots of dragons. Most of them aren't stopping you. You can ignore them. You don't have to just go, you know, slash away at randomly. You're not supposed to be fighting dragons that aren't in your way. But if they are in your way, you can't ignore them, and then you decompose them into sub-dragons, and you have people, you know, take them on. And as they take them on, they dispense with the dragon, and they gain the power of the dragon. It's like a video game. Actually, a video game is like that. That's why people like the video games. Well, that's right, right? There's a reason that you absorb power when you overcome things when you play a video game. It's not like that's intrinsic to the video game structure. That's an archetypal idea. Anyways, we went and saw an embalming, which was a very interesting experience and, and quite, quite useful for her because she knew what she could tolerate after that. And it was a hell of a lot more than she thought she could tolerate. And so that's very useful to know. Back to Jung. He's a visionary thinker. Now, my client, I said, she could lucid dream. And she could ask her dream characters what they wanted and what they were trying to communicate to her. So that was pretty interesting. That happened spontaneously. had nothing to do with me. I mean, I'm interested in dreams, and many of my clients are great dreamers, especially the creative ones, because I think it's a hallmark of creativity to have vivid dreams and to be able to remember them. But that was a faculty that was natural to her. Jung had this other client at one time, at one point, and she had a variety of fears, and she had this dream that she told me, and she was walking down a beach, and on the side of the beach, up a dune, a small dune, there was this old man with a snake, a big python, and there's a crowd around him, and uh, she was walking by the snake handler and the snake and the crowd, and she didn't want to have anything to do with them. He was sort of showing people this snake, and she told me that dream, and I thought, well, you know, you probably need to go see that snake. And so I relaxed her, it's quasi-hypnotic technique, and it's very straightforward. Hyp hypnosis is generally nothing but pronounced relaxation though you have to be susceptible to hypnosis to actually fall into a hypnotic trance as a consequence of being relaxed. I just relaxed her. I had her breathe deeply and pay attention to different parts of her body and just relax her muscles one by one, essentially, so that she could concentrate. And then I told her we'd play with the dream a little bit. It's a Jungian technique. I said, well, so call the dream image to mind, which she could do quite well. I said, okay, so let's, let's explore it. It's like pretend, it's like pretend play. You know, if you're a kid and you're pretend playing, you don't exactly direct the game, right? You, you, you play the game. So it's partly your direction, obviously, because you're the player, but the thing also happens spontaneously of its own accord. And you can think about that as a dialogue between the conscious mind and the unconscious mind, in some sense. It's a developmental dialogue. It's not a fun game if you just direct it. It's only a fun game if you're inviting and something is welling up as a consequence. It's the same thing that happens when you're you're engaged in some kind of artistic or literary production. If it's all top-down, you know, if you're forcing it, then it's propaganda, it's empty. What you want to sort of is put yourself in a receptive state of mind, in an imaginative state of mind, and it's sort of half you and half nature itself manifesting itself in your creative imagination. And that was the sort of state that we were striving for. And she, I asked her when she was in, relaxed. I said, well, what do you think about the snake handler? And she said, well, he's probably a charlatan and he's just there trying to impress the crowd and to show off. And she was afraid to go up there because she thought people would push her towards the snake and she'd have to touch it. And so there was a fear of the crowd issue going on there too. And I said, well, just look, go up there, but do it under these conditions. Is that, you know, if, if people get pushy, what are you going to tell them? And so we, we figured out something. He said, look, you just tell them that, you know, you want to look at the snake at your own pace, and that you don't need any encouragement or help, and it would be good if you were just left alone. So that enabled her to defend herself. So she was afraid that the crowd would push her to do something that she didn't want to do. That was part of the theme of the dream. So anyway, she eventually climbed the dune in her imagination and went into the crowd, and the crowd turned out to be quite welcoming and not hostile and not pushy, which isn't what you'd expect, right? Because the, you'd think the crowd would have reacted in accordance with her fears, since it was her fantasy. But that, that's the thing about fantasies, they have this autonomous quality. But the, the crowd was welcoming and not hostile, and it turned out that the snake handler wasn't a charlatan. He was just an old guy who had this snake, and he was out there just showing it to people because he thought it was a cool thing, and, and 
and that maybe it was good for people to come and look at a snake. And so she got close enough to the snake to touch it. And so, so I'm telling you that because I want you to understand a bit more about what Jung was trying to do. And so he wrote these books, notebooks that haven't been published yet, called the Black Books. And the Black Books are the documentation of his experiments with his imagination. And what he would do is daydream, like, like a child daydreams. He, he regained that faculty, although I think with Jung it was a faculty that had never really disappeared. And he had figures of imagination that came to him that he could speak with. And he spoke with these figures of imagination and documented that over a very long period of time. And that was originally, that was eventually distilled into a book called The Red Book, which was published about three or four years ago. And it was a book that Jung regarded as the central source from which all his inspiration emerged. It was sort of, the way it looks to me is that we embody a lot of information in our action, right? And our action has developed as a consequence of imitating other people. And not only the people, the people around us, but of course the people around us imitated the people who came before them, and those people imitated the people who came before them, and so on, so far back that it's as far back as you can go. And so you embody these patterns of behavior that are extremely informative, that you don't understand, that are a consequence of collective imitation across the centuries. And so then those patterns can become manifest as figures of the imagination, and those figures of imagination are the distillations of patterns of behavior. And so, as the distillations of patterns of behavior, they have content. And it's not you, that content. It's, you could even think about it as content that's evolved, although it's culturally transmitted. It's content that's evolved. And so these figures of the imagination can reveal the structure of reality to you. And that's what happened with Jung. And that's what he described in the Red Book. And that was what permeated his psychology, a psychology that was based on the presupposition that the fundamental archetypal structures of religious belief were not pathological, not deceitful, not protective in some delusional sense against the fear of death, but quite the contrary. The very stories that enabled us to move forward as confident human beings in the face of chaos itself. And it's conceivable, and I think perhaps probable, that nothing more important conceptually happened in the 20th century than that. Because it was the first time post-enlightenment that a rapprochement between the intellect and the underlying religious archetypal substructure occurred. You have in the capacious intellect of Jung, and the same thing happened to some degree with Piaget, the religious domain and the factual domain were brought back together. And the fact of Jung's enduring and increasing popularity and influence, I would say, is a direct consequence of that. Now, some of his work was spun off into the New Age, and and the New Age is a very optimistic and naive movement. It's predicated on the idea that you can do nothing, say, but follow your bliss. And that will take you ever higher to enlightenment. And that's not the Jungian idea at all. The Jungian idea is that what you most need will be found where you least want to look. So there's this story, King Arthur. There's this story of King Arthur. They're all in a round table, right? King Arthur and his knights, they're all equals. They're all superordinate, but they're all equals. And they go off to look for the Holy Grail. And the Holy Grail is the container of the redemptive substance, whatever that is. It might be the, the cup that Christ used at the Last Supper, or it might be a chalice that was used to capture his blood on the cross, right, when he was pierced by a sword. The stories differ. But that's the Holy Grail, and the Holy Grail is lost. That's the redemptive substance. And the knights of King Arthur go off to search for the Holy Grail. And, but they don't know where to look. So where do you look when you don't know where to look for something you need desperately but have lost? Well, each of the knights goes into the forest at the point that looks darkest to him. And that's Jungian psychoanalysis in a nutshell. 
It's like that which you fear and avoid, that which you hold in contempt, that which disgusts you and that you avoid. That's the gateway to what you need to know. There's nothing new age about that. That's for sure. Now Jung, when he started this endeavor, he started with this. This is part of the notebooks from the Black Book. He said, he wrote, My soul, my soul, where are you? Do you hear me? I speak. I call you. Are you there? I've returned. I'm here again. I've shaken the dust of all the lands from my feet. And I've come to you. I am with you. After long years of long wandering, I have come to you again. For the Jungians, the, the hero's journey is a journey within. And, and I think that that's probably the bias of introverts to believe that the hero's journey is an, only an inward journey. I think that it can be an outward journey too because I don't think it matters where you confront the unknown, whether it's within or without. What matters is whether or not you confront the unknown. That's what matters. Um, but he found that what he had ignored was an undiscovered part of himself. So that might be something that was equivalent to Huxley's notion that there were treme there's tremendous potential breadth in the realm of human conscious experience. And Huxley was influenced to some degree by Jung. Now Jung knew of Huxley's experiments and had commented on psychedelic use. And he said something like, beware of wisdom you did not earn. And Jung was very good at... <laughs> at stating things very profoundly, very simply. And, and that's a very intelligent piece of advice. Beware of wisdom you did not earn. He wrote a paper, if you're interested in this sort of thing, he wrote a paper be called The Relations Between the Ego and the Unconscious, which is an absolute masterwork, but completely incomprehensible unless you know what, it, unless you know what it's about. And what it's about is the danger of what he called ego inflation. And so one of the things that can happen as a consequence of a revelatory experience is that the, the division between the individual ego and, and the, and what would you call it? It's so hard to come up with a word that isn't somehow naive or, or, or cliched. To erase the relationship, the boundary between the specific consciousness of the ego and the more generalized consciousness, and more generalized consciousness as such, is a dangerous thing to do. Because you can start to equate yourself, your specific self, with that more generalized consciousness as such. And Jung thought about that as something akin to a psychotic inflation. And the paper, Relations Between the Ego and the Unconscious, is a document that tells you how to avoid that if you're playing in this kind of realm. And one of the injunctions is, to keep your feet on the ground. He thought that was what, partly what happened to Nietzsche, was that Nietzsche wasn't grounded enough in life. He wasn't grounded enough in day-to-day -day rituals and routines and the mundane. Now, you can debate whether or not that's the case, whether or not that's a reasonable argument, but that was still what Jung believed. Okay, so why am I telling you all this? I'll, I'll finish with this. From December 1913 onward, Jung carried on in the same procedure deliberately evoking a fantasy in a waking state and then entering into it as a drama. These fantasies may be understood as a type of dramatized thinking in pictorial form. In retrospect, he recalled that his scientific question was to see what took place when he switched off consciousness. The example of dreams indicated the existence of background activity, and he wanted to give this a possibility of emerging, just as one does when taking mescaline. These journals are Jung's contemporaneous clinical ledger to his most difficult experiment, or what he later describes as a voyage of discovery to the other pole of the world. Jung believed that we were dreaming all the time, but that during waking life, the pressure of external images was such that the unconscious fantasy imagery was, or that the fantasy imagery was of insufficient magnitude to be conscious, but that we were always situated in a dream in relationship to the world. If you're hungry, it's not a deterministic drive. It's a subpersonality that has a goal. 
and then it has a bunch of action patterns that are going to work in reference to that goal. It has a bunch of perceptions that, that suit that goal, and it organizes your emotional responses around that goal. And so to think about it as a personality is a much, it's a much more intelligent way to look at it. One other thing about Skinner's rats, you know, Skinner could get rats to do almost everything, and he would reward them with food. And so he had a simple rat model, but his rats were starved down to 75% of their normal body weight. So not only were they not social, gregarious rats, like rats are, because they were isolated, they were genetically um, altered from wild rats, but they also weren't as complex as a real rat because they were starving. And so, but you know, a starving rat is a pretty good model of a rat, and a rat is a pretty good model of a person, but our, a lot of our models of simple behavioral learning were based on starving, isolated rats. So, anyways, how to think about motivation? We'll think about it from the hypothalamic perspective. So we could say one thing that motivation does is set goals. And we could say that emotions track progress towards goals. And I'm going to use that schema, even though it's not exactly right. So you say, well, motivation determines where you're going to aim. So if you're hungry, you're going to aim at something to eat. And then that will organize your perceptions so that you zero out everything that isn't relevant to that task, which is almost everything. You concentrate on those few things that are going to facilitate your movement forward. When you encounter those things, that produces positive emotion. As you move through the world towards your goal, and you see that things are laying themselves out that facilitate your movement forward, those things cause positive emotion. And if you encounter anything that gets in the way, then that produces negative emotion. And it can be like threat, because you're not supposed to encounter something that gets in the way. It can be anger, so that you move it away. It can be frustration, disappointment, grief. Those would, if, if you had a response that serious to an obstacle, it would probably punish the little motivated frame right out of existence. You know, so you walk downstairs and, I don't know, the contracting company has set a wrecking ball through your kitchen. It's like, that's going to be disappointing. You're not going to keep eating the peanut butter sandwich in the rubble. That little frame is going to get punished out of existence, and some new goal is going to pop up in its stead. And, you know, one of the things we're going to try to sort out is how do you decide when you've encountered an obstacle that's so big that you should just quit and go do something else because that's not obvious you know and you can you can get into counterproductive persistence pretty easily so we, we don't know how people solve that problem it's a really complicated one so anyways we're going to work on that scenario your hypothalamus pops up micro goals that are directly relevant to biological survival that produces a frame of reference so it's not a goal it's not a drive and it's not a collection of behaviors, it's a little personality and the personality has a viewpoint, it has thoughts that go along with it it has perceptions, it has action tendencies, all of that you can see this in addiction, most particularly so one of the things that you find often with people who are alcoholic is they lie all the time and that's because when they're, they built a little alcohol dependent personality inside of themselves or a big one it might maybe it's 90% of their personality and one of that one of the things that compo consists of is all the rationalizations that they've used over the years to justify their addiction to themselves and to other people and so the addiction has a personality you know and so when the person is off or well, maybe they're addicted to meth or something like that where we you know the addiction is more it's, it's, it's more short-term powerful, than I would say, than an alcohol addiction. They'll say anything. And the, 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 the words are just tools used to get towards the goal. And if they happen to be deceptive, whatever, it doesn't matter. They're just practical tools to get towards the goal. And then when you get towards the goal and you take a nice shot of meth or something like that, you reinforce all those rationales that you use to get the drug, and then the next time you're even a better deceiver and liar. So, okay, so we're going to say motivations... One way of thinking about it is they set goals, but it's not the right way of thinking about it. They produce a whole framework of interpretation. And so we're going to think about that framework of interpretation. And then emotions emerge inside of that. So, that's a, so the world is framed, motivation set goals, you could say the world has to be framed. So motivation sets that frame, cruise goals, emotions, perceptions and actions. And then actions track progress. So positive emotion says you're moving forward properly towards your goal. And if you encounter something you don't expect, you stop. That's anxiety. It's like, oh, we're not where we thought we were. And so we don't know what to do. So we should stop, because we don't know where we are or what we're doing. Stop. Frozen. And then the more powerful negative emotions, like pain, they might make you get out of there. So 
emotions, forward, stop, reverse. That's your emotions within that motivated frame. So, and that's another example of how your mind is embedded in your body. Your emotions are like they're, they're offshoots of action tendencies. That's, that's the right way to think about it. Because action is everything, fundamentally. So what are some basic motivations? Uh, most of these are regulated by the hypothalamus, by the way, and that, that tells you just how important a control system it is. The other thing that's useful to know about the hypothalamus is that it has projections going up from it that are like tree trunks, and inhibitory projections coming down that are like grape vines. So you can kind of control your hypothalamus as long as it's not on too much, but if it's on in any serious way, it's like, it, it wins. So partly what you do to stop yourself from falling under the dominion of your hypothalamus is to never ever be anywhere where its action is necessary right? you don't want to go into a biker bar because you might find yourself in a situation where panicked defensive aggression is immediately necessary you probably don't want that you don't want the panic, you don't want the terror you don't want the frenzied fight, you don't want any of that you don't want to have to run away in absolute panic so you just don't go there and, and a huge a huge part of how we regulate our emotions is just by never going anywhere where we have to experience them and so that has very little to do with internal inhibitory control and everything to do with staying where you belong so okay so basic motivations hunger thirst pain pain is not regulated by the hypothalamus that's a different circuit anger slash aggression thermoregulation panic and escape affiliation and care, sexual desire, exploration, play and you can kind of break those in you can kind of break those into uh, the classic Darwinian categories too and say well there's a set of motivations that go along with self maintenance that would be your survival ingestive and defensive see I've sort of coded them there so the the self maintenance there's an ingestive set of basic motivations that go with self-maintenance you say that's hunger, thirst there's a set of defensive motivations pain, anger, thermoregulation, panic and escape and then there's, there's motivations that are associated with reproduction affiliation, care and sexual desire and then I put exploration and play sort of outside of that uh, I would say because those two things serve both of these approximately equally I think the postmodern objection to meaning is actually wrong. Well, we, we talked about this earlier. I do believe that there's a transcendent ethic. And I do believe that it touches on the metaphysical. I believe that people experience that because people are perfectly capable of having unutterably profound religious experiences. And the naturalistic materialists don't know what the hell to do with that. They have no idea what to do with that fact. They say, well, it's delusional. It's like, well, hang on a sec people who have those experiences appear to be more successful and healthier mm -hmm. it's like so in exactly in what manner is that delusional and if you induce it in the lab with psilocybin for example among people who are dying of cancer their fear of death goes away it's like that's you're gonna just lay, lay that out there as delusional or you'll know, quit smoking 85 percent success rate with one mystical experience on psilocybin produces 85 percent cessation rate in smoking yeah. it's completely and with uh, MDMA ecstasy mm -hmm. The three treatments with MDMA, that's what the current research indicates, produces a 72% cure rate for intractable post-traumatic stress disorder. It's like, those are miracle cures and no one, and they have to be accompanied by the mystical experience. No one knows how to account for that. And so, there so is a, a transcendent so it's a very ethic. So it's a very physical thing. I mean, in a case mm. like that, you talk about ayahuasca or any of these things, right? You're eating something, you're ingesting something, smoking it, whatever it is. It's physical, it's here and now, but the experience is, is, metaphysical. is metaphysical. Sure, that's a place where the biological and the transcendent touch. And we don't know what to make of that. Yeah. Well, that's why psychedelics threw our whole culture into such a, such a, flip this upside down. No one knew what to do with them. You know, I mean, the Indians regarded psilocybin as food of the gods for a reason. And, yeah. and when, when people have encountered psychedelic substances throughout human history, that's always how they've been characterized. Yeah. That's right, food of the gods. It's like, beware of them but they're, they open the door to the transcendent and well I think the evidence that they are doing something that psychedelic substances are doing something that we seriously don't understand at all yeah. not a bit is overwhelming Rick Strassman wrote a book on his experiences giving DMT to a whole bunch of people down in he was at 
in Austin, I think. And Strassman's a pretty straight scientist. You know, he was interested in measuring psychophysiological responses to the drugs. Well, he'd give people DMT and they all came back with the same story. I was blasted out of my consciousness. I went, I met a whole bunch of alien beings. Uh -huh. They were really surprised I was there. <laughs> and then I came back and it was the most real thing that's ever happened to me. And Strassman would say, well, you know, well, you had a Jungian archetypal experience or it was a dream. And they'd say, you don't you understand. Yeah. And he got so distraught because of these continual reports that he had stopped doing the research. Yeah, and it, like, I'm not making a claim for, a, for anything metaphysical here, but I'm definitely pointing out that there are undeniable realms of human experience that involve religious experience and a sense of the infinite transcendent that look like they're healthy and that you cannot deny. So you see on the left hand side there you see Horus, who's the bird-headed god of Egypt, who I told you about, who represents the capacity to pay attention. Very important concept, because the Egyptians realized, and really it's brilliant, it is something modern people do not understand, because we tend to make rationality the highest god. That's, that's not a good thing, it, that's a pathway to totalitarianism. What the Egyptians knew, but they only knew it in symbolic form, was it was the capacity to attend to things that in some sense was the highest psychological function because it's the capacity to pay attention that actually moves you beyond what you only know and rationality tends to make you know, integral systems that are coherent that are box-like and then claim that they're absolutely right whereas attention is always looking beyond what you know and, and attention is an unbelievably powerful force you know, that's why advertisers pay for it that's why people demand it. That's why children can't live without it. That's why it's what you want from your friends and your family. You want them to pay attention to you. It's an unbelievably valuable resource. And so, one of the things I always tell my clients, for example, if they're socially anxious, I say, look, pay more attention to the person you're talking to. If you, pay, if you really pay close attention to them, then the thoughts that are making you anxious will be suppressed and because you're paying close attention to them you'll match your movements to theirs and you'll match your conversation to them and then there's no reason for you to be socially anxious because socially anxious people will go like this when they're talking you know, they don't want to look at you of course, how the hell can you engage anyone if you're not in a little dance with them? you know, you can't and a lot of it's non-verbal it's physical and it's embodied and without paying attention then you lose people. And you see this with speakers all the time too. They're in front of audiences. They have their paper and they're going like this. And usually they're talking like this too. And you know, the logical thing to do in that case is like look at Facebook or get the hell out of there or something. But they're not paying attention to the audience. And so there's no power in the, there's no power in the dynamic conversation at all. One of the experiences that I had um, when I was this would be in 1985 or thereabouts when I was busily working on the first draft of my book, Maps of Meaning, where I was outlining this idea that the path of the hero who voluntarily confronts uncertainty and stands on the border between chaos and order is the appropriate target for human development. It's, it's an alternative to the chaos of nihilism and the totalitarianism of rigid belief. Yes. So, and, and that's the bearing of responsibility for being. I was working all of that out. It's actually an answer to the postmodern conundrum, as far as I can tell as well. But, but anyways, at the same time, I was making this sculpture, which is about a foot thick. It's made out of layers of, of what's called foam core, which is styrofoam pressed between two pieces of paper that's about a quarter of an inch thick. It's often used for backing on on, uh, on prints and so on, if you get them framed. I made this, this piece that I call the meaning of music, and it's a mandala, so it's a, oh. it's a circle inscribed inside of a square, although I tried to make it multidimensional in, in a complex way that I can't really describe at the moment. But what I was trying to do, and I broke it into pieces, what I was trying to do was to produce a visual uh, uh, object that flickered and changed when you looked at it because it was too complex to process visually. You know, like a Necker cube, that's one of those cubes that reverses when you look at it. Yes. 
yeah, well, this is like a Necker cube on steroids. And <laughs> because music, of course, ha- it stays the same across time, but also transforms across time. Yes. And it's full of layered patterns, you know, and the patterns interact harmoniously with one another. And it had appeared, and I was fascinated by music because it gives people the direct intimation of meaning. Even if they're nihilistic punk rockers, they still can't criticize the experience of meaning that they that they that they engage in when they're listening to their favorite band. It, it helps them transcend the the nihilism of their rationality. Yes, and it, you can't argue with it. It's like arguing with dance. Right, it's, it's beyond argument. And so I was making this this sculpture and I spent like four months on it. I was thinking about it a lot and I got it mostly assembled. And then I was in my living room in Montreal and I was listening to Mozart's fourth symphony, the Jupiter symphony. And I was really listening to it. And it's one of these complexly multi-level pattern, pattern pieces of auditory sculpture that I believe represents being because what being is, is, multiple levels of patterned transformation interacting simultaneously and music is a representation of that which is why I think we find it meaningful anyways I was listening intently to this symphony and at the same time I was concentrating on the sculpture that I had made and all of a sudden and everything I'm about to say is a metaphor because because there's no way of encapsulating it properly in words, but it was as if the heavens opened up above me. I mean, I was still in my living room, but yes. it rem- the experience is best represented by one of those uh, early Renaissance paintings where you see God or Christ up in the sky with an opening in the sky against the clouds and against the sun. So it, it was like that even though I didn't really see that, but it felt like that. And there were some visuals that were associated with it. And I felt something descend upon me that, that had a personal nature, you know, something like what you were describing as a, 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 a higher consciousness that was actually a being of a sort. And it filled me from the inside out. And I had the, and, and it was, it was enrapturing, let's say. And, It was an incredible feeling. I mean, it was a divine feeling, I suppose, is the right way of thinking about it. It It's certainly a religious experience. And um, I was, and it transformed me. And it turned me into something far more than I I normally was. And maybe you could think about that as an intimation of what you could become if you worked on it for the rest of your life, which sometimes I think is what hallucinogens provide people with, is yes. an, an image of who they could be if they shed all of their dead wood. Right. Anyways, it was as if an offer was being made to me that I could be like that from now on permanently. Mm. And I thought, well, I, I don't know how to do that. I couldn't walk down the street in this condition, in this elevated condition i wouldn't belong in the world anymore i i wouldn't i wouldn't know how to function i I don't know how i could do it and so the this experience this thing say that was communicating with me was accepted that as an answer although i would say with some sorrow and then it (laughs) receded and then i went and talked to my wife and I told her what had happened and I was shaking like yeah. a lot and like a tremendous amount and my pupils were completely dilated. Wow. Yeah, and that happened to me one other time in, in a similar manner, although it was more like an echo. It wasn't quite as intense. But, you know, I was concentrating very much on trying to understand the meaning, the central meaning of music and, of, of course, the phenomena of meaning itself. and. It seemed like the combination of that intense concentration and the visual stimulation and the music all culminated to produce this transformation of consciousness, but that was that was its nature. Amanita muscaria mushrooms are often by by mushrooms like psilocybin. Yes. And those substances are to call them strange is barely to scrape the surface. Have you have you taken psychedelics? Yes, I have. 
Um, and yes, yeah, so, um, it sounds like it because exactly. <laughs> yes, you're right. There, it's such a it's an, it's the strain it's the strangest of things. And and when it comes to identity and the psychedelics effect on human identity, uh, it, it does create an experience that is transcendent to the very temporary human form that we're currently within. And yes, well, there's a psychiatrist named Rick Strassman who, yes. who was at the University of Texas, and he had been giving his experimental subjects. He's one of two groups that had got permission to start experimenting with psychedelics again. The other one was a group at Johns Hopkins who've been reporting um, the consequences of, of giving experimental subjects uh, psilocybin yes. in, a, in its chemical form. They report they've reported um, permanent personality transformations on the part of their, of the people who took the psilocybin mushrooms who had a mystical experience. And so what's happened to them, apart from the fact that they regarded the experience as one of the top two or three experiences of their life in terms of transformation, is that when you give them personality tests a year later, these are five-factor personality tests and they test extroversion, neuroticism, agreeableness, conscientiousness, and openness. And openness is a creativity dimension, an aesthetic experience, creativity dimension. And their scores on openness increase substantially, approximately the equivalent of from the 50th percentile to the 85th percentile, which is one standard deviation. They increase and stay that way up to one year later. So wow. these 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 chemicals, these strange chemicals, produce very long lasting effects on people's perception, and they do produce intimations of mystical experience. Now, Strassman actually got scared away from his DMT research. Um, he was a pretty, I would say, conservative scientist, and was administering DMT intravenously because it has a very short half life. If you take it any other way, it only lasts about ten minutes. Right. And his people, every and who were very carefully screened to begin with for sanity and, and so forth, although they had some experience with psychedelic drugs because they didn't want to introduce naive people to to anything like that. Right. They all reported being shot out of their body and encountering alien beings. Yes. All of them. And they, you know, when Strassman attempted to explain that away as a, well, let's call it a hallucination, although... Technically, if you're hallucinating, you know that you're hallucinating and you know what's real. So these were far deeper than hallucinations. Right. And, or that they were something like Jungian archetypes. But his subjects insisted that, and though, including people who knew quite a bit about archetypal psychology, insisted that that was not correct, that they were in fact shot out of their bodies into other spaces and dimensions and that they encountered beings of all sorts of different types some of whom were surprised to see them some of whom were happy they were there some of whom engaged them in conversation um i mean it makes very strange reading and yes it and it it there's no straightforward may, way of making sense of it and there's no straightforward way of making sense of the shamanic experiences too iliad had thought that that those those rituals had been, if if they were induced by drugs, that that was a corrupt form of the original ritual. But I think later scholarship has indicated that that's profoundly wrong and that the basis of these experiences is, in fact, hallucinogenic experience of the sort, say, that the Aztecs induced with psilocybin mushrooms or mescaline. The first thing I'll do is tell you a story about female neurologist whose name escapes me at the moment she wrote a book called my stroke of insight jill bolte i think is her name and she was a harvard trained she was she had she had medical training from harvard in neuropsychological function and knew a lot about hemispheric specialization we talked a little bit about hemispheric specialization before one of the ways of conceptualizing the difference between the two hemispheres is that the left hemisphere operates in known territory and the right hemisphere operates in unknown territory. That's one way of thinking about it. The left hemisphere operates in the orderly domain and the right hemisphere operates in the chaotic domain. 
or the left hemisphere operates in the domain of detail and the right hemisphere operates in the domain of the large picture. It's something like that. Now, people differ in their neurological wiring, so those are overgeneralizations, but that's okay. We're, we'll live with that for the time being. It's certainly not an overgeneralization to point out that you do, in fact, have two hemispheres and that their structures differ. And if the connections between them are cut, which could happen, for example, if you had surgery for intractable epilepsy, that each hemisphere would be capable of housing its own consciousness. That's been well documented by a neuro, neuro, neurologist named Gazaniga, who did, and Sperry, who did split brain experiments, must be 30 years ago now. So, and we know that the right and the left hemisphere are specialized for different functions. The right hemisphere, for example, seems to be more involved in the generation of negative emotion and the left hemisphere more involved in the generation of positive emotion and approach. So the right hemisphere stops you and the left hemisphere moves you forward. Anyways, Jill Bolte, I hope I've got that right, had a stroke and maintained consciousness during the stroke and analyzed it while it was happening. And she was able, while it was happening, to hypothesize about what part of her brain was being destroyed. And what, so she had a congenital blood vessel malformation and had an aneurysm. And it just about killed her. But she said that it affected her left hemisphere. And she said that she experienced a sense of divine unity as a consequence of the stroke because the left hemisphere function was disrupted and destroyed and so she became right hemisphere dominant and her experience of that was the dissolution of the specific ego into the into absolute consciousness something like that now that's only a case study and you don't want to make too much of case studies but there is an overwhelming amount of evidence that those two kinds of consciousness exist one being your consciousness of you as a localized and specified being, and the other being this capacity to experience oceanic dissolution and the sense of the cosmos being one. Now, why we have those capacities for different conscious experiences is very difficult to understand. I mean, part of me thinks that Maybe we have a generic human brain that's the brain of the species and allied with that we have a specific individual brain and one is the left hemisphere and the other is the right hemisphere the left hemisphere being the specific individual brain and usually it's on and working because you obviously have to take care of yourself as a specific entity and not as a generalized cosmic phenomena it's hard to dice salary when you're a generalized cosmic phenomena <laughs> Right? So you have to be more pointed than that. But, but look, let, let's make no mistake about it. The fact that those different states of consciousness exist is not disputable. They can be elicited in all sorts of ways. And so, I'm going to read you something that Aldous Huxley wrote about this back, I think, in 1956. This was after he started his experimentation with mescaline. Because the psychedelics were introduced into Western culture in the 1950s in a whole bunch of different ways. Psilocybin mushrooms, LSD, that was discovered right at the end of World War II. It was discovered by accident, actually, in a laboratory, Sandoz Labs. The guy who discovered it, Albert Hoffman, had spilled some on his hands. You can absorb it through your skin. And he was biking home and had the world's first LSD trip, which was <laughs> somewhat of a shock to him. And then to the entire world. Huxley, who was a great literary figure, a, g a real genius, um, experimented with mescaline in the late 50s. And uh, he wrote a book called The Doors of Perception, which had a huge impact on the emerging psychedelic culture, both on the East Coast at, at Harvard and on the West Coast with Ken Kesey and his Merry Pranksters, the people who popularized LSD. That's all documented in a book called The Electric Kool-Aid Acid Test, which I would highly recommend. It's Tom Wolfe. It's a brilliant book. Um, on the East Coast, it was Timothy Leary. I had Timothy Leary's old job at Harvard. So that was kind of cool, in a warped way. So I met people there who knew him, um, who didn't think much of him also, but who did know him. But Huxley had this mescaline experience, and it transported him to this alternative consciousness. And 
He said that during his mescaline experience that the entire world glowed from within, like there was an inner light, like a paradisal inner light, and that everything was deeply meaningful and symbolically suggestive and overwhelming and beautiful and timeless. So he had an experience of divine eternity, I suppose, is the most straightforward way to, to put that. And we know perfectly well that the psychedelic drugs that all share the same chemical structure, they interact with a brain chemical called serotonin, which is a very, very fundamental neurotransmitter. They all have approximately the same range of effects, although those effects are very... There's a very large multitude of effects that, that sort of exist underneath that umbrella. Um, Huxley was staggered by his mescaline experience. He, he, he didn't really know what to make of it. And I think that that's the common experience of people who have exceptionally profound psychedelic experiences. And I'll, I'll, I'll tell you some documentation about that in a moment. But he spent quite a long time trying to come to grips with what this might mean from an intellectual perspective. And, and Huxley had a great brain. I mean, if someone was going to wrestle with a problem like that, he was a good candidate. He must have had a verbal IQ of 180. I mean, he's, his books are incredibly literate, incredible, incredible mastery of language and, and complexity of characterization and, and intellectual discourse. Really remarkable. So this is what Huxley had to say after his mescaline experience. He talked about heaven and hell. And he talked about that in reference to bad trips, essentially, because it was known by that point that a psychedelic experience could transport you to an ecstatic domain of divine revelation, but could take you to the worst imaginable place as well. And Huxley was very interested in why you would even have the capacity for experiences like that, and which I think is a very good question, and it's a completely unanswered question. I mean, we don't know much about consciousness, and we know even less about psychedelics, I would say. They are an absolute mystery. I don't think we understand them in the least. Huxley did a good job of starting to at least map out the mysteries of the terrain. He said, like the Earth of a hundred years ago, our mind still has its darkest Africas, its unmapped Borneos and Amazonian basins. <clears throat> In relation to the fauna of these regions, we are not yet zoologists. We are mere naturalists and collectors of specimens. The fact is unfortunate, but we have to accept it. We have to make the best of it. However lowly, the work of the collector must be done before we can proceed to the higher scientific tasks of classification, analysis, experiment, and theory making. Like the giraffe and the duck-billed platypus, the creatures inhabiting these remoter regions of the mind are exceedingly improbable. Nevertheless, they exist. They are facts of observation. And as such, they cannot be ignored by anyone who is honestly trying to understand the world in which he lives. When psychiatrists started to study LSD, that was mostly in the late 50s and, and running forward from that, they thought about the drug as a psychotomimetic, which was a chemical substance that would induce psychosis. But that turned out to not be true, not with the psychedelics, because schizophrenics were given LSD, and the schizophrenics reported that, while the experience was certainly extraordinarily strange, it wasn't like being schizophrenic. And then it was found later that if you gave schizophrenics amphetamines, that made them worse. In fact, you can induce a paranoid psychosis in a normal person by overdosing them with amphetamines. So whatever the hallucinogens or the psychedelics are doing, it's not the same thing as mania, and it's not the same thing as schizophrenia. Not at all. So, so you can't just write the experience off as an induced psychosis. Whatever it is, independent of its utility or lack thereof. It's not that. Now, it can be induced by drugs. It can be induced by deprivation, right? I mean, there are accounts throughout history of people putting themselves in extreme physiological situations in order to induce transformations of consciousness. Fasting is one of the routes to doing that. Dancing is another route. Isolation, prolonged periods of isolation will also do it. Now, you, you could say that exposing yourself to any of those in excess produces a state that's indistinguishable from illness. 
and that there's no reason to assume that the phenomena that are associated with illness have any utility whatsoever. Although, it's interesting to me that a, a disrupted consciousness can produce coherent experiences. It's not exactly what you expect if it was just an illness. You know, if you develop, say, a high fever, your experience isn't transcendent and coherent. It's fragmented and pathologized. And, and the dis difference, I think, is quite distinct. Although we don't, only, we don't have to only speculate about that because there's been enough experimental work done now with, with hallucinogens and psychedelics to indicate that the notion that what they produce is something that's only akin to pathology is wrong. It's, it's not a matter of opinion at this point in the sequence of scientific and historical investigation. In fact, there was a large-scale study done 10 years ago, 5 years ago, of 200,000 people who had experimented with psychedelics and they were mentally and physically healthier than people who hadn't on virtually every parameter they examined. In fact, the rate of flashbacks, you've heard of LSD flashbacks, mostly a hypothetical phenomena, but the rate of self-reported flashbacks was higher among the non-psychedelic users than among the psychedelic users. So that was very interesting, it was a huge study. Now it might be, you could say that those who had experimented with psychedelics were prone to be healthier to begin with, but that still contradicts the pathology argument, so it doesn't matter either way. The pathology argument is contradicted. Now, oh, I did put that in. It was Dr. Jill, Jill Bolt Taylor. This is what she said about her stroke. I remember that first day of the stroke with terrific bitter sweetness. In the absence of the normal functioning of my left orientation association area, my perception of my physical boundaries was no longer limited to where my skin met air. I felt like a genie liberated from its bottle. It's a good metaphor. The energy of my spirit seemed to flow like a great whale gliding through a sea of silent euphoria. The absence of physical boundary was one of glorious bliss. Recently, this Dr. Roland Griffith, I met him once at a conference in, in San Francisco. Surprise, surprise a conference on awe, and this was just when he was embarking on his experiments with psilocybin, which were the first experiments on hallucinogens that were permitted by the National Institute of Mental Health in some three, four decades. He, he had to be very careful to lay out the scientific protocols so that the ethics committees would approve the experiments and so that the federal funding agencies would allow, also allow the experiments to go through. He started to experiment with with psilocybin, and he's found a number of, and published, a number of very interesting uh, results. One was that a single psilocybin trip, and, and I, I specify trip because sometimes when people take psilocybin at the doses that Griffith uses, they don't have a psychedelic experience. Most people who take the dose do, but not everyone. Those who take the dose and don't have the mystical experience don't experience the consequences of taking the drug. And the consequences can be quite profound. So, one consequence is that if you have the mystical experience that's associated with psilocybin ingestion, you're liable to represent that to others and yourself as one of the two or three most exper important experiences of your entire life. So that would be at the same level as the birth of your child or your marriage, let's say, assuming that those were transcendent experiences. But, but, that's, <laughs> but that's how people describe them, so that's, that's very interesting in and of itself. Then, the next thing that Griffith, another thing that Griffith reported was that one year after a psilocybin dose, a single psilocybin dose, profound enough to induce a mystical experience, the trait openness of the participants had increased one standard deviation, which is a tremendous amount. And so it looked like one dose produced a permanent neurological and psychological transformation. Now, you know, I'm not saying that that's a good thing. I'm, I'm not saying that, because I don't think that openness is an untroubled blessing. But it's certainly a testament to the unbelievable potency of the, of the drugs. 
there's about a 10% chance, by the way, with psilocybin ingestion of a trip to hell. And so that's certainly something very much worth considering when you're thinking about the potential effects of, of this kind of experience. So the, the mystical experience produced by psilocybin is rated by people as the most profound, among the most profound experience of their life, as life-changing. It produces permanent personality transformations. 85% success in smoking cessation with a single dose. Right? That's another thing that Griffiths demonstrated. Now that is mind-boggling because there are chemical treatments for smoking cessation. Um, bupropion is one. It reduces craving to some degree, but its success rate is nowhere near 85%, certainly not with a single dose. And so, we don't understand how it can be that that occurs, but it's nicely documented by Griffith's team. In this experiment, he gave psilocybin to people who were dying of cancer. Cancer patients often develop chronic, clinically significant symptoms of depression and anxiety. Previous studies suggest that psilocybin may decrease depression and anxiety in cancer patients. Aldous Huxley took LSD on his deathbed, by the way. So, the idea that there was something about psychedelic substances that could buffer people against the catastrophes of mortality is an idea that's as old as experimentation with the drug itself. The effects of psilocybin were studied in 51 cancer patients with life-threatening diagnoses and symptoms of depression and or anxiety, unsurprisingly. I don't really know if it's reasonable to describe the emotional state of people diagnosed with cancer of uncertain prognosis or mortal significance as depression precisely. You know, you know what I mean, is that if you go to the doctor and he tells you that you have intractable fatal cancer, the normative response is to be rather upset and anxious about that. And so, it, one of the things that bothers me about clinical psychiatry and clinical psychology is the automatic presupposition that even overwhelming states of negative emotion are properly categorized as depression. Because I don't think you're depressed when you get a cancer diagnosis. I don't think that's the right way to think about it. I think that you have a big problem. And it's not surprising that you're overwhelmed by negative emotion. And to think about that as a psychiatric malfunction is a major error. But anyways, it, it, it's, it's, it's a side issue with regards to this study. <laughs> the effects of psilocybin were studied in 51 cancer patients with life-threatening diagnosis and symptoms of depression and or anxiety. I cannot imagine how they got this through an ethics committee. It's just... <laughs> we're going to take people who have uncertain diagnosis of cancer that are potentially life-threatening and we're going to give them psychedelics. It's like, but they, they did it, they did it. And I think it's a testament to Griffith's stature as a researcher that that, that was allowable. This is a randomized double-blind crossover trial, very carefully designed clinical investigation. People were assigned to the treatment group or the, to the drug group or the non-drug group randomly, blindly. And... It investigated the effects of the drug also at different doses, which is another hallmark of a well-designed pharmacological study. Very low placebo-like dose, 1 or 3 milligrams per 70 kilograms of body weight, versus a high dose, 22 or 30 milligrams per 70 kilograms of, of psilocybin, chemical psilocybin, administered in counterbalance sequence with five weeks between sessions and a six-month follow-up. Instructions to participants and staff minimized the effects of expectancy. Participant staff and community observers rated participant moods, attitudes, and behaviors throughout the study. That's also the hallmark of a well-designed study because they didn't rely on a single source of information for the outcome data, right? They got self-reports, that's fine, but they had relatively objective observers also gather data at the same time. High-dose psilocybin produced large decreases in clinician and self-related measures of depressed mood and anxiety, along with increases in quality of life, life meaning and optimism, and decreases in death anxiety. And that's an interesting, it's a subtle and scientifically sparse statement, but it's a very interesting one. It was the in, there's, a, there's an intimation of a causal relationship here. Increases in quality of life, life meaning and decreases in death anxiety. 
I mean, the intimation there is that one of the ways of decreasing your anxiety about death is to increase the felt meaning in your life. And the, the psilocybin dosages potentiate that, but it's a good thing to know in a general manner, if it happens to be a generalizable truth, right? If you're terrified of mortality, terrified of vulnerability, there's always the possibility that the life path that you're following isn't rich enough to buffer you against the negative element of existence. It's a reasonable hypothesis. And an optimistic one, I think, although a difficult one. At six-month follow-up, these changes were sustained with about 80% of participants continuing to show clinically significant decreases in depressed mood and anxiety. Stephen Ross, commenting about this, he was a co-investigator, said, it is simply unprecedented in psychiatry that a single dose of a medicine produces these kinds of dramatic and enduring results. Right, which means we have no idea why this happens. Participants attributed improvements in attitudes about life slash self, mood, relationships, and spirituality to the high-dose experience, with more than 80% endorsing moderately or greater increased well-being and life satisfaction. Community observers showed corresponding changes. Mystical type psilocybin experience on session day mediated the effect of psilocybin dose on therapeutic outcomes. What that means is that, well, when the researchers were trying to look at a causal relationship between drug ingestion and the positive outcome. The causal relationship was drug ingestion, mystical experience, positive outcome. It wasn't drug ingestion, positive outcome. There had to be the experience produced by the pharmaceutical agent in order for the pharmaceutical agent to have had its effect. Now, we don't, again, we don't know why that is either. I mean, maybe some people needed a higher dose. Who knows? Because people vary tremendously in their sensitivity to pharmaceutical substances. Now, why am I telling you all this? Well, I'm telling you for a variety of reasons. One is, the first is, make no mistake about it. Human beings have the capacity for forms of consciousness that are radically unlike our normative forms of consciousness. And the evidence that those alternative forms of consciousness are purely pathological, which is the simplest explanation, right? You perturb a system produces pathology, that's negative. That is the simplest explanation. The evidence for that is weak at best. Leaving out the bad trip issue, which, which is non-trivial. The empirical evidence, as it accrues, in fact seems to suggest that the consequence of mystical, positive mystical experiences associated with psychedelic intake is overwhelmingly positive, even in extreme situations. And you really can't find a more extreme situation than uncertain cancer diagnosis with concomitant and depression and anxiety. Like, I mean, that's not as bad as it gets, but it's, it's kind of in the ballpark. And so the fact that even under circumstances like that, there was the overwhelming probability that the experience would be positive, because that's another thing you wouldn't expect, you know? Even from some of the earlier, earliest discussions about psychedelic use that were put forth by people, including Timothy Leary, describing the importance of set, right, so that the early experimenters noted that if you had a psychedelic experience and you were in a bad state or in a bad place, that that was one of the precursors to a bad trip, that the negative emotion that you entered the experience with could be magnified tremendously by the, by the chemical substance and so that it was necessary to be somewhere safe, to be around people that you trust, to be in a familiar environment, to get all the variables that you could un control under control. But here is a situation where that isn't what's happening at all because people have this cancer diagnosis, of, cancer diagnosis of unspecified outcome and they still, the vast majority of them, had a positive experience and the positive exper experience had long-lasting positive consequences. So, so the case that the transcendent experience is not real, that's wrong. It's real. Now, we don't know what that means, because it actually challenges, to some degree, our concepts of what constitutes real. But it's certainly well within the realm of normative human experience. So it's part of the human capacity. And, you know, there, there's been other neurological experiments, too. There's, there's a researcher, a Canadian researcher, if I remember correctly, who invented something he called the God Helmet. And it used electromagnetic stimulation, brain stimulation, to induce mystical experiences. 
Now, I don't remember what part of the brain he was shutting off or activating with that particular gadget, but... And, you know, there's, 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 all, there's all sorts of other indications of this sort of thing that have cropped up in, a, in other domains of the neurological literature, for example. It's very common for people who are epileptic to have religious experiences as part of the prodroma to the actual seizure. That was the case with Dostoevsky, for example, who had incredibly intense religious experiences that would culminate in epileptic seizure. And he said that they were of sufficient quality that he would give up his whole life to have had them. And the funny thing, too, is that, in my reading of Dostoevsky, at least, is that I think that epileptic seizures and the associated mystical experiences were part of what made him a transcendently brilliant author. I don't think that he would have broken through into the domains of insight that he possessed without those strange neurological experiences. And it was certainly not the case that his epilepsy or the experiences that were associated with it produced what you might describe as an impairment in his cognitive function. It's quite the contrary. At least that's how it looks to me. This is a critical issue with regards to the shamanic transformation, is that people go through these terrible, terrible experiences, often drug-induced, by the way, with regards to the shaman. They usually use psychedelic chemicals of one form or another, often mushrooms, but, but they've come up with some very strange concoctions like ayahuasca down in the Amazon. And ayahuasca is an amazing substance. It's made out of the bark of one thing and uh, another plant whose name I don't remember that hardly even grow in the same place and that have to be cooked together in a special way and no one has any idea how the damn Amazonians figured that out it looks impossible and if you ask them they say well the plants told us how to do it which you know western people don't find very helpful but the shamans are perfectly help happy with that that description and ayahuasca takes them apart and it does that in part because it affects the serotonergic system very very powerfully like all psychedelics do and it transports them to another world, and that's how they interpret it. And, 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 and what we know about psychedelics, you could put in a thimble and then throw the thimble away. We know nothing about psychedelics. Uh, there's new experiments going on at Johns Hopkins, for example, with psilocybin, which is part of this active chemical in magic mushrooms. Same structure, basically, as LSD and mescaline. And all the real psychedelics have basically the same structure, except the one that's derived from Amanita muscaria, which is called muscarinic acid, and it's, a, it's its own weird thing that no one knows anything about. Anyways, they have profound neurochemical effects in very small doses, and um, the research group at Johns Hopkins has given psilocybin to research subjects, you know, purified psilocybin, because they started the new experimentation with psychedelics, and that's been banned for like 40 years because psychedelics were so terrifying to our culture that we just put them away. It's like, whoa, no, we're not going there. And so, even from a research perspective, and even though some of the psychedelics look very promising for the treatment of disorders like alcoholism, they recently used psilocybin to help people stop smoking down at Johns Hopkins, and I think they had an 80% success rate, which is just, like, that's just absolutely mind-boggling. And so, but if you give people psilocybin and they have a mystical experience, which is very common, among people who take these sorts of chemicals, then their personality transforms permanently such that one year later they're one standard deviation higher in openness. And openness is the creativity dimension. And that seems to be a permanent transformation. And so that's really remarkable. And about 80% of the people who undergo the Johns Hopkins experiments report that the experience is like one of the two or more, three most important things they've ever, that, that's ever, ever happened to them. And so, well, that's, that's something, you know, it's like... And then there's this guy named Rick Strassman down at... I think he was at the University of Texas, and he did experimentation with DMT. And DMT, dimethyltryptamine, I rem if I remember correctly, is the active ingredient in ayahuasca. And you produce it in your brain, and it's in plants. It's like a very common chemical. But DMT is a weird hallucinogen because it has an extraordinarily short mechanism of action. It's like... And people who take it report that they're blasted out of their body, like out of a cannon, and then they go out somewhere and encounter beings of various sorts, and then ten minutes later they're back. And virtually everyone reports that, which is really strange. And, and so Strassman was, 
were giving people DMT intravenously so that the trip would last longer. He, this was all, all you know, NIH funded uh, experimentation, all cleared with the relevant ethics boards, all conducted within the last ten years. And he basically quit doing it because he was a pretty straight scientist, you know, he was measuring heart rate and pulse and all that sort of thing, trying to look at the physiology and then the people he was giving these chemicals to kept coming back and telling him these, these crazy stories. And, uh, well, it just, it was too much for him, you know, and no wonder, you know, because they all said the same thing and he'd say, well, that was a dream and they'd say, no, and it was the most real thing that ever happened to me and he'd say, well, you know, it's an archetypal experience and they'd say, no. No, no, that was no archetypal experience. I went somewhere else and I saw things and I'm back and like, I don't care what you think. And like, who the hell knows, right? Because it's all subjective. But, but the weird thing about it is that everyone's reporting the same thing. How the hell do you account for that? And then the shaman, you know, when they take these psychedelic chemicals, they basically say the same thing. They say, well, first of all, it more or less killed me. That's this. You know, I dissolved to a skeleton and then I climbed the tree that unites heaven and earth and I went into the realm of the gods and they gave me some information and I'm back. It's like, okay, well, you know, we don't really know what to make of that. And, we, and certainly that's what Eliad describes when he describes the shamanic, the shamanic procession, not the shamanic initiation. And, you know, there's dissolution to a skeleton first and then like a death, a symbolic death or experienced as an actual death and then bang up into the realm of the gods and then they come back it's a very old idea I and mean, that's a medieval representation of the tunnel that people travel through at the end of their life to you know to find the light which is a very common near-death experience report and people don't have any idea what the hell to do with those reports except say well it's the paroxysms of the dying brain which you'd expect to be a hell of a lot more random in my opinion and the idea is there's a rebirth after that. And you know, here, this is the Scandinavian representation of that tree that unites earth with heaven. And so there's the Scandinavian representation. It has a snake, snakes down here eating it. And then, that's the Amazonian representation. It's like, how the hell do you account for that? I mean, those, those pictures are so similar that it's just, it's beyond belief. Well, you know, we lived in trees for a long time. A long, 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 long time. Millions of years. And there were lots of snakes around them. And so the idea that reality is a tree that's surrounded by a snake is, that's in us, man. It's down there. It's deep. And there's something about it that's true. Now, not true like we normally think of truth, but truth, true in an entirely different manner. So, and all that's pretty damn strange. We'll stop with this. My son drew this when he was seven years old blew me away, man. I thought it was so cool, so I had it laminated. And so, here is what it is. On the right hand side, that's order. It's like the yin yang thing. That's order. Left side, chaos. Right? And those are all mushroom houses, which I thought was amazing. <laughs> and then, there's this river that runs right down the middle, like the line for order and chaos. And then there's this tree that goes up to heaven, and that's heaven up there. It's like, there's St. Peter, there's the pearly gates, there's the clouds. It's like, it's, he never went to church, you know. It's like, what the hell? And then there's a little bug there that goes up and down from heaven to earth. And that was him. And I thought, he had a very organized psyche, that kid. He was a very, very stable kid and still is. And I, he drew that and I thought, Jesus, that's just bloody well unbelievable. And I still think that when I look at it. And that's a great example of an archetype. And so, we'll see you Tuesday. So I'm going to read something that Nietzsche wrote in the first part of Beyond Good and Evil, which is a section called The Prejudices of Philosophers. And it's a really good example of the density of this book. One of the ways of conceptualizing Beyond Good and Evil, and I think this is true for most great works of, it's true of most great works, is that the author of the work collects, unconsciously collects patterns from his or her interaction with the world and then gives them initial formulation.
and the patterns can be deep and multi-level and the initial formulation translates them into not so much ideas as into the seeds of future ideas and the more poetic the author happens to be the more the case that his or her writings contain within it the seeds of future ideas and where the romantic philosophers or authors and I think Nietzsche and Dostoevsky are, are in some sense foremost among them are particularly uh, notable for their ability to do exactly that now in this particular paragraph this particular paragraph not only serves as an example of that but it also serves as a self-conscious reflection on that because Nietzsche is writing a paragraph here that is full of the seeds of, of ideas that will actually bloom and flower to a great degree in the 20th century. But while he's simultaneously revealing these, those ideas, he's also telling you exactly how he's doing it and how it is that philosophers do it. So it's a, it's a spectacular accomplishment. I'm going to read it probably phrase by phrase and then take it apart because it's so dense and Beyond Good and Evil is like that. It's Nietzsche, when Nietzsche was writing Beyond Good and Evil, he wasn't very well. And because of that, he had to spend a lot of time thinking and not very much time writing. And because he was also brilliant beyond comprehension, his ability to distill what he was thinking into incredibly rich phrases is, I think in some sense, it's beyond parallel. I mean, often if I'm reading a book, if it has any utility at all, I'll mark it. Usually I fold over the top of the page or sometimes put a yellow sticky note on it if, if I find a place where there's an idea that's worth returning to that, that's, um, that's particularly worth understanding. And you can't do that with a book like Beyond Good and Evil because what ends up happening is you have to mark every sentence. And obviously marking every sentence isn't any better than not marking any sentences at all. So, I guess I also might as well tell you why it is worth bothering with a book like this at all. Because it's a very difficult book and it, it's also the sort of book that will rattle you up. So Nietzsche is is very interested in the problem of value. And the problem of value fundamentally is not the problem of what is the world made of or even how does the world function, which are more, in some sense, more specifically scientific questions, but how is it that you should conduct yourself in the world? How should you act? And people act towards aims, in a sense, because we're active creatures and we're moving from one point to another, we're moving towards things that we want. And that means that we're guided by our desires. And we're not only guided by desires insofar as we have individual desires, we're guided by the structure that consists of how those desires are related to one another. So, for example, if you have a room full of people say a room full of children, they're active and they're each pursuing their individual desires, but at some point they may choose to organize themselves into a game. And if they organize themselves into a game, what they're doing for all intents and purposes is producing a little society, a little micro-society. Within that micro-society, they're deciding what desires will be currently expressed and how they'll exist in relationship to one another. And that means that they can cooperate without too much conflict and that they can jointly move towards um, a joint aim without and, and, and gather all the benefits that might be associated with that and that might be the accomplishment of the aim whatever it is but it also might be just the enjoyment that's to be had in the pursuit of that activity now people do that socially, because we have to do that in order to get along with other people, because our desires have to be melded with those of other people. But we also do it psychologically. And those two things exist in a dance, because as I'm interacting with other people, the demands of the fact that we're interacting 
make require each of us to arrange our desires in a way that's acceptable to everyone else. But at the same time, while we're doing that, we're also observing the process by which those desires are ordered, and then we internalize that process and use that to order our own desires. And then, so there's a constant mutually informative dance between the individual and the group, and the culmination of that is the organization of society and the simultaneous organization of the psyche. And it's that process that Nietzsche is talking about in these paragraphs. Now, you might ask yourself, well, what's the utility of articulating such things and conceptualizing them and understanding them? And the answer, in some ways, is straightforward. If you don't want to run afoul of your own desires, you have to organize them. Because some of them are short-term and some of them are medium-term and some of them are long-term. And some of them aim at this and some of them aim at that. And it isn't necessarily the case that those desires allow for mutual fulfillment. So, for example, maybe you're very interested in pursuing a sexual relationship with someone, but you're also very interested in having a family and some stability in your life. Or maybe you're interested in pursuing a sexual relationship with a whole sequence of people, but you're also interested in having a family and stabilizing your life. It's not obvious that those desires can exist in the same universe without producing what you might think about as a war. And some of that might be a psychological war, but some of it's also going to be a war that actually occurs in existence while you're fighting through the contradictory consequences of wanting to pursue many people and formulate a stable relationship with one person. Now, part of the reason that you want to think about these sorts of things is because if you think about them and get your thoughts and your value system intelligently and coherently and cogently laid out, then when you act out that value system in the world, you're going to run into less conflict and less uncertainty and less misery, and you're going to have a higher probability of getting what it is that you want, but you're also going to have a higher probability of getting what you want in a way that allows you to cooperate with other people without entering into too much conflict with them. And so in some sense, the purpose that you think, the reason that you think, or the purpose of thinking, is so that you can sort out how you're going to move forward in the world without having to directly run headlong into all the obstacles that you might run into if you were doing such a thing blindly. And so then you might ask yourself, well, why would you bother reading philosophy or the philosophy written by someone who's great? And the answer to that is, is that they can help you think these things through in a manner that you would not be capable of doing on your own. You know, because Nietzsche, I mean, it's, it's difficult to estimate how intelligent Nietzsche was, but I suspect he was perhaps one in a billion, which would put him far beyond the 99.999th percentile. And there's a massive difference between the ability of people to think as you move farther and farther out into the extremes of intelligence. And when you have the writings of someone who's one in a billion, then you can interact with those writings in a way that enables you, if you'll put the time in, to benefit from the spectacular fact of that intelligence. Nietzsche was a full professor by the time he was 24, at a time when, when that, he didn't even have to write his dissertation. They just made him a full professor at a time where that was, that never happened. So, this is what he has to say in The Prejudices of Philosophers, which is the first chapter of the book Beyond Good and Evil. It has gradually become clear to me what every great philosophy up till now has consisted of, namely, the confession of its originator and a species of involuntary and unconscious autobiography. Well, that's a deceptive, that's a deceptively simple sentence, even though it's not a particularly simple sentence, because it it stands on its head what people generally assume about the process of thinking. 
you generally think that when you're thinking, you're thinking about, as I mentioned before, the structure of the objective world. But, but Nietzsche is, is making an entirely different point here. And, and what he's fundamentally doing is treating the philosopher not as a rational being, but as a living being. And there's a big difference between being a rational being and being a living being. Because if you're a living being, your primary goal is to do whatever it is that furthers your life. And if you're a rational being, then your primary goal is to do whatever it is that a rational being might do. And you could say that a living being should first and foremost be a rational being. And in some sense, that's the message of the, of the Western Enlightenment. But it's by no means self-evident that that's the case. And it's certainly not something that Nietzsche, Nietzsche doesn't believe that people are rational beings certainly not primarily, and more importantly, he isn't exactly convinced that they should be. So, so for example, one of Nietzsche's most famous maxims is that truth serves life. And that's a very difficult, different idea than the purpose of truth, say, is the accurate representation of the objective world. Those aren't the same thing at all. Now, you could ask, well, what does it mean for truth to serve life? And if you construed truth that way, what would truth look like? And, you know, the mere statement that truths should serve life doesn't offer you the answers to those questions, but but it, it's the beginning of a different metaphysics, and in some sense a metaphysics which is, say, the universe within which a philosopher might operate. A metaphysics is the initial structure of presuppositions within which a view of the world is organized. One presupposition might be human beings are rational and that we're attempting to formulate and improve our sense of the objective world, our formulation of the objective world. And another would be that human beings aren't rational, we're irrational, and that we're, what we're motivated to do is to live, whatever that means, and that the purpose of our thinking and our philosophy should be to facilitate our living. And that's Nietzsche's, that's one of the foundation blocks of Nietzsche's philosophy. So he's a moral philosopher, fundamentally, because morality is about values, and values, essentially, values are, you could say values are what you aim for, but it's more complicated than that. Values actually constitute the lens through which you view the world, so it's partly what you're aiming at, but it's also partly your conception of who you are now and where you are, and it's also partly your conception of how you're going to get to where it is that you want to be, and it's also partly the psychological system that you use to parse up the world so that it reveals to you the pathway that you can take to get to what you want. Value is all of that, and then it's more than that, because you could say that you have a value, which contains all of that, but then you can say that you have a set of values, which is the arrangement of all of that, and then you could say that you have a set of values that's the arrangement of all of that, that you have to arrange with other people, and then you could say that you have all that and you have to arrange it with other people, and you have to arrange it across different spans of time, because what you want today and what you want next week and what you want next month are not necessarily the same thing, and one does not necessarily lead into the other. So to be a moral philosopher is to examine how that, what that system is and how it operates and how it came about. Now one of the things that Nietzsche says is, it has gradually become clear to me what every great philosophy up till now has consisted of, namely, the confession of its originator and a species of involuntary and unconscious autobiography. So his claim fundamentally is that no matter what the philosopher thinks he's doing while well, he's writing philosophy, what he's actually doing is revealing and articulating his being. And then you might say, well, where did that being come from? And the answer to that is, well, partly it's, you could consider it a biological function insofar as that we have value structures that are built into us that are the process, we would say, the process of a very long evolutionary history. But because you're also a cultural phenomena and because the manner in which you've arranged your values and your desires has been conditioned to the last degree by the process of enculturation that you were subjected to, when you confess in an autobiographical manner and articulate that, what you're also doing is recapitulating the entire structure of your culture 
It's in you, and you might say, well, where is it in you, and that, that, and what does in you mean? Part of it means is that you act out a pattern of behavior, and that pattern of behavior is like a, a dance that someone is manifesting to a symphonic score. It's unbelievably complicated, and it has its psychological elements, and some of those are conscious and some of them aren't. Some of them are just implicit and embedded in the way you act and the way you perceive, and what the philosopher is attempting to do is to reveal those to himself and to articulate them so that the entire structure can be analyzed. Well, so Nietzsche's first proposition is that when a philosopher is thinking that what he's doing is not thinking, it's revealing himself in an autobiographical sense under the guise of rational thinking, and so then it becomes something more like a story. And Well, and he covers all that in the first two phrases. So that gives you some example some indication of what this book is like. A species of involuntary and unconscious autobiography. Well, that's a more complicated idea, too, because you might say, well, why would someone be driven in an involuntary way, and in an unconscious way, to describe their autobiography? And that's a very complicated question. It might be that one of the reasons that people value one another is because we engage in the process of sharing deeply autobiographical information. You tell me your story and I tell you my story, and you might say, well, why, why do we even bother with such things? And the answer to that is, well, if you can tell me about the pain and tragedy that you've encountered, then that gives me a better way of, that gives me a better vision of the dangers of the world without actually having to expose myself to those dangers, except in simulation. I might feel sorry for you, I might feel bad about your tragic experiences, but I'm not bleeding for them. And then there's always the possibility that you'll also tell me how you solved your problem, in which case I can either avoid that problem entirely, or if I do encounter I can solve it without having to go through, maybe it took you decades to formulate your solution to that problem. And you can tell me your story, and then I have the information. And so that's part of what human beings are always trading. That's why we talk to each other. That's why we can communicate. And so Nietzsche would say, well, it's, it's involuntary and unconscious. Involuntary and unconscious. He's alluding to the fact that that proclivity is so deeply embedded in people, that, that desire to, to make an autobiographical recounting, that it serves as a, the kind of motivation that we don't question for doing almost everything that we do. So, you know, I mean... People do such things as attend movies and plays, and they usually do that happily, especially if the movie or the play is of high quality, and the same thing happens when people are reading novels. They're attracted to such things. They have a built-in value, and it's very rarely the case that people will ever question why it is that they're doing such things. In fact, you see this quite commonly with students who are first introduced to the study of literature. The, the introduction of the idea that you should analyze what it is that you're engaged in when you're reading actually co comes as unwelcome news to most people who are inclined towards fiction because they don't want to interfere with the process of engagement, you know, automatic unconscious engagement with the material by detaching themselves and having to think about what they're doing. So that's why it's an un involuntary and unconscious. It's, 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 it's one of the things within which thought operates, rather than one of the things on which thought operates. Then he says, the moral or immoral purpose in which every philosophy has constituted, sorry, the moral or immoral purpose in every philosophy has constituted the true vital germ out of which the entire plant has always grown. Well, that's a hell of a thing to say, too, because what Nietzsche is alluding to there, in some sense, is that the philosopher can't help, and that would be, in some sense, also the person who's recounting their autobiography, can't help but tell you what they're up to, even though they might not know. And this is something that Jung, because Jung was a Carl Jung, the, psych the psychoanalyst was a great student of Nietzsche. And Jung came to believe that we all inhabited stories, that the stories, were, the stories we inhabited were actually the structures of value within which we lived. 
and that those stories essentially had an ethic or a moral. And then you, you can start thinking about what the ethics and the morals might be, and you kind of have some sense of that, because there's, there's comedic stories and tragic stories, and there's evil characters and good characters and so forth. Those are archetypal characters. But part of the point that Nietzsche is attempting to make here is that the philosopher is, in fact, aiming at something with his life, with all of his actions. He might not even know what it is. But partly what he's doing in his attempt to philosophize is to articulate that and reveal it to himself and to other people. So then the question becomes, well, what is it that the person is up to? And I would say in some sense that's the ultimate question. And so Nietzsche here in this paragraph is also dealing with the, with the ultimate question in life, which might be, well, to what is your life aimed? And you might say, well, it's not aimed at anything. It's in, I don't know. I, I don't seem to have any coherent set of beliefs. I don't know what I believe. I don't believe in anything, even. But that's not the case, because if you didn't believe in anything, you couldn't see. You have to believe in something to be able to see, because you point your eyes at things, and you can't organize your vision without having a name. And so the very act of interacting with the world presupposes an ethic. And then all those micro-ethics that you contain within you are organized into some sort of structure, either badly or well, and that structure roughly has an aim. And you might know it and you might not, but that doesn't mean it isn't there. So, so another thing that Nietzsche is alluding to is that you believe things whether or not you think you believe them. In fact, believing them and knowing you believe them aren't even the same thing. And so that people believe all sorts of things that they don't know about. And that partly what they're doing when they're doing philosophy is to try to figure out what those things are. And you, you know, and you can also ask yourself, well, where did they come from? Well, they partly came from you, but you, you're an old thing. Your physical form is three and a half billion years old. And you're the process of all that, all the death and struggling that went along the entire course of that three and a half billion years is you carry that with you. And then on top of that, inside you is the consequence of the entire cultural history of complex life. That's all inside you too. And then on top of that, some of that's articulated more or less. Some of it's acted out, dramatized, represented in fiction and that sort of thing. And then some of it's articulated. But there's way more at the bottom than it is fully articulated. And so God only knows what you're up to. And then you might say, well, who cares? Well, I, the problem with that is that you care, because first of all, that's the definition of caring, and second of all, that determines the, the, the way that you'll move through your life. And everything that happens to you that's good or evil or good or bad is going to be a consequence of the manifestation of that ethic in the world. So, and now Nietzsche is saying something else, too, when he says... The moral or immoral purpose in which every, in the moral or immoral purpose in every philosophy has constituted the true vital germ out of which the entire plant has always grown. He's saying that the philosopher can't help but reveal his aim in his writings. And then he's saying something else, which is that aim might be malevolent. And you know, modern people aren't very comfortable with ideas like malevolence, because malevolence is an idea that's related to evil. And modern people think of themselves as beyond good and evil to some degree. They don't believe in the re reality of those concepts. And of course, in, in this book, Nietzsche is also questioning our, at least our a priori presuppositions about what good and evil are. But that doesn't mean that he doesn't believe that they don't exist. That doesn't mean that he doesn't believe that they don't exist. Yes, I guess that's, I guess that's right. You know, this is one of the things I've thought about when I was thinking about, when I thought about how Hitler died. You know, Hitler died, Hitler committed suicide in a bunker underneath Berlin when Europe was in flames. And so one conclusion that a psychoanalytically minded historian could derive from that is, that's what he wanted. Right. And then that opens up an entire... Uh, a vast nest of snakes, because one of the things that you might ask is, well, how is it that someone would desire that? First of all, could that even be desired? Is that actually something that anyone could even desire? Then you might ask, well, why is it that someone would desire that? 
And then the next thing you might ask is, if a human being could desire that and Hitler was a human being, then exactly what does that say about you? And you might say, well, I could never desire such a thing. But following along the train of the argument that we've been laying out, it's like, what makes you think you're a reliable judge of what it is that you're up to? So, okay, so now we've unpacked three sentences, and we'll continue on with the same paragraph. Indeed, to understand how the most abstract metaphysical assertions of a philosopher have been arrived at, it is always well and wise to first ask oneself, what morality do they, or does he aim at? So what the question is, what's the person up to? Well, there's an entire nest of snakes underneath that sentence, that sequence of propositions as well. And one of them is, well, what does it mean that people are up to something? What does it mean that they're aiming at something? Accordingly, I do not believe that an impulse to knowledge is the father of philosophy, but that another impulse, here as elsewhere, has only made use of knowledge and mistaken knowledge as an instrument. But whoever considers the fundamental impulses of man with a view to determining how far they may have here acted as inspiring... No. This is partly why this is going to require editing. It's so complicated to go through. Accordingly, I do not believe that an impulse to knowledge is the father of philosophy, but that another impulse, here as elsewhere, has only made use of knowledge and mistaken knowledge as an instrument. All right, so let's take that apart. Accordingly, I do not believe that an impulse to knowledge is the father of philosophy. So one of the claims, I suppose this would be an enlightenment claim, is that people do have a drive to knowledge, and that that drive is, in fact, what underlies the production of such things as philosophy. But Nietzsche questions that, because he's trying to bring us back to consideration of the fact that you can't separate the philosopher's mind from the philosopher's being. He's first and foremost a living creature, and he's up to something. And the question is, what is it that he's up to? And so, you can see the earliest manifestations in a paragraph like this of what later developed into deconstructionist thought, and the, that, that was mostly French continental philosophers who pursued that particular line of reasoning. And it, it is derived exactly from this kind of statement by Nietzsche. So, for example, someone like Derrida would say, it doesn't matter what the content of the text is. What matters is that the text can be used as a tool for power. And that whether the person who wrote the text knew it or not, that's what they were doing. And they were doing it in a way to privilege themselves above other people. And that's really, I would say, the fundamental deconstructionist claim. And it's a powerful claim. It's an utterly corrupt claim. But it's a really powerful claim, and it's related directly to the sorts of things that Nietzsche was referring to in this paragraph. What is it that the person's truly up to? Now, the problem with the deconstructionist claim is that it's an, it's an open invitation to cynicism, to thoughtless cynicism. I can just make the presupposition that whatever it is that you're telling me, you're, you, you're telling me merely to dominate, regardless of what it is that you claim to be doing. Well, the problem with that approach is that it's predicated on the implicit assumption that the only value that people actually have is the value to, is the desire to dominate. And of course that's a purely, like, that could be the case, and I also think that it's even reasonable to posit that to some degree that it is the case. But to take that from a contributing factor and to make that the highest god, because that's essentially what the deconstructionists are doing, those are entirely different things. And you have to be aware of people who take a single causal element and elevate it to the stature of single comprehensive cause. You know, it's more reasonable to assume that people are complex in their motivations and that many different strands of biological and cultural motivation 
are in some sense primary and that what happens is that they come together to weave a kind of tapestry rather than to make the automatic assumption that you can reduce the entire set of human motivations to a single principle like that of power. Now, you know, I would say Nietzsche is also responsible to some degree for the deconstructionist claim that it's power because one of his most famous utterances was that the fundamental motivating force in life is the will to power. But he wasn't so much, because Nietzsche is a subtle thinker, he wasn't so much attempting to reduce human motivation to power, he was attempting to redefine what it was that we conceptualized as power. Whereas that isn't what the deconstructionists are doing at all, because fundamentally they're Marxists and they believe that, you know, they've ensconced themselves within an economic viewpoint where, within a philosophical viewpoint, where economics is paramount and where all that matters is power construed as socioeconomic domination, fundamentally. You know, and that's in, in turn is embedded in a metaphysics that's even deeper, which is the, a metaphysics that presumes that people are fundamentally materialist. And all of those things are quite, you know, all of those things are highly questionable. So I'm going to skip ahead a little bit in the paragraph when Nietzsche talks about the motivations of, you might consider them, people who are working in the middle ranks of bureaucracies, whether they're scientific or otherwise. So they're, in some sense, acting as cogs in a particular machine. And so that's what he's describing here. He says, In the case of scholars, or in the case of really scientific men, it may be, there may really be such a thing as an impulse to knowledge, some kind of small independent clockwork which, when well wound up, works away industriously to that end, without the rest of the scholarly impulses taking any material part therein. The actual interests of the scholar, therefore, are generally in quite another direction. It is the family, or in money making, or in politics. It is, in fact, almost indifferent at what point of research his little machine is placed, and whether the hopeful young worker becomes a good philologist, someone who studied the origin of words, a mushroom specialist, or a chemist. He's not characterized becoming this by this. He's not characterized by becoming this or that. Nietzsche's point there, fundamentally, is that even when you do analyze people who, in whom the the will to knowledge might actually be operative, even though he wouldn't be willing to grant it the status of highest motivating power, that even in those people where that will to knowledge does exist, the probability that that is in turn subordinated to some other principle that's higher in the value hierarchy is very, very high. And it's hard to tell exactly what that additional principle might be, but he points out such things as, well, maybe they're primarily interested in serving the interests of their family or they're primarily interested in making money, or maybe they're primarily interested in status, and maybe they're interested in status, status because, it, because it makes them more sexually attractive, and that sort of thing. So, but the, the, the question of what is it that's lurking in the background is always paramount. So, another detour in this particular paragraph. Whoever considers the fundamental impulses of man with a view to determining how far they may have here acted as inspiring genii or as demons will find that they have all practiced philosophy at one time or another and that each of them would have been only too glad to look upon itself as the ultimate end of existence and the legitimate lord over all of the other impulses. That's an, another, like, the Beyond Good and Evil, to think of it as a book is a really foolish framework. You know, because this is what a book is when people think about a book. You know, it's like a material entity. It's, it's eight inches high and 
six inches wide and two inches thick and weighs a pound and it's made out of paper and it's between two two covers you know and that's a materialist that's the a priori sort of axiomatic view of a book but Nietzsche's Beyond Good and Evil isn't a book at all it's a series of bombs and each sentence is a bomb and each sentence blows things up that people don't even know exist and so one of the things with this sentence for example Here's how he's conceptualizing the human being. So the first thing he talks about is that the fu there are fundamental impulses in human beings. Okay, so the, that begs the question is, well, what do you mean by impulse? And what do you mean by fundamental? And both of those are extraordinarily complicated problems. So an impulse, you can think of an impulse as a drive. You can think about it as a biological instinct. <clears throat> You could think about it as an aim or a goal. You could think about it as an act of will. Like there's there's endless questions that, that hang off that question, but we could start with the idea that we perhaps can't define it, but we are willing to go with the proposition that people do have impulses. And I think maybe that's manifest to you more most particularly <clears throat> when you're attempting to do something voluntarily. And something involuntarily interferes with that. You know, so maybe you're sitting down to to try to get some work done and the work is not of any particular intrinsic interest, but you regard it as necessary, you know, necessary element in some higher order scheme. And so you're attempting to organize yourself so you will in fact concentrate on that particular relatively mundane activity. But what you find when you sit down to actually engage in that is you can't do it. You have to go do the dishes or you have to clean under the bed, or you have to have a sexual fantasy, or you, or, or there's some other thing that you could do that's useful, but that you wouldn't normally do, that you'll go do instead, or that you fall asleep, or that you get hungry, or like there's an endless number of, let's call them impulses, that might arise to interfere with your conscious movement forward. Well, exactly what are those things? Well, Nietzsche certainly conceptualizes the human being as a place where those things live. And he does mean live, too, because he wouldn't refer to them as de demons or, or genies without introducing the metaphorical conception of something that lives. And so partly what Nietzsche reveals in those sentences is that he conceptualizes a human being as the, the dwelling place of spirits. And some of them are genie, let's say. That's the root word of genius. That's the terribly powerful thing that exists in the terribly small compartment, right, that you have to call forth. And some of them are demons. And demons are things that have their own autonomous will and that generally aren't aiming for the good. So then, so those are all things Nietzsche just lays out as implicit parts of the sentence. So he activates all those ideas, whether you know it or not, in your mind to the degree that you process the sentence. And those things start to take on a life of their own, those ideas. And so, then the, he, he adds another dimension of complexity to that by saying, well, you, you're full of demons and, 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 and genies, and they're all doing their own thing, whatever that happens to be. But each of them, if left to their own devices, would attempt to remake the entire world in their form. And so... I, I, I thought of this from a, from a narrative point of view or from a symbolic point of view. In, 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 in old stories, in folk tales and fairy tales, you often have uh, um, cyclops, one-eyed giants. And there's a sexual connotation to that, which is, which is apropos that the psychoanalysts would, would certainly point out. But... The one eye idea is that this thing is gigantic and wants one thing. And so that's another way that Nietzsche is conceptualizing the fundamental structure of the human psyche. It's a dwelling place full of one eyed giants, and they're constantly, well, one thing, one way of looking at it is they're constantly at war. One of them wants to be the largest one-eyed giant and dominate everything else. And then one of the things that... So Nietzsche takes that argument further and he says, not only is this always happening in human beings, but that if you look at philosophy, what it is, is it's a continual revelation of the attempt 
of some singular minded psychic monster, psychological monster, to dominate the entire psychological structure and therefore the entire cultural structure and therefore the entire world. And then you can you can see in that the entire religious structure struggle of mankind to take this vast polytheistic vision of reality and to organize it into some sort of monotheistic and integrated structure which you could also consider indistinguishable from the civilizing the impulse that operates in human beings to become civilized because on the one hand it might be a terrible thing that one one-eyed monster emerges to attempt to dominate all the others but then on the other hand there's no difference between that and organizing something because to organize something is to bring it all into a hierarchical structure with some sort of singular value at the forefront and then the question might be well what should that singular value be and then Nietzsche would that ties the whole argument back into the first sentences that he wrote at the beginning of the paragraph, which is, well, what is it that the philosopher is up to? What is the force that he's serving? What is the unifying impulse? That's another way of looking at it. If there's a unifying impulse, and he's not only fallen prey to some internal demon, if there's a unifying impulse to bring all of this together into some sort of functional structure, what exactly might that look like? For every impulse is imperious and as such attempts to philosophize. That's part of, that's sort of Nietzsche's idea of will to power in, in its nascent form. Like all of these unconscious entities that inhabit the human psyche are all alive. And they're trying to live, they're trying to, they're trying to climb up the dominance hierarchy and dominate. Because, of course, that's partly what life does. Because let's say from an evolutionary perspective and this is probably more true for males because they're less effective in their attempts to replicate the distinction between climbing up a dominance hierarchy whatever that might happen to be and success is there may be no distinction at all and then you might say well that just shows that there's nothing but will to power but <laughs> That still doesn't answer one of the most fundamental questions, is that power in relationship to what? Because that's the question.